Shadow, the serious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, Murder Incorporated. Conrad? So, uh, yes, I'm Mr. Conrad. Oh, come on, get in, please. Thank you. <laughs> you must be Mr. Pascal. Yes, that's right. Sorry I wasn't at the station when your train came in, Mr. Conrad. Bad night. I had a hard time getting down the mountain. You know, I was beginning to think perhaps I misunderstood your instructions. Well, I wouldn't have uh, had you come out on a night like this, but I'm having a bit of a celebration tomorrow, and I'd like to have the piano too. Well, quite all right, Mr. Pascal. Musical instruments are like humans to me. I, I never fail to respond to a call. I see. Uh, my house is about two miles up the mountain. Uh-huh. I'm afraid you're going to find it rather alone. Oh, place. no, no, indeed. I won't mind at all. I hope you've come prepared to spend the night, Mr. Conrad. Is, the night? Yes. You see, there are no trains until morning. Oh, re- oh yes, of course. You know, I, I hadn't thought of that. I, I, Rather stupid of me, wasn't I it? should have warned you, but it hadn't occurred to me that perhaps somebody might be expecting you home. Or... Oh, no, no, indeed. I, I have no folks. There's nobody to expect me, Mr. Pascal. Nobody to expect you. <laughs> well, you'll not be missed, eh? No, 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 indeed, Mr. Pascal. I, I shall not be missed. <laughs> uh, it's a bleak and dismal night, isn't it? Yes. A bleak and dismal night. I can't stand it, I tell you. Sit down, Nelson. Police is driving me nuts. Take it easy. A scowl will be up here any minute. I can't stand it anymore. Wallace, I'm going. Ah, don't be a fool. Shut up and listen. What's the matter? I think I hear Pascal on the stairs. Ah, oh, you're batty. That's a floor's creaking. You're liable to hear anything in this old house. Yeah. It is a joint, all right. Give you the creak. That's the kind of a hideout Pascal pick. Even a ghost be afraid of haunted. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, Pascal. Hey, boss, we thought you. Sorry, gentlemen. Say, Pascal, what's the big idea? You call us here to talk over a scheme to clean up a couple of hundred thousand. Quiet, please. I don't want my guests below to know I have guests about. Why do you have a piano tuner here when we have business to talk over? Because, gentlemen, the piano tuner is the business I have to talk over. Yes. What do you mean? Yes. In just a few moments, he will drop dead. What? Drop dead? Well, rather, I should say I'll permit him to kill himself. Huh? But his death will have all the appearances of a natural demise. The actual cause will be impossible to detect. Well, how are you going to do it? Follow me, gentlemen. Where are you taking us to? Through this door. Hey. What is this? This, gentlemen, is my laboratory. For the past two years, I've devoted myself to research and experimentation in this room on a chemical that could kill and yet leave no trace. You mean a secret poison? I'll explain. After I perfected my chemical, I next had to devise the best means for its use. Yes. You uh, see this match? Yeah. The head of this match has been dipped into my secret formula. Yeah? So downstairs, I've placed some cigars in a package containing the treated matches beside our guest. In a little while, he'll light a cigar. So what? Then, gentlemen, you'll have the positive proof that my labors have been crowned with success. Haskell, when it comes to anything in a chemical line, you're the tops. But I don't get it. How does this thing pay off? Gentlemen, we all know that the world is full of maladjusted people. Men and women tied to each other by force of circumstances. Go ahead. So isn't it reasonable to suppose that one party to these unfortunate associations would welcome the means by which he or she would be rid of the other? Oh, I get it. It's an insurance shake. It sounds swell to me. But how are you going to contact these clients? Have you figured that out? Perfectly. When people are in trouble, they go to one of three men. A doctor, a lawyer, a mind reader. 
Those professions will be represented by the three of us. You're going to hang out the old shingle again. The offices of Dr. Bruno Pascal are already selected. It'll be my job to impress the prospective client with the physical necessity of escape. What's my trick? As the master of the occult, you shall visualize the way out for them. The legal and material aspects will be your responsibility, Nelson. Yeah. You will see that our clients carry the proper amount of insurance. Okay. When the mind of the client is conditioned to accept murder as a solution to a problem, then we shall provide the means to what will truly be the end. The matches. The matches. Listen, that piano stopped. At last. Maybe the old guy's taking time off for, for a smoke. We'll see. All right, all right. How long is it going to take? Why don't he light it? Why don't he do... That's it, gentlemen. Yeah, come on, let's go. <laughs> Little Mr. Conrad in the rain. <laughs> there, gentlemen, look down. The piano tuner is dead. And a new enterprise is born. She was just sitting there smoking, and all of a sudden she kind of gasped for breath and toppled over dead. Never said a word or other. He died real peaceful, just like in a cigarette he was. It was such an easy thing. You do nothing, ma'am. Just give him the matches. He does it himself. That's all there is to it. You haven't a thing to worry about. Doing planting flowers or building a house? I've never seen so many tools and implements in my life. No, no cracks, Margot. John, my gardener, didn't come to work this morning, and I have to get these rose bushes in. Yeah, now let me see. Uh, was it four bushes, one foot apart, or one bush four feet apart? <laughs> I wouldn't have missed this for the world. So, Ma, what are you doing now? I'm digging a hole to put the rose bushes in. Why must it be three feet deep? Well, they're big rose bushes. Well, if you strike oil, let me know, will you? Margo, please, how can I concentrate? Let me see. Does this burlap come off or does it stay on? I have a suggestion. Yeah? If that bush doesn't grow in that hole, you can always put some concrete around the edges and use it for a swimming pool. That's very helpful. Ow! These bushes have thorns. Tomorrow, I have another suggestion. Fine, fine, fine. Let's go over and find out what happened to John before you ruin the garden and yourself as well. Who is it? Oh, oh, Mr. Cranston. Good evening, Miss Graham. Hello, Miss Lane. Hello, Miss Graham. And John home? Why, why, yes, sir, he is. Well, he didn't report for work this morning. We thought perhaps he might not be well. Matter of fact, Miss Lane, he, he's sick in bed. Oh, I thought so. May I go up and see him? Well, I, I don't think you better. The doctor says he wasn't to see anybody. Well, it must be serious. John was always so healthy. He's complained to me before, Mr. Cranston. You see, it, it's his heart. Oh. Yes, it, his heart's been pretty bad. Uh, Mrs. Graham, John called you. Oh, oh, did he? Oh, Ella. Tell Mr. Cranston I'd like to see him. Well, I'll go right up. Oh, uh, Mr. Come Cranston, along, Mark. I... Yes, I'm on. Now, don't worry, Mrs. Graham. We won't stay with him long. Well, I won't go up. I, I've got to call the doctor. The mom. Yes, Marshal. Isn't Mrs. Graham a terribly nervous woman? Yes, very. And I suppose it's understandable under the circumstances. Yes, I suppose so. Ah, here we are. This is the room. Uh, well, hello, John. Uh, oh, hello, Mr. Cranston, Miss Lane. Hello, John. I asked my wife to send for you, sir. You asked Mrs. Graham to send for me? Yes, sir. But your Please, wife... Margo. Uh, tell me something about this illness, John. It's your heart, isn't it? Yes, sir. Looks as if I'm going to be like those gladiolas we planted last spring. Fine one day and dead the next. Oh, John. And me, who's never had an acre of pain in my whole life before, sir. I see. Well, John, you said... You sent for me because you wanted to talk to me. Uh, yes, sir. It's about my wife. You know how little women know about money matters. Yes? I don't want nobody to talk her out of little I'm leaving. You see, sir, 
As luck would have it, I just took out a new insurance policy. Yes? It's much bigger than any I've carried before, but I'm glad I did it now. She won't have to worry. Well, John, uh, how did you happen to increase your insurance? Why, it was that doctor my wife's been going to. (laughs) He sure gave me some good sound advice. Yes. He suggested you take out more insurance? Yes. I see. Now, John, I don't want you to worry about anything. I'll see that your wife is well advised. You just take things easy. Uh, I knew I could depend on you, sir. I miss the garden. I'm sure you do, John. Those bleeding heart shoots, they should be trimmed down right away. I'll take care of them for you, John. Might be a good idea to bed them down. Frost, it'll be coming soon. It certainly will. Uh, John, uh, what's the name of the doctor who advised you to increase your insurance, huh? I said, John, what's the name of the doctor? Lamont. John. John. Margot. Yes, Lamont. He's dead. Well, Lamont, how do I look? Does my costume make me look like the poor, harassed housewife? <laughs> Quite, Margot. But I'm afraid you're going to an awful lot of trouble for nothing. I don't think so, Lamont. We know now that it's this Dr. Pascal who's been treating Mrs. Graham for a long time. He's the one who advised John to increase his insurance. Well, that might have been advice sincerely often. But how do you explain Mrs. Graham's conduct? If you mean what I think you mean, Margot, you're just about accusing that poor little woman of murdering her husband. But I'll play along with you. You're going to Dr. Pascal as a patient? Yes. I see. I'm, well, I'm a, a nervous case. You know what I mean. Married and nervous. Oh, you mean uh, married and nervous. Hmm. Uh-huh, I see. <laughs> well, you should have a name. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Let's see, let's see. Belden, Mrs. Belden, how's that, eh? <laughs> Too good. I'd rather you save the characterizing until you see the doctor. Okay, okay. Oh, say, uh, suppose you have to produce a husband. Oh, very simple in that case. You'll be my husband, Lamont. What? Now, let's get going. Mrs. Belden may have a date with destiny. Come on, fellas. Let's get to our business. How do we stand with Mrs. Graham? We'll get the insurance check tomorrow. You know, we almost bungled that job. Yeah? How? Effective matches. Mrs. Graham told me that it took hours for her husband to die. We must be more careful in the future. Now, there's my buzzer. You gentlemen wait in the next room. You wouldn't be ashamed of Wallace and me, would you? Do I have to answer that? Uh, oh, uh, no. Uh, okay, Pascal. There are cigars and matches on the table. Help yourself. Uh, no, thanks. I carry my own matches. A wise guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you do? You wish to see me? Yeah, are you Dr. Pascal? Yes, I am Dr. Pascal. Oh, I... Well, come right in, please. Thanks. Yes, sit down here. Yes, sir. Now then, what's your trouble? Well, doctor, I... I haven't been able to sleep nights for a long time. Yes? I got until I wake up with a start just as soon as I go to sleep. Oh, now, don't be nervous, dear lady. Uh, But tell me, how did you happen to come to me? I saw your name on the door. Oh, you just happened in, is that it? Yes, sir. Uh, where do you live? On Charles Street. Oh, that's quite a distance from here. You pass a lot of doctors on the way. Well, I... I got a cousin living in this neighborhood. Oh. I come up here pretty near every day. I see. And what is the name? My cousin? Yours. Oh, mine, huh? Belden. Married, I suppose? Yes, sir. Uh, would you sit under this light, please? Yes, sir. Gee, it sort of binds me. Now, don't be nervous. Now, Mrs. Belden, I am not in the strict sense a medical man. I don't use medicines or drugs to affect cures. You see, most ailments are external. They spring from a cause outside the person affected. You, for example, are an obvious nervous case. Oh, I get terrible nervous sometimes. Now, that ailment does not necessarily come from inside you. It's the result of a condition which you are constantly in contact with. It might be an unhappy marriage. It might be... Would that cause it, doctor? An unhappy marriage? Oh, very likely. 
I've had women come to me who are on the verge of insanity. Oh, God. Now, of course, I'm not saying that that's so in your case. You may be very happily married. Well, no, Doctor, I ain't. I don't get along with my husband very well. Oh, now that's too bad. Too bad, Mrs. Bellin. See, can I close my eyes for a minute? That light. Well, I'll turn it off. There. Now, it'll be a long time before I'll permit myself to arrive at a definite conclusion on your case, Mrs. Bellin. However, if your husband should be the cause of your trouble, you can easily correct it. Yeah, how? By simply ridding yourself of the cause. By ridding myself of... Oh, there ain't much chance of that. My husband never give me a divorce. Well, you just leave your case in my hands. <laughs> and you'll be taken care of. <laughs> yes. Uh, come in and see me Wednesday at four. Yeah, Wednesday at four. Uh, that's right. We'll go into your case more thoroughly at that time. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Doctor. Appreciate that very much. Oh, that's quite all right. Good day, Mrs. Belden. Goodbye, Doctor. All right, Mr. Come out now. Oh, yes, yes. It's all right. You had the interview? Yeah, we sure did. That prospect's certainly right for plucking. Looks like an easy few thousand dollars for her. That's the trouble. It looks too easy. What do you mean? You think she's a phony? Possibly. If she is, she's not in this alone. We've got to play along. I want to know who's in on it with her. Well, what can we do? I'm going to send her to you, Nelson. I want you to size her up. If you should confirm my suspicions, then I'll have her bring her husband here. For what? He's probably a plant. If he is... Then we can nip the thing quickly and completely. How? By a process of swift elimination. There it is, Lamont. Pascal's office is in that little frame house beside the grocery store. Oh, it's a modest enough place. Why do you suppose he wants to see me? Well, they probably want to condition your mind for a big insurance policy. Just as they did your gardener, John Graham. Uh, Margot, you seem to think Pascal has several confederates. Yes. Well, there's that lawyer he sent me to, Nelson. Then there's a mind reader by the name of Wallace. Yeah, but remember, Margot, all of these deaths have been certified as natural. How do you suppose they bring about these deaths? Well, I haven't progressed that far in their confidence yet. But it's coming, I'm sure. Yeah, Margot, I do hope you're right about this affair. But now I, uh, I think I'd better go in alone first. And for my own impression of Dr. Pascal. But he asked me to come with my husband. Well, I'll tell him I'm to meet you in his office. And you come in after I've been there about five minutes. Well, all right, if you think that's best. I'll walk on. You stay here in the car, Margot. All right, Lamont. And don't forget, Margot. Give me five minutes leeway. Yes, Lamont. There's no mistake about it, I tell you, Pascal. I knew there was something familiar about her face. Then I remembered where I'd seen her. I went down to the newspaper office and dug up this issue of the paper. That's a picture, all right, Nelson. Margot Lane, prominent society girl. That's right. The man beside her in this picture, well, he's probably the one she's bringing here as her husband. Lamont Cranston, man about town. What are you going to do, Pascal? We can't take any chances, Nelson. They must be destroyed. Both of them. Uh-huh. Right here, Nelson. Through this door. It leads up the side entrance. Okay. Good luck, Pascal. Thank you. Oh, well, how do you do? You wish to see me? Dr. Pascal? Yes. I'm Mr. Belden. Oh, Mr. Belden. Well, didn't your wife come with you? I expected her. I'm supposed to meet her here. Well, in that case, I guess you'll be along soon. My uh, wife said you wanted to talk to me. Oh, it's nothing of great importance, Mr. Belden. I simply felt a man should know his wife's doctor. Well, how's that going to help her? Hey? <laughs> uh, Mr. Belden... Your face looks familiar. I've seen you somewhere before. Yeah. I ain't never seen you before. I'm sure I've seen you. Well, lots of people see me. I drive a cab. Oh, a cab driver, eh? <laughs> Truly a man about town, eh? Huh? Oh, yeah. I get around all right. Yes, I imagine you do. <laughs> oh, um, will you have a cigar with me, Mr. Belden? I smoke cigarettes. Oh, here, yeah, have one of mine. I got my own. Match, then? Thanks. You want a light? After you. Okay. Oh, that one must have been damp. Yeah, I guess so. Well, <laughs> so much as you've got, believe me. Try the third. I'm sure you'll get results from that one. I hope so. Well, it's a book. Well, what's the matter, Mr. Cranston? Aren't you going to smoke with me? Well, I... Dispatch. 
My, what an inglorious end for the glamorous man about town. <laughs> yeah, now, come along, Mr. Cranston. I have a room all ready for you. Ah, there's your wife. There we are. Now, you won't be alone long, Mr. Cranston. You'll be joined directly by the corpse of Margot Lane. Ah, Mrs. Belvin, do come in. Thanks, Doctor. My husband here? Your husband? Oh, yes, he was supposed to come with you today. Well, make yourself comfortable. He hasn't arrived yet. What? He... Well, now, in the meantime, I have something which I'm sure will interest you. A little picture a friend of mine cut out of the paper. Oh, I... Surprised, aren't you, Mrs. Belden? I was, too, when I saw it. I said, my, what a strange coincidence. This Margot Lane looks exactly like my Mrs. Belden. Yeah. Yeah, she does look like me. Now, wouldn't it really be amazing if Mr. Belden turned out to resemble this Lamont Cranston in the same picture? It could happen, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Well, I better go and see what's keeping Oh, no, no, Mrs. Belden. He should be here directly. Be patient. Just sit down, please. There we are. Cigarette, Mrs. Belden? No, I don't. Oh, but you should. Good for the nerves. As your physician, I prescribe it. Here, I'll give you a light. Oh! What's the matter, Dr. Pascal? You dropped the matches. Why? I didn't drop the matches. They were not for my hand. <laughs> what was that? I heard a man's laugh. So you did, Doctor. I who spoke? Who are you? What are you? I am the factor you failed to reckon with when you embarked on your murder for profit enterprise. I am the shadow. The shadow? Yes, I've heard of you, but murder for profit. I don't know what you mean by that. You're responsible for the death of John Graham and many others. Why, this is nonsense. I never heard of a John Graham. No use bluffing, Pascal. I've already phoned the police to pick up your two henchmen, Nelson and Wallace. You're next. The police have no evidence against me. That's a lack I shall supply. I have some of your ingenious little matches. Matches? You lie. You can't. And I have proof that at least ten people died with a box of your matches beside them. I see. See, and you think you can stop me from leaving here? Try it. Very well, I'll call you. Look out, Margot. Don't let him go. Oh. <laughs> Perhaps you're convinced now that it would be best to await the police quietly. Well, I suppose you're right. I've always believed that one should accept the inevitable in good grace. In fact, with nonchalance. I know of no better way to emulate that attitude than to have a smoke. Pascal, don't. Wait. Now, Mr. Shadow, your police shall find me... Waiting in supreme calm. Oh, I'm glad we're on our way home, Lamont. I feel as though I've been living in a land of the dead. That's very near to the truth, Margot. We were both pretty close to it. What will happen to Mrs. Graham and those other women who worked with Pascal in killing their husbands? The law will deal with them, dear. Lamont, how did you ever find out about those matches? Well, I learned that many of the people who died so mysteriously were found with an empty matchbox beside them. But that peculiar circumstance didn't crystallize in my mind until Pascal invited me to have a smoke. Well, why didn't the match kill you? <laughs> because I had palmed Pascal's match and lit one of my own. <laughs> he thought he had me, though. Lamont. Yes? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't what be wonderful? If you were only that clever at planting rose bushes. in the hearts of men. The 
shadow knows. <laughs> Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, The Flight of the Vulture. Get those old knives into the barn and make it snappy. Oh, well, we're working as fast as we can, boy. Hey, you and that dirt stock van. Yeah, boy. You left headlamps out. Okay, I'll make it. Come on, come on. Lock up those vans. We'll be here all night. All right. Okay, Cal State. All set. The old nags in the barn, the thoroughbreds in the stock vans. Did you count them careful? Sure did. One old nag nag in the barn for every thoroughbred horse we took out. Ten horses in, ten horses out. All right, all right. All right, you men driving those stock vans. You've got your orders, so get going. Okay, boss. Here we go. All right. Come on, come on. Push him along. Roll him fast for this. Hush. Yeah, boss. All those old nags tied up in their stalls? Yeah. Not a chance of any of them getting out. They're tied fast. All right, let's go in the barn. Right. Open it up. And I guess everything's all set. Horses are quiet in their stalls. All right, put a match to that straw in the corner. Right. This place ought to go up like a piece of paper. There she goes, Calcade. All right, let's get out of here. Bolt that door. They're beginning to yell good now. I guess they know what's up. All right, what's the difference? They're all old, they're sick nags. They die soon anyway, wouldn't they? I've seen a lot of things in my time, but I don't want to be around when the fire hits them nags. Let's scram, Calcey. All right. I'm hungry anyway. Let's go eat. You think this Mr. Cal Sade's going to show up? He said he would, Clara. Honest, Mark, I most wish he wouldn't show up at all. Uh, I know how you feel, Clara. I hate to part with old Jim myself. Why, that old horse practically raised our Bobby. You know, I'm mindful of the time he waited out in the river when Bobby was drowning. That old horse acted like a human. He pulled alongside so the lad could climb on his back. Uh, I wish we could keep old Jim, Clara, but what can we do? If we don't pay no taxes, we won't have no home. All I know is we're in want. I know. The Lord's providing. It ain't for us to wonder why. Blessed be the Lord. Amen. Hold it, Margo. Rain up. Oh, oh boy. What is it, Lamar? Why are we stopping? I just wanted you to feast your eyes on this countryside. Oh, it is lovely, isn't it? Isn't it? Doesn't that hill over there remind you of a scene in one of those old western movies you saw when you were a kid? <laughs> Say, it does at that. All it needs is a silhouette of William S. Hart on horseback. <laughs> Say, Margo, did you ever know that I almost became a cowboy once? Oh, Lamont, you're kidding. No, that's a fact. Oh, I don't believe it. I could never picture calling you Hoot Cranston. <laughs> I spent a year and a half on a ranch when I was a youngster. Really? Yeah, here, I'll prove it to you. Uh, just drop your handkerchief on the ground. Oh, now, wait a minute. Those ranch days are over. Just drop your handkerchief. Okay, Hoot, but take it easy. All right. Now, back ten paces. Come on, boy. Back. Back. Whoa. All right, Margo. Here I come. <clears throat> well, uh... Anyway, you got the handkerchief. Uh, yes, but uh, who's going to get my horse? <laughs> Here he comes back again. Listen, from now on, Hoot, I'd advise you to do all your handkerchief picking up in department stores. <laughs> I think you're right, Margo. Hi, Mr. Cranston. Miss Lane. Well, hello, son. Well, Bobby Heflin, you're getting to be quite a little man. 
Why, you've grown a lot since the last time we visited the Wentworth. Gee, Miss Lane, you look pretty in that riding suit. Oh, Bobby, bless you and thanks. Bet Mr. Cranston thinks so, too. Oh, well. <laughs> Tell you, Lamont, there's nothing wrong with that young man's poise. Oh, quite the urban young gentleman. I'll have to tear a leaf from his book. Not a bad idea. How are your mother and father, Bobby? Mother's fine, but Dad's ailing with rheumatism. Oh, oh, that's too bad. Oh, how about your old horse, Jim? I hope he's all right. There he is. See? Over by the barn. Oh, yes. Suppose he remembers us, Bobby. Who, oh, Jim? Say, he never forgets a friend. Call him. Hey, Jim. Look at his ears go up. <laughs> he heard you. <laughs> Come on, Jim. Come on, sir. Come on. Oh, he is coming. <laughs> he remembers you all right, Mr. Cranston. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, old fella. Come on. Oh, he's a wonderful old horse, isn't he? Wonderful? Of course he is. Well, Jim, old boy, how are you? <laughs> See, Mr. Cranston, he's talking to you. Well, you're a good old horse. You are one of the finest jumpers I've ever seen. Weren't you, Jim, huh? Not your head, that's it. <laughs> Can you still laugh, Bobby? Oh, sure. Want to see? Hey, Jim, give Miss Lane a smile. <laughs> <laughs> he's not smiling, he's laughing at me. <laughs> well, Bobby, we must be going along. Thanks for a very interesting little exhibition. You're welcome. Goodbye, Miss Lane. Goodbye, Mr. Cranston. Bye, Bobby. So long, Jim. Bye, Bobby. Bye. Come on, Jim. Let's go and get you some water. Gee, Jim, someday I'm going to get a nice riding suit like Mr. Cranston had. Then you and me will want ride way over to Martinsville. Hey, Bobby. Come here, son. Oh, Pa, Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston were just here. They're visiting the Wentworths. That's so. You just missed them. Oh, did I? That's too bad. I... Hey, Hep. Uh, you, you go to the house, son. Y your ma wants you. Can I take Jim to water first, Pa? No, no, son. You leave Jim here. This gentleman wants to look him over. Look him over? What for? Are you a veterinary, mister? No, kid. Uh, I... Bobby, go to the house. I'll tell you all about it later, son. All right, Pa. Don't talk in front of the boy, Mr. Calsade. Old Jim's the apple of his eye. I guess the old horse loves the boy just about as much. Yeah, kids are funny. They can get attached to any old miserable nag. Yeah. Well, I told you old Jim didn't amount to much as you figure horse flesh. Certainly a bag of bones, all right. But he means a lot to folks hereabouts. Well, if anyone's willing to pay more than $20 for him, they'll bet on my price. $20? Is that what you're offering me? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you $35. I... Now, before you answer me, look at my stock van out there on the road. See them old nags? Eh? Yes. Well, I bought the push of them for what I'm offering you for this one. All right. All right, the horse is yours. Treat him well. He's been a good old fella. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't worry about that, mister. I know how to treat horses. Yep. Poor old Jim. Pa! Oh, Pa! Uh, uh, Bobby, go back to the house, son. Go back. That man, he's taking old Jim uh, away. Where's he taking him, Pa? Where's he... Look, look, son. You you love your ma and Pa, don't you? Yes, Pa, and old Jim, too. I love him. Yes, I know you do. We all do. But, son... You know me or your ma wouldn't do anything out and out wrong, don't you? Yes, Pa. Well, you'd believe me if I tell you we were in danger of losing the farm. Yes, Pa. I, you know, Jim never refused to do anything to help us. No, never, uh, but Pa... Listen to me now, son. All right, Pa. That's what Jim's doing now. He's helping us, same as always. Helping us keep our farm. And... You got to help too, son. By being a little man now, you. But Pa, how's Jim helping us by going away with that man? Well, son, it's it's like this. He, we need money, need it bad. Taxes. Pa, to pay. Pa, you ain't sold, Jim. Answer me, Pa. Yes, son, we had to. Oh no, no! Oh, don't, Pa, get now, him back. Easy now, son. Pa. He... Jim's our friend. Do people sell a friend? No, no, Would but... you sell me, Pa? Oh, Lord bless you, no, son. Of course not. But you sold Jim. Son, I'm trying to make you understand. There's a lot of things people have to do against their will. This is one of those things. Don't you understand that? 
No, Pa. Well, you will someday. Someday you'll understand. Now, come on, son. Let's go to your ma. Pa, look. That man. Yeah. He's making Jim get in with those other well, horses. Don't look over there, son. Come to the house now. He's, he's whipping Jim. Pa, stop him. Don't let him do that. Come on, son. Come on. No. No, make him stop. Make him uh, let Jim go. Son. Jim. Jim. Come back, Jim, son. Jim, you can't do Come that. back, son. Jim. I can't come back, Pa. C- can't come back. Gotta save Jim. Bobby, your son. Take this for your ma. Come on, like the doctor said you ought to. Do... Do people... Tell a friend, Pa? Oh. Jim. Jim. Your pa's gone to get Jim back, son. Now won't you take this? So she'll get a little bit of sleep. Jim. Jim. Never come back. Never. Oh, Lord of mercy. Ain't nothing to be done for our little Tice. <laughs> nothing. Oh, don't, Mrs. Heflin. Don't give way. Here. Let me have that medicine. He ain't closed an eye in two days. Margo? Yes, I'm on. Take the spoon. All right. Bobby. Bobby, now listen to me. This is Mr. Cranston. Mr. Cranston? Yes. Mr. Cranston. Mr. Cranston. I... I... It's so you... Coming over a hill. Riding old Jim. Oh. Bobby, will you drink this for me? It'll put you to sleep. And when you wake up, we'll talk about Jim. Well, will you bring him back? Yes, Bobby, I will. Oh, Mr. Cranston. If if you do, I'll I'll pray for you. So old Jim. Oh, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Now, will you take the medicine? Here we are. That's it. Take a good long drink, son. Oh. Yeah. And just a little more. Oh. There, that's fine. Now, lie back and sleep. Sleep. Wake up. Talk. Talk about Jim. Talk about old oh, Jim. Bobby. Son. Oh, you've done it. Praise be the Lord. You've done it. He's going off to sleep. Oh, thank heaven. He certainly needs it badly. Well, there's only one thing to do. Old Jim will have to be brought back. Back? What do we give the farm if need be to get him? Poor Mark walked his shoes bare trying to find that Mr. Calfade. Nobody knows him hereabouts. You say nobody knows this man Calfade? None that we can find. He just come round and paid us thirty-five dollars for Jim. Then he loaded him in a van with three other old horses and went on his way. And that's all we know about him. For all of us, he may be on the other side of the country. Thirty-five dollars. That's right. Yeah. Dealer in old horses. <laughs> Strange. Listen, there's Mark coming up the porch now. Oh, good. Good. I do hope he has some word. Oh. Oh. Mr. Cranston, Miss Lane. Hello, Mark. 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 Come to see the little tyke, did you? Well, yes, Mark. That's mighty nice of you. How is he, Clara? Mark, he's asleep. Oh, good, good. Oh, ain't no use in me asking. I can see it in your eyes. You didn't find him. No, Clara, I didn't. Oh, Mark. Mark, uh, what are we going to do? Easy, Clara. Girl, ain't no use you putting yourself down, too. No trace at all, eh, Mark? Traces, yeah, but that's all. I ran into a couple of farmers that sold him horses, but he'd gone. Old horses? Some old, some sick or blind. Margo, I promised that boy I'd bring old Jim back. Well, maybe I can't, but I'm going to give an idea I have a good fling. Oh, good for you, Lamont. Good night, Mrs. Heffern. If I stir anything up, Mark, I'll get in touch with you right away. In the meantime, don't lose hope. Oh, thank you, oh, Mr. Cranston. Good, good night. Good, good night. night. 
Well, Lamont, let's see now. You've got the whole state and a couple of million people. And out of all that, you've got to find one Mr. Calstade, trader in old horses. How do you think you're going to bring about such a momentous social event? Well, suppose we start by calling on some farmers. Or rather, let me correct myself. Suppose the shadow starts by calling on some farmers. Calstade, you say? You never heard of him? Never? Night before last, he was here. Bought an old sorrel horse. Uh, long about noon today came, but I had nothing to do. Oh, I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Oh, I come from Alabama for my true love for the sea. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry to interrupt your song, but I'm pressed for time. Pull up. Whoa, there, mustard blaster. Whoa, whoa, there. Yeah, that's better. Now we can talk. Who is that addressing Rufus? Wherever you is, come on out from under that hay. That ain't no place for talking with a gentleman. I'm not hiding in your load of hay, Rufus. I'm sitting right beside you. Yeah, you see you. Oh, now chicken fritters I done eat. What kind of game are you all playing? I don't see nobody beside me. You can't see me, Rufus. I have the power to cloud men's minds and make myself invisible. Oh, Lord, help me. You're not afraid, are you, Rufus? Afraid? Mister, I'm scared stiff. I mean no harm. I simply want to ask you a few questions. Uh, you you ain't the man from down below, is you? Because if you is, I want no, to tell no, you... No, no, Rufus. Was... I'm not the man from down below. I'm the shadow. Yes, I want to ask you if you know a man by the name of Calsade. Boss, I swear I never met the gentleman my whole life. He's a horse trader, and he goes about... A horse about... trader? Yes. Horse trader, you say? Well, there's a gentleman was buying a horse from my boss tonight. Yes? What kind of a horse? Well, sir, he ain't no county... An he's old just... horse? No, sir. Yes, sir. Rufus, <laughs> don't mention a word of this to a soul. I want to follow that man when he leaves your boss's farm. Remember now, not a word. Mr. Shadow, after this, I don't reckon I'll be able to open my mouth for at least four days. Faster, Muggle, faster. I've got it right down the floor now. Uh, it's no use, Muggle. The car ahead has given us the slip. Well, are you sure it was Kelsey? Positive. He had two horses in the van. Bought one from Rufus's boss. It was Kelsey, all right. We've lost him. Well, he couldn't outride us with that van. He must have turned in one of those side roads back there. Maybe. Turn back, Margot. We'll scour the countryside. We've got to get a line on Calcade. Okay, Hockey, the stock vans with the thoroughbreds got away safe. Now we've got to work fast. Pile up that hay near the end store. All right, boss. Hey, uh, you think that car on the road was tailing us, Calfade? I don't know, but I ain't taking any chances. Got to burn up those old nags fast. Well, there won't be anything left to prove anything when we get through here. Hey, but look, Calfade, uh, we've been pretty lucky so far with all the stables we've been burning. But how much longer are we going to get away with it? You let me worry about that. Ah, that's that nag old Jim we've had so much trouble with. Ah, uh, the one that belonged to the kid? Yeah, that's the one. Hey, uh, how's that, Calfade? I got all the hay piled up. Ah, that's swell. Now drop a match on it. Oh, gee, this, this is the part that I don't like, boy. Shut up and do what I tell you. Well, that'll take care of it, all right. Now, let's get out and shut the nags in. Yeah, I'm glad to get out. Come on, stupid. Make it snappy. I'm hurrying. I'm hurrying. Gee, I don't like this business. Keep quiet. All right, that's got it. Let's get in the car and scram. Come on up, Margot. They've gone. Thank heaven. Phew, those brammers had my face all scratched. That was a strange performance, wasn't it? I don't understand it, Lamont. They took ten thoroughbred horses out of that barn and then put ten old ones into it. Yes. I wish we could have been near enough to hear what those two were talking about. Lamont, look. What? Margot! 
It's smoke. The barn's on fire. The horses, they'll be burned up. Oh, Lamont, we've got to get them out. Hurry, Margo, hurry. But well, what are you going to do? Stand back, Margo. I'm going to try and run those horses out. Well, I'm going in with you. No, Margo, you can't well, you do can't that. you can't handle all those horses alone, Lamont. All right. Release those in the center stall. Fire hasn't reached there yet. They'll run for the door. Well, how are you going to get the others to pass the plane? I'll blindfold them with my coat. Work fast, Margo. Be careful, Lamont. Come on, boy. Come on. Boy, good boy, come on, Margo. Yes, Lamont. Where are you? I'm out here. I'm all right. Have we got them all? No, I think so. Ooh, the smoke blinded me so I can't see the cut. Yeah. Let's see now. They, there were ten. I, Margo. What is it, Lamont? Jim. Where's Jim? Oh, Lamont. He's not out here. Jim. Jim. He's still inside, Margo. I've got to get him. Oh, you can't go in there now, Lamont. The side wall's ready to come down. I've got to, Margo. I've got to get Jim. Lamont! Lamont, don't go in there, please! Jim! Jim! There. Steady, old boy. <coughs> come on, Jim. <coughs> come on, boy. Lamont, the wall is coming down! kind of an insurance outfit is this? How long do I have to wait, Macy? Sit down, Mr. Colsade, and calm yourself now. Check's being drawn. Has to be okayed by several officials first. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Colsade, this is the fifth time in two months that you've lost a stable full of horses. Rather unusual, isn't it? And it enough that I lost my fine-blooded stock without being tied up in red tape and answering your silly questions? <laughs> Are you laughing at me? I didn't laugh. I laugh, Kelsey. You... Hey, what is this? Who's doing the talking? It is I, Kelsey. The shadow. The shadow? Why, this is screwy. I hear the guy and I don't see him. No, Kelsey, you can't see me. And that's too bad. You can't see how sorry I am for your pathetic plight. The loss of your fine-blooded stock. The stock, yeah. In fact, you don't realize how completely you've lost them. This time you failed, Calcade. What are you talking Your ten thoroughbreds are in the hands of the police. And so are the rest of your gang. What is this, a gag? Fire chief told me the horses were all burned up. Did you see the charred remains when you returned to the barn after the fire? I know. Chief said they'd already been removed. That's right. He acted in accordance with instructions from the shadow. That's a lie. You're trying to trick me. The ten old horses you substituted for the insured stock are alive and well. You've been doing this vicious thing again and again all over the country. But at last, the police have enough evidence to send you away for the rest of your life. You can't prove nothing. I have a signed claim, Shadow. Good. Open that door, Mr. Macy. The police are waiting for you outside, Calcade. Well, the package is all set, Margo. How about the note? Here we are, Lamont. All right, read it to me, will you, Margo? Mm-hmm. Dear Bobby, enclosed is your riding habit, made just exactly like Mr. Cranston's. Old Jim's blanket should reach you before you get this. Mm-hmm. We are both looking forward to our ride over to Martinsville with you and Jim. Love. Good. I'll put it right on top. All right. There we are. Well, can you think of anything else we might do for the boy, Margo? Well, you could uh, teach him your handkerchief trick. <laughs> oh, no. Hoot Cranston does not ride again. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The weed of crime bears... Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. Ha, 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 ha.
Shadow, mysterious character who waves the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, Death Shows the Way. Dum de dum de dum, knocked him in the old Kent Road. Oh, what Alan. To, to, yes, Mr. Cranston, what to cheer? Dum de dum de dum. Alan. Doctor, yes, sir. Dum de dum de dum. Alan, what in the world are you doing? Picking your clothes, sir. Uh, now, just a minute, Alan. I'm going away for the weekend, not a trip around the world. Well, these are all necessities, sir. Now, look, Alan. All I need is a change of linen, a toothbrush, and a razor. I'm sorry, sir, but that's impossible. What do you mean? I mean that I shan't send you any place without the proper appointments. Oh, I have nothing to say about it, is that it? Uh, quite correct, sir. Love. Well, I will say something about it, and right here. Now, now look, Alan, you come here. There. May I come in? Oh, hello, Margot. Come ahead. Are you all ready to leave? Uh, not quite. I have to settle a small point with Alan first. Oh, I bet I know what it is, too. Something to do with your weekend wardrobe? Yes, exactly. Alan, for the last time, I'm telling you not to pack my bags full of all that junk. You see, hunting jacket, golf shoes, dinner clothes, riding boots, business. Oh, yes, yes, fishing tackle, fishing tackle. Did you hear me, Alan? Uh, quite so, sir. A suede jacket, polo shirts, tennis shorts. Then why don't you do as I say? Because, as I've told you before, Mr. Cranston, you shan't go to the Bartons unless you're correctly turned out. And that, if I may display firmness, sir, is final. There, you're all packed. But the Bartons don't care whether I'm correctly turned out or not. It isn't the Bartons that I'm trying to impress, sir. Then who is it? Their butler. What to... No. <laughs> Come on, pick up your bags, Lamont. You've lost again. Sometime before this weekend is over, Lamont, we must have the Count tell us about his marvelous experience on Capri. No, no, Mrs. Barton. I'm afraid it would be too long and dull for Mr. Cranston. Why, not at all. That's my specialty. Long, dull stories. I collect them. <laughs> oh, Henry, what a beautiful dog. When did you get him? Oh, just the other day. Yeah. Uh, come here, Major. How do you call that kind of dog? Uh, great Dan. He's a big, ferocious looking dog. Yeah, now lie down, Major. <laughs> Uh, how about some crackers and cheese, you people? Oh, that's for me, Henry. Okay, help yourself. Oh, Henry, that's a nice way to talk to a guest. Uh, what do you mean, guest? When Lamont Francis spends a weekend with us in the country, he's a member of the family. Well, thanks, Henry. <laughs> Say, speaking of members of the family, who's that young fellow approaching across the lawn? Yes, dear. Mommy, Nurse says I have to go in and have my face washed and have my supper. Do I have to, Mommy? Did he say Mommy? Why, Helen, I didn't know. Helen. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. I didn't tell you that Henry and I adopted a child a couple of months ago. Oh, I see. Do I have to, Mommy? Now, Skippy, I want you to meet some friends of ours. Miss Margot Lane, Mr. Cranston, and Count Santa. Hello, Skippy. Hello, Skippy. Hello. Do I have to have my face washed, Daddy? Well, judging by its appearance, it wouldn't do any harm. Oh, uh, I think you'd better go in and do what Nurse tells you to do. I don't want to. Daddy promised me a story. Daddy will tell you a story after dinner. Run along now. I don't want to. Oh, dear, what'll I do? Oh, I know, Henry. Call the dog. Tell him it's his new pet. Maybe that'll please him. Here, Major. Come here, boy. There, there. Now, look, Skippy. See what your mother and I bought for you? Oh, a doggy. Hello, nice doggy. Oh, daddy, daddy, daddy. Major, Major, me. get back to the house. Henry, that dog is vicious. Now, Helen, daddy. don't get excited. The dog just isn't used to children, that's all. Now, Skippy, you run along. Daddy, are you going to tell me a story after dinner? I'm afraid not, son. Daddy has a very important business date after dinner. But you promised. Now, run along, Skippy. Mommy will be up to see you later. I don't care. Daddy promised to tell me a story. Oh, now, see Daddy. what you've done, Henry. I can't help it, Helen. You know that Mr. Knight from Taylor and Company is coming here tonight with your necklace. But, Henry, you promised. Now, darling, we have guests here, remember? <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed the little visit backstage in the home life of the Bartons. <laughs> oh, we loved it. <laughs> you uh, spoke of a necklace, Mr. Barton. Is it the same one that I read about your buying in the newspapers? Uh, yes, the Great Harvey Diamond. The Great Harvey? Have you bought that, Henry? Yes, they're uh, bringing it here tonight. Oh, well, isn't that the jewel with the great legend attached to it? Legend? What is the legend, Miss Lane? Why, I believe the story is that it brings misfortune to whoever owns it. Isn't that it, Henry? Hmm, some such silly yarn, yes. I take it, then, that you do not believe in this legend, eh, Mr. Barton? Eh? Why, of course not. 
You're a brave man, Mr. Barton. A very brave man. Mr. Barton, I trust that you've arranged to keep the necklace in a safe place. At least until you've paid me in full. Oh, naturally, I... <laughs> well, I guess our business is finished here, then. I imagine you'd like to get back to your guests. No, on the contrary. I find it very difficult to tear myself away from this necklace. Beautiful stone. Daddy. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, it's all right, Skippy. You can come in. Skippy, this is Mr. Knight, a business friend of your father's. Mr. Knight, this is my son. How do you Daddy, do? when are you going to tell me that story? Huh? And Mommy said you're so forgetful. Did you think to offer Mr. Knight a drink? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mommy is well. right as usual. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Knight, will you forgive me and let me make you up one for the oversight? Well, now that you mention it, I wouldn't mind having a drink. It's a long drive back to town. Well, how'll you have it? Uh, straight, please. Water on the side. Straight it is. There you are. Thank you. Uh, aren't you drinking, Mr. Barton? Uh, no, I... Uh, I've been on the wagon lately. Oh, that's too bad. Well, here's to the great Harvey Diamond. May it bring you much happiness. Gee, you drank it all in one gulp. Skippy, that's not very polite. Well, I've got to be going. I... Oh. What's the matter? I... I don't know how I feel, but... Peculiar. You're white as a sheet. <coughs> was it? Get me some water. Yeah, but you can't. It's empty. I'll run and get you some. I... Oh. Oh, gee. Daddy! Daddy! Oh, here's the water. Daddy! Daddy! Here, what's happened? Oh, Daddy, he fell down like that. Skippy, uh, go out and play now and uh, don't say anything to anyone about this. Do you understand? To no one. Yes, Daddy. I won't tell anyone. Uh, hello, Skippy. Uh, uh, what's all the shouting about in here? Yes, is something wrong? Oh, uh, oh, uh, hello. Uh, Mr. Knight's had a sudden attack of some kind. Uh, I'm afraid he's very ill. Mm -hmm. We must get him upstairs. Uh, Count Santo, will you lift his feet, please? Surely. I don't think that'll be necessary, Henry. Well, why not? It's too late. He's dead. Dead? Yes. What happened, Henry? What brought this on? I don't know. We were sitting here discussing the diamond and... The diamond. The diamond. What about it? It, it was right here on the desk. It's disappeared. You know, Lamont... Someday, sometime, we're going to go someplace where we'll actually spend two consecutive days when absolutely nothing happens. <laughs> Margot, tell the truth now. You'd be bored to death. Yes, I suppose I would. It's the fire horse in me, I guess. Come on, what do you make of this thing? Well, it's undoubtedly murder. The killer made off with the Harvey Diamond. Well, why did Mr. Barton raise such a fuss about calling the police? Well, I'm not sure. Probably didn't want his name dragged into a bad mess. Incidentally, what's keeping the police? Why haven't they gotten here? We're out in the country, Margot. It'll take them some time. And meanwhile, we're faced with a familiar question. Who done it? Yes. Who... Margot, I think there's a partial answer to your question just leaving the back door of the house. Who is it, Lamont? I'm not sure, but it looks like our continental friend, Count Santo. Well, where's he going? My guess would be to the garage. Come on, we'll find out. Do you know something, Lamont? What? I don't think he's any more of a count than I am. Yeah? Do you know something, Margot? What? Neither do I. <laughs> do you think he's trying to make a getaway? I don't think I know. Come on, we'd better hurry. Well, what are you going to do? Have a talk with Mr. Santo and find out why he's so anxious to leave here. Oh, but Lamont, that's dangerous. If he is the murderer, he'll try to kill you, too. Don't worry, Margot. The shadow will take care of that. Now, well, some lug has put this starter on the fritz. Huh? <laughs> what was that? I wouldn't bother wearing out the battery, Count Santo. The ignition wires have been cut. Who is speaking to me? I am called the shadow. Huh? Shadow. So you've heard of me, eh, Count Santo? Heard of you? Why, why... I thought probably you had. My name is quite familiar to those of the underworld. Underworld? Never heard of that either, I suppose. Who are you? Where are you? I am right beside you. Here. In the shadows. 
Oh, don't try to look for me. You see, I have clouded your mind so you cannot see me. Well, what do you want of me, Mr. Shadow? May I suggest first that you forget your accent? Well, what do you mean? I mean that when the starter of your car didn't work, you had no difficulty with the English language at all. You're a pretty smart guy, aren't you, Shadow? That's better. Well, what do you want of me? I'd like to know why, after a robbery and a murder have been committed in the Barton house, you are leaving it so hurriedly. That's my business. It's also mine. Now listen to me, Santo, or whatever your real name is. I'm seeing to it that you're not leaving this place until the police arrive. So you'd better tell me all you know about what happened in the house. I don't know anything. You're lying, Santo. So I'm lying, but I still don't know anything. Then what were you doing here, under an assumed name, accepting the Barton hospitality? Shall I tell you? Yes, do, Shadow. You came to steal the Harvey Diamond. No, 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 that's a lie. You'd better tell me the truth, Santo. There's been a murder committed tonight. And the finger of guilt points straight at you. All right, Shadow. All right, I'll talk. But you're not hanging any murder rap on me, see? Because I don't know anything about that. That's the truth. How did you become acquainted with the Bartons? I met them last year in Europe. I made them think I was a count because... Well, that's my racket, see? When a sucker gets taken by nobility, they don't feel so bad about it. Well, the Bartons look like a soft touch, so I gave them a play. Go on. I didn't tap them for anything over there. I just had a hunch on them, that's all. I felt I could build them up for a bigger take later on. <laughs> I was right. You mean the Harvey Diamond? I mean the Harvey Diamond. I read about old man Barton planning to buy it, so I looked him up again. I swung this weekend because I knew he'd be getting the necklace. I see. And you came up here to steal it? Yes. My plan was to wait till sometime late tonight. Then I'd grab the stones and make a getaway while everyone was sleeping. That somebody else beat me to it. You wouldn't still be lying by any chance? Listen, Shadow, I'm a high-class, respectable jewel thief. Murder is out of my line. Even murder for the Harvey Diamond? You know, for a supposedly smart guy, you don't follow the ball too close, do you? What do you mean? I mean there's somebody else in that house who wanted that diamond. Somebody who'd kill for it. Who are you talking about, Santo? Well, maybe I'm not saying. Come on, Santo. I know enough about you to put you behind bars for life. Name the killer. Okay. Okay. I'm speaking. Santo! Santo! Cut me. Cut me, too. Who is it, Santo? Who is this murderer? It's. It's. Mr. Mr. Lamont! Lamont, are you all right? Hey, yes, Margot. Oh, I was standing just outside the door and I heard the shot. Did you see anyone as you came in? No, but I heard footsteps running down the driveway. Lamont, is he? Yes, he's dead. Come on, Margot. We've got to catch this killer before he makes a getaway. Did you learn anything from Santo? No. Just as he was about to reveal the murderer's name, the shots were fired. Hey, Lamont, what's that? I don't know, but it came from the house. Come on. What's happened now? What's up? What's the matter here? It's Gibby. What's happened to him? I left him sitting here on the porch. I, I came out and he was gone. And then I looked in the lane at the foot of the grounds and two men had him. They put him in a big sedan and drove away. Gibby. Skippy's been kidnapped. Well, Margot, how's little Skippy? Well, he seems to be well enough, Lamont. Did you tell him I wanted to see him? Yes, he'll be right down. Oh, good. Lamont, I can't understand... Why should anyone want to kidnap the child and then, then let him go again, two hours later? I don't know. In fact, Margot, I don't know or understand the happenings of this entire night. Police are out in the garage. Oh? they find anything? Well, they learned that the bullets that killed Count Santo were fired through the back window. <laughs> That's a clever bit of deduction. I found that out when the gun went off. And they also learned that Mr. Knight was poisoned. Oh, I see. <laughs> They're making remarkable progress, aren't they? Lamont, have you any suspicions at all as to who killed Mr. Knight and Count Santo? Well, there are only five of us left here in the house. I didn't do it. And I'm reasonably certain you didn't. Thanks. So, that leaves no one but the Bartons, doesn't it? Oh, Lamont, you're not saying that Mr. Barton... I'm not saying anything, Margot. Yet. You want to see me, Mr. Cranston? Oh, yes. Come in, Skippy. I'd like to ask you some questions about what happened tonight. You carry a gun. I know, Skippy. Why? I guess you're not much of a detective, then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Margo, um, do you mind leaving us men alone? Oh, well, if that's the way you feel about it. 
All right, I'll go down to the garage and see if the detectives who do carry guns will talk to him. Oh, no, Margo, I didn't mean that. Skippy, if, if he tries to give you the third degree, you just call out and I'll come a-running. <laughs> Well, Skippy, now let's what see. What was it Miss Lane said you'd give me, Mr. Cranston? Oh, nothing, Skippy. But she said you'd oh, give well, me... Let's forget what she said now. Instead, suppose you tell me exactly what happened to you. Well, I was sitting on the porch just like Mommy told me, and then the first thing I knew, there was some men standing beside me. I see. I got scared and I started to call for Mommy, but one of the men put his hand on my mouth and I couldn't. Did you ever try to call your Mommy with a hand over your mouth? <clears throat> no, no, I, I don't think I have. Uh, what happened then, Skippy? Well... He took me down to a car, and he put me in the car, and we drove away. Yes? And then we... Hey, what was it Miss Lane said you'd give me? <laughs> she was only having fun with you, Skippy. Now, tell me, what happened next? Well, they, they took me to an old, old house that was right in the middle of a big, dark woods, and they, they tied me up with rope and everything, and then they, they went away. And then what? Then they came and got me and brought me back here again. Is that all that happened? Yep. Well, what do they talk like? Talk like? Yes, what were their voices like? What did they talk about? Oh, well, they talked awful funny. They didn't speak American at all. And they had big, long knives. Oh, I see. <laughs> Kidnappers must have gotten scared and brought you back. <laughs> well? Oh, here you are, Lamont. Hello, Henry. What's the matter? It's about the diamond. Well, what about it? It wasn't stolen at all. What do you mean? The police were just searching the late Mr. Knight's clothing. They came across this package. Look. What? Why, it's the necklace. Yes. I've just finished examining it, and there isn't a doubt that this is the genuine stone. But the one that was stolen. It was a copy of the original. It's customary, you know, for all valuable gems to have imitation substitutes. And Knight must have accidentally given me the wrong one first. Then the murderer got nothing but a worthless imitation. Exactly. Do you know what this means, Barton? No. When the killer discovers his mistake, he'll come back for the original stone. That's so? He might at that. Well, if he does, I'll be ready for him. I have a better idea. You can take this offer for what it's worth, but I'd be glad to keep the necklace for you until morning. Well, that's very kind of you, Lamont, but... I know it's a rather large order asking you to trust me with such a priceless jewel, but I think you know me well enough. Oh, yes, yes, of course, but... Uh... Good. Then let me have it. Oh, now look here, Lamont. Ah, that's fine. We can bring it into your vault in town in the morning. Oh, you shouldn't do this. Oh, I wonder who left the dog in the house. I like to play with a dog, Daddy. When I kick him, he makes a funny noise. Don't ever let me catch you doing that or I'll take him away from you. Major, now, Major, get out of here. Watch, Daddy, I'm going to kick him. Oh, Daddy, keep away from Major, me. Major, Major, stop screaming, Skippy. I've got one of them. Uh, you'll either have to get rid of Skippy or the dog. And I'd suggest... Yes, I know, but for the time being, the dog is out of this house and stays out now. Quiet, Skippy. Oh, excuse me, Lamont. Now, down, Major, quiet now, quiet. All right, now, Skippy. The dog's gone, it's all right. Are you through talking with me, Mr. Cranston? I guess so, Skippy. Unless you can think of anything else to tell me. No, that's all. Can I go upstairs to Mommy now? You certainly can. And she has my good wishes. I'm awful thirsty, too. Maybe I'd better have a glass of water. There's some on that table over there. You can help yourself. Would you like some water, Mr. Cranston? Why, thank you very much. Here you are. Ah, thanks. Mm. That water tasted funny, mm. I... Daddy! Daddy, come quick! I think Mr. Cranston's sick! I asked him not to do it. Why in the name of thunder did I let him? What do you mean, Henry? Lamont was keeping the diamond for me. That's why he was poisoned. It must be. The diamond, the real diamond, is missing. Daddy, what was the matter with Mr. Cranston? He looked so funny when you carried him upstairs. Hush, Skippy. Why didn't that doctor come down? Why must he be so long? Now, Margot. Doctor, how is he? I'm afraid I have bad news for you. Oh. No, no. Mr. Cranston is dead. No, he can't be. I don't believe Where it. Where are you going, Margot? I've got to see him. Come back, Margot. I wouldn't go up there now. Please, please, Margot. Oh, the Lamont. Lamont. Come on. Take it easy, Margot. What? Did you... Shh, yes. I spoke, Margot. Oh. Now, now, dear, take it easy. But the doctor said that yes, you... Yes, I know. He said I was dead. I fooled the good doctor with a little trick of suspended animation that I once learned. I'm sorry, darling, that you suffered from my hopes. But it was very necessary. Necessary enough to break me into pieces like this? Yes, Margot, yes. What do you mean? Just this. 
As far as everyone downstairs is concerned, I'm dead. You mean permanently? <laughs> no, just for the next few minutes. Now, you've got to help me with this. How? I want you to go back downstairs. Behave just as you would have if I had really died. Yes? The shadow will join you down there. But first, you must do as I say. Well, Margot? I can't believe he's dead. Who's dead, Mommy? Mr. Cranston dead? Quiet, Skippy, please. Margot, why don't you get some rest? I don't want to stay in the house with a dead man, Mommy. Please, can I go outside? Oh, that's a good idea, Skippy. Why don't you? Oh, Helen, you can't let that boy out of here after what happened to him before. But I want to go out, Mommy. No, Skippy, Miss Lane is right. I don't care about Miss Lane. I want to go outside. Skippy, how dare you talk like that to your mother? I'm going out. No, you aren't, Skippy. You let go of me. I want to get out. <laughs> what was that? I think you'd better stay right here, Skippy. Daddy, who's talking to me? I'm called the Shadow. Does my name sound familiar to you, Skippy? No. No. What are you doing here, Shadow? And why are you trying to frighten this boy? Because, Mr. Barton, this boy, as you call him, is at the bottom of everything that's happened here tonight. What do you mean? I mean that he is the murderer of Mr. Knight and Count Santo and the thief who stole the Harvey Diamond. That's preposterous. How could a child... Skippy's not a child, Mr. Barton. Skippy hasn't been a child for many years. Not a child? No. He's a midget. What? Oh, I don't believe it. Daddy, what's he saying about me? If you don't believe me, Mr. Barton, then I suggest you look in his jacket pocket. I think you'll find the missing necklace. But I... Go on, look. Daddy, please, I want to go out. I don't like that man. Now come here, Skippy. No. Why don't you let him search you, Skippy? Well, Skippy, there's no harm. All right. All right. Keep away from me, all of you. Look out, Henry. He's got a gun. Yes, and I'll use it on the first one of you that makes a move. Let me warn you, Mr. Shadow. I can't see you. But if you lay a hand on me, I'll get these people before you get me. Skippy, what are you saying? All right, all right, can the Skippy stuff. From now on, you can call me by my real name. It's Mike. Mike Harati, see? Mike Harati? Sure, and I got your diamond too, Mr. Barton, right here in my pocket. Put that gun down, Harati. Not a chance, Mr. Shadow. I'm getting out of here right now. He's turned off the lights. So long, Daddy. <laughs> He's climbing out the window. We've got to stop him. He's running across the lawn. No, no. I'll go and help him. I'm afraid that my karate is beyond help now, Mr. Parton. Lamont, what made you suspect that Skippy wasn't a child? Well, Margot, that kidnapping, for one thing. It was too good to be on the level. It was arranged to get him out of the house with the diamond. And then, when his confederates found out that he'd stolen the phony gem... They brought him back again to steal the real stone. Oh, I see. And to clinch matters, I asked Barton to let me keep the real necklace. And after I keeled over, after apparently drinking the water, I felt him take the jewel from my pocket. Hmm. Nice business. Well, it wasn't a dull weekend. I should say not. Two murders and little Mike killed by the dog. You know, Lamont, I'm going to have a funny attitude toward children from now on. Well, how's that? Well... When I touch them on the cheek, I won't know whether to pet them or feel for a beard. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not... The 
Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, Sandhog Murder. Deep under the river, knee-deep in glacial muck and slime, you'll find them. The sandhogs, working under terrible pressure. Pressure beating against their eardrums. Pressure forcing little nitrogen bubbles into their bloodstreams. Pressure that causes death. Pressure that keeps the river out of the tunnel that men are building under the river. One hundred feet under the river. How far did we go on that last shot? Twenty-seven inches, boss. Tighten those jacks next to the shield. Okay, boy. Yeah, Rodsky speaking. Time? Okay. All right, men, that's all for today. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Hey, hey, Mr. Pine. Want to get left down here? Oh, I'm sorry. I was so interested. You better come along and get in a decompression chamber. I say, I, I hate to admit this, but... Well, I feel sick. I can hardly move my head. Uh, that's the same complaint from all visitors to our little rabbit hole. Uh, just give me your arm. Thank uh, you. There we are. Come on, come on. Into this decompression chamber. Get the move on, all of you. Oh, I'm glad this shift is over with. Ah, uh, quit your beef. You get your pay regular, don't you? Yeah, what do you think? Okay. Decompress. Decompressing. Mr. Pine, do you know what could happen to you if you got left behind? No. Ever been in a pressure tunnel before? No, I haven't. I... Well, it ain't no picnic ground, mister. You ever hear of the bends? It's some kind of sickness, isn't it? <laughs> it ain't no reducing exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell the world it's sickness. You see, working in these pressure tum- tunnels pumps you full of nitrogen bubbles. And if you was to come out of the pressure too fast... Those bubbles would stop your heart quicker than a dollar watch. Yeah, you gotta have the right kind of stomach to stand it. You know what would happen if we opened that door now? No, what? We'd all pop like punctured balloons. The pressure's got to go down slow like. Just now we are working under 39 pounds of pressure per square inch. Say, are you trying to scare me? Ah, uh, lay off me, Jack. <coughs> we had enough trouble lately. All right. Hey, hey. Stop saying what happened. Pressure stopping too fast. Oh, kill him. Turn, turn to increase the pressure. Too late. Too late. Come on. Did you read the comic strips this morning? Uh-huh. They were very humorous. Winnie Winkles in the hospital. Little orphan Annie's house burned down, and Andy Gump was hit by a truck. Uh-huh. Come on. I wonder why they call them funny papers. Say, are you listening to me? Hmm? Uh-huh. Listen, Mr. Cranston, you haven't paid the slightest bit of attention to anything I've said to you for the last hour. I'm sorry, Margot, but that horrible business in the new intercity tunnel has been on my mind. What business? Eight men were killed in the decompression chamber yesterday. Decompression chamber? Uh, something evidently went wrong. Pressure was lowered too suddenly, and they all died terrible deaths. Well, how did it happen, Lamar? Well, they don't know. It looks pretty funny. According to the newspaper reports, the men working at the tunnel had been expecting something to happen. There had been several near accidents, and the men were pretty jittery. Hmm. Well, you don't suppose that... Uh, oh, Lamont, I know that look in your eye, that old crime detector look. You think that someone had something to do with that accident. I don't know anything about that, Margot. The reason I'm upset is that Pete Stockton is an old friend of mine. I, I know just how he must feel to have eight of his men killed working on his tunnel. Pete Stockton? Yes, the contractor. We went to school together. This intercity tunnel is the first big job he's handled alone since his father died about a year ago. Oh, I see. And uh, you'd like to see him, wouldn't you? I no, Margot, not today. We have a date, I... I wouldn't think of it. Oh, that's just the trouble. You do think of it. So I guess we might just as well see this old schoolmate of yours. Margo, you're wonderful. But about 
those men who died in the decompression chamber, Pete. How do you explain that? I, I can't explain it, Lamont. There's been so much trouble around here on this job, and then to have this terrible thing happen. Well, it'll never happen to me again. Well, what do you mean? I'm quitting. I never wanted this tunnel work. I was just doing it for Dad's sake. Well, he's dead now. Joe Brandley and other contractors agreed to take the whole thing off my hands. Quitting? Yes. I couldn't stand another experience like this one. All those men left wives, sweethearts, and mothers. How can I ever repay them? Make up to them for their loss? Hey, Pete. The men want to talk to you. They want to go back to work. What, did you tell them that Brandley was taking over Monday? I told them, but they want to work for you, not Brandley. Well, I, I guess I'll have to tell them myself. Oh, uh, by the way, this is Pop Berkey. Miss Lane. How do you do? Mr. Do you Cranston. Do? How do you do? How do you do? Pop's an old timer. He and my dad broke into the business together. Well, uh, ask him anything you want to know about sand hogging. I'll be back in a few minutes. Now, he's taking the whole thing pretty hard, isn't he? Yes. I'd like to help him, Margo. He, he's a swell guy. Uh, <clears throat> first time you two have been around the tunnel in the making? What? Oh, yes. It's very interesting, isn't it? But is it necessary to keep everything so greasy? Well, Mr. Berkey, what caused the accident in the decompression chamber? Are you asking me what or who? So you think that the accident wasn't exactly an accident? I got my own ideas, but I'm not saying. If you know anything, Mr. Berkey, you've got to tell me. Well, now, supposing you were in the contracting business and another contractor beat you out on a big job, an important job. Wouldn't you try a couple of little things to get the job back? You call the murder of eight men little things? Maybe you didn't want to kill the man in the decompression chamber. Maybe you, you just wanted to scare them so they'd be afraid to work for your rival. But to take a chance with men's lives. Lady, you don't know Joe Brandley. Joe Brandley? The man who's taking over the contract from Stockton? Yeah. And a dirtier man would be impossible to find. He wouldn't stop at anything. Like he won out pretty easy, thought he? Pete's turning the contract over to him Monday. Well, he hasn't won yet. Pop Berkey, if you see anything suspicious happening around here, I want you to call me immediately. You understand? Right. Come along, Margo. We'll stop that fellow, Brandley. Margo, I think the shadow is going to pay a call on a certain Mr. Brandley. <laughs> Why should I be afraid? What? Stockton is turning the job over to me? What? At the tunnel. When? Tonight. Yeah, well, let him try it. I'll be at that tunnel and settle this thing once and for all. Yeah. Thanks for the information. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you for the information, Mr. Brindley. What? Who spoke? I did, Mr. Brindley. Who are you? I am called the Shadow. Well, where are you? I can't see you. I have willed it that you won't see me, Brandley. I've cast a mist over your mind that makes me invisible to your eyes. What do you want of me? I would like to know more about that phone conversation you just had. I believe it was concerned with the murders in the new intercity tunnel. Murders? Those men were supposed to die by accident. Did you have anything to do with that accident, Mr. Brandley? What are you talking about? I'm asking you, did you have anything to do with those murders? No, nothing. Then who are you speaking to on the telephone? Why should I tell you? You'd better talk, Mr. Brandley. You haven't got anything on me. That's true. I can't pin anything on you just now. But let me warn you, Mr. Brandley. The shadow intends to prevent anyone from destroying the intercity tunnel. <laughs>
Who's there? Oh, it's you, Mr. Costin. I, I couldn't see you in the dark. Yes, Bob Burke. Oh, Mom, thank heaven you've come. Margo, what are you doing here at the tunnel? Well, I was waiting for you at your apartment, Mama, when Mr. Berkey called. You asked me to call you if anything suspicious was going on here. And something suspicious is going on here. There's someone down in the tunnel, Mr. Cranston. Yes, I know. I expected the killer would make his move tonight with the tunnel deserted. But what are you doing here, Margo? Well, I don't know, but I didn't know how to get in touch with you, so I thought I'd see what I could do in your absence. I left a note for you at your apartment, Lamont. Oh, am I glad you've come. The very idea of going down into that empty tunnel gives me the cold chill. Now, wait a minute, Margot. What were you expecting to do down in the tunnel? What was I expecting to do? Why, I was... Well, now that you mention it, what was I expecting to do? Margot, we're dealing with a desperate man. Do you realize what might be waiting for you down there? Mr. Cranston, he's down in the tunnel, all right. The elevator was at the bottom of the shaft when I came back from dinner. Berkey, what yes. can he do to the tunnel? Well, he could set a time bomb and blow it to pieces. Well, let's go. Where? We're going down into the tunnel, Margot, on a manhunt. You better wait here. All alone? We won't be going long. Uh-uh, not me. I'd rather go down the tunnel. All right, then, let's go. Now, where's the elevator, Berkey? Over this way. I have some boots for you to wear. It's a little muddy down below. All right. Yeah, step in, Margot. It's like going down into a coal mine, isn't it? <clears throat> uh, Margo, uh, have you ever been down in a coal mine? No, but this is the way I imagine it would be. Oh. How deep is this? What? This elevator shaft. About a hundred feet or so. It isn't very deep. Uh, it's deep enough for me, thanks. This will take us down to the tunnel. We've arrived, Margot. That's all. That's enough. All right, step out. <clears throat> Look out for the modern water. Uh, better walk on the planks. Hey, wait a minute. Flash your light around, Berkey. No, no one here. All right, lead on, Berkey. It's a gloomy-looking place, isn't it? Sort of scary, too. You're just outside the tunnel now. All right, step in, Margot. Is this the tunnel? Not yet, lady. This is the decompression chamber. Oh, yes, it is. The what? I'm not going in that thing. Well, it's the only way we can get into the tunnel, Margo. Oh, well, isn't that the place where those men were... Say, I don't think I'm going to like this. Come on, Margo. It's too late to back out now. Well, I'll get in, but it's under protest. Okay, Bertie. Shut the door. What's that hissing sound? Well, that means that air is being pumped into this chamber. They're going under pressure. No, I don't like it. Well, your ears hurt, huh? The pressure. You'll get used to it. I don't intend to get used to it. It's necessary, Margot. You see, we've got to adjust the pressure in our bodies to the pressure in the tunnel before we can enter it. Well, pressure's even now. Ah, this is the tunnel. The river is right overhead, lady. Oh, it's so dark. Can you give us some light, Brookie? I wouldn't want someone sneaking up behind me in the dark. Yeah, that's better. Goodness, it's muddy down here. Now what, Miss Perky? Now we'll take a look around. Knowing you, Lamont, certainly gets me into the darndest places. You're not sorry, are you? No, but I do wish Hey, that... look. I'm going back to the decompression chamber to see that whoever it is don't try to slip out while you're looking toward the center of the tunnel. That's a good idea. We'll go on ahead. Come on, Margo. Come on. You think that was such a good idea? What? Sending him back to guard the exit. Suppose whoever it is down here overpowers him and locks us in. <laughs> Don't be silly, Margo. That couldn't happen. Berkey's no... The lights! They've gone out! Berkey! Berkey, what's wrong? Berkey! Come on, Margo. We've got to get out of here. I can't see anything, Lamont. I can't run in the door. Over this way, Margo. Give me a hand. All right. Here's the door. Get us out of here! Berkey! Help us now. Well, what are we going to do? I guess we'll have to wait until someone comes and lets us out. That's a pleasant thought. I don't really spend the night in this place. What's that? It sounds like a phone. Down here? Yeah, a foreman probably uses it to speak to his boss above ground. Well, where is it? Well, the sound came from... Oh, there it is. Hello? Well, Mr. 
Mr. Cranston. I guess this will teach you not to poke your nose into something that doesn't concern you. Who is this? Makes no difference now, Mr. Cranston. You're going to die. You hear me? Die. Brandley, listen to me. I don't care about myself. But surely you won't do this to a woman. Sorry, I can't oblige you, but she's got to go, too. Now I'm going to step up the pressure in the tunnel till your eardrums crack. Up, up it'll go until the whole tunnel will explode, just like a punctured balloon. The river will rush in and you'll be drowned like rats in a trap. Hello? Hello? Oh, he's hung up. What is it, Lamont? Oh, the lights, the lights are on again. Margot, I've got something to say to you, and it's not going to be easy. Yes, Lamont? This is the end for us. We're going to die here in this hole, Margot. Lamont, I'm not afraid to die. Margot, all I can see is I... I know now that I... I've been right about you. Thanks, Lamont. Is it Brandley? I don't know, Margot. I... I think so. Lamont, what's that? I'm afraid he's going to carry out his threat. He's going to increase the pressure till it blows this tunnel to bits. Well, this is going to be the last few minutes I'm going to spend on this earth. I'm at least going to be gay about it. I'm not going out with a frown on my face. And a very lovely face it is, too, Margot. Why, Lamont, you realize it's practically the first compliment you've ever paid me? Well, it, it just proves what a stuffy guy I've been. Oh, a pretty swell guy, if anyone should ask. There's never been a dull moment on our merry go round We have had a great times together, haven't we? Mm, I wouldn't trade them for anything, Lamont. Oh, Lamont. Oh, my ears hurt. My head. Yeah. I know, Margot. Pressure's going up very rapidly. I, I guess he wants to finish us off in a hurry. Oh, it's warm. It's damp down here. Yeah. Pressure must be up pretty high now. I, we won't have long to wait. The air. The air's getting so misty. Margot. What, it, what is it, Lamont? Margot. Uh, a minute, that weak part of the tunnel up there, the part that hasn't been reinforced, is going to give way. The river's going to rush in. If we climb up this framework here, we'll, we'll be able to hold out longer. Well, what, what difference will, will that make? I don't know, Margo, but come on. Let's climb. All right, Lamont. If, if it'll make you any happier. Here. Give me a hand. I'll help you. Come on. Come on, help! Come on, help! I got it! There it goes! Well, Commissioner Weston, he pumped all the water out of the tunnel. Found no trace of Margot or Lamont's body. He must have been washed into the river. Yeah. You know, they were both personal friends of mine, too. Yes. Yes, I know. Well, that's the way it goes. Lamont was trying to help me. I was going to give up the whole job, Commissioner, but now I'm going ahead with it. If he thought that much of me, I... Well... Yeah, I understand. Well, now tell me about this Pop Berkey. Well, it, it's simple enough. I found Pop myself. He was just outside the tunnel, unconscious from a blow on his head. How long have you known him? Well, he and my dad broke into sand hogging together. Later, when a tunnel accident made Berkey unfit for work underground, my dad always found a job for him up above. Ah. Oh. And, well, I sort of followed in dad's footsteps. Ah. Uh, well, this whole business proves one thing. That so-called accident in the tunnel where the eight men were killed was no accident. I'll have my men stationed at the tunnel tomorrow when you go back to work. Oh, I'd appreciate it, Commissioner Weston. That's all right. You know, I'm going to miss that fellow, Cranston. <laughs> Doctor, do you mind if I stay here a while and look this room over? No, not at all, Commissioner Weston. I've got to go down below in the tunnel and talk to the men. If anything happens this time... Nothing's going to happen, Mr. Stockton. Not while I'm here. Good luck, son. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Commissioner Weston. Huh? What? It's the shadow, Commissioner. The shadow? Well, my friend, what are you doing here? 
I am here to help you catch the murderer. That's what you're here for, isn't it? Yes, yeah, sure, sure, but who is he? Softly, Commissioner, softly. You wouldn't want to scare our murderer away, would you? Is he here? Very close now. In just a moment, he'll come into this room. This is what he's been waiting for. You see, the lives of the men in the tunnel depend on the proper functioning of the pump machinery here. The murderer will attempt to destroy the pump and kill the men down in the tunnel. This is to be his final job. For today, for the first time, Peter Stockton is down below. Well, he won't get away with it. Quiet, Commissioner. I think this is our man now. Quick, hide behind the machinery. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Here it is. The main induction valve. Now, Mr. Stockton, you're going to pay for what your father did to me. Listen, stop it! I'll get it! Hey, try and stop me! I'll stop you, all right? Oh. Well, let's see who it is. Why, it's Pop Berkey. I've killed old Pop Berkey. No, Commissioner. He'll live to pay for his crimes. Now, wait a minute. What? Cranston and you, Miss Lane, I, I, I thought you were... Yes, first. I know, Commissioner, but... Uh, well, I, I, I'll... Uh... Well, aren't you glad to see you? Oh, of course, of course. Uh, but how did you get out? Where have you been? What are you... You were in the tunnel, weren't you? <laughs> One question at a time, Commissioner. Yeah, yeah. We were in the tunnel, all right, but we escaped. Escaped? Yes, we climbed to the top of the tunnel just before the blow-off came. We climbed? There was an air pocket, a very wonderful air pocket. Uh, don't forget the details, Margot. Oh, yes, I ruined a perfectly good pair of stockings. Oh, that's... Uh, about how did you get out? Through the escape chamber. Berkey had forgotten all about that. Ah, ah. but Lamont hadn't. He found it, didn't you, Lamont? Right at the top of the tunnel. Let me tell you something, Commissioner. Yeah. If you ever get stuck in a tunnel, have Lamont along. Well, I still don't understand. Uh, what about Berkey? He confessed everything last night. Seems he hated Stockton because he thought Stockton's father was responsible for his accident. Also, because Stockton's father married the woman he loved. Couldn't get even with his old man, so he was going to take it out on the son. And then he tried to implicate Brandley to shield himself. Well, I guess you've got all the evidence you need, Commissioner, so Margo and I will be running along. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not through with you two yet. Why didn't you let people know that you were safe? Because, Commissioner, we couldn't resist satisfying a lifelong ambition. What's that? Reading our own obituaries. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power 
to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the shadow belongs. Today's story, The Inventor of Death. Lamont, this is really fun. I thought you might enjoy it, Margot. When you asked me to come to an exhibit at the Hall of Science, I began trying to think of fast excuses about sick grandmothers. Oh, really? Yes. I pictured a lot of stuffy old men mumbling in their beards about relativity or something. I see. <laughs> this is really exciting. Look, what's that over there? Well, they have a sign-up. Let's find out. All right. Yeah, demonstrating the scientific marvel of the age. The mechanical man. Mechanical man? Mm, that's what it says. It walks, talks, answers questions. Although made of metal, it can duplicate many things that man can do. <laughs> oh, come on, Margot, we can't miss this. Oh, Lamont, you've seen robots before. Yes, but you never know when one may be different, more advanced. You well, know. I'd like to bet this one's no different from the rest. Well, you can. I beg your pardon. I, oh. I couldn't help overhearing what you were saying just now. Uh, I hope that you'll forgive my intruding, but I think if you do go in, you'll find that this robot is entirely different from any that you've seen before. Oh, is it really? You yeah. seem to know quite a lot about it. Well, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, well, that is... Uh, you see, I invented it and built it myself. Oh, really? I know I shouldn't be out here in front talking to perfect strangers about my invention, but... You see, I'm very enthusiastic about it. Well, naturally. Uh, come on, George. They're waiting for you to start the demonstration. Oh, well, of course. Uh, this is my wife, Mr... Uh, uh, Cranston is the name. And this is Miss Margot Lane. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? My name is Olsen. Mr. Olsen? Well, uh, aren't you coming in to watch? Oh, yes, certainly. I was trying to persuade Mr. Cranston to go in anyway. Wasn't I, Lamont? Why, well, of course. Oh, uh, come right this way, please. Oh, what a little liar you are, Margot. Yes, I know, isn't it awful? Well, if you'll come through this side door with me, I'll see that you get a good place to watch the demonstration. Why, Thank you. thanks very much. And so, of course, oh, here he is now, ladies and gentlemen. I'd now like to present the inventor of this mechanical man, Mr. George Alton. Mr. Alton, would you please step up here on the platform? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh... Before I proceed with the demonstration, I'd like to tell you a little about this invention of mine. This uh, galvanized gargantua <laughs> is, constructed, is constructed on an entirely new principle. He is electrically controlled and can be operated by this small box here on the table. But he also responds to commands in the mind of the operator rather than to certain sounds of the human voice as has heretofore been the method of operation. Now, I'll bring out the big fellow and give you a demonstration which I think will convince you that I have not exaggerated in any way. Oh, Lamont, do you think such a thing is possible? Well, in the realm of science these days, Margot, anything is possible. I suppose so. Lamont, don't you know it's rude to stare? Oh, was I staring? I... I'm sorry. That man over there in the crowd interests me. Who? The hunchback? Yes. Do you notice anything peculiar about him? Peculiar? Yes, I... I'm speaking of his size. Size? What do you mean? Have you ever seen a hunchback so tall? Why, no, I don't believe I have. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet my mechanical man, whom I have named Henry. Uh, roll it right out here, if you please. Well, speaking of being tall, look at that robot, Lamont. He must be at least ten feet high. That's right. I'm now going to order Henry to step down from this little platform that he's standing on. Now, you will notice that I don't give him any particular word. I just think the command, and Henry will obey. Now, watch. Lamont, look! That thing stepped right down off the platform just as he said it would. Yes. I will now ask Henry to answer a few questions. Henry, how much is two and two? Four. Oh, Seven and eight. Fifteen. That's right. Now, in case... You think these answers are previously arranged. 
I'll ask anybody in the audience to ask Henry some question which he will answer. Uh, I'll ask him, uh, uh, what time is it? Eight, twenty, eight, p.m. Why, Lamont, this is weird. How do you think he does it? Lamont, you're not listening. Stop staring at that hunchback. Oh, I'm sorry, Margot. I was watching his expression. Just look at him. Why, his face is all contorted in pain. Not pain, Margot. Hate. Hate? Why? Well, unless I miss my guess, it's hate for your little inventor, Mr. Alton. Now, I'll ask Henry to walk among you and pick up various objects which I will call out from the platform. Oh, oh, no, oh, 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 no, please, 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 ladies and gentlemen, don't be alarmed. Henry is perfectly amiable and obeys my orders implicitly. He wouldn't harm a fly. Well, that may be so, but if that two-legged tank's going to walk around here among us, brother, I'm getting out. <laughs> well, I'm very sorry to lose you, sir. I guess I'll have to show you that Henry is perfectly harmless. Lamont, if Henry toddles this way, harmless or not, you'll find me joining the parade to the exit. Margo. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please. Now, you see the young lady sitting on the chair at the other end of the platform. That is my wife, who is not afraid of Henry. Therefore, I am going to ask him to walk over, pick her up in his arms, and carry her back to me. And you will find that she is none the worse for the experience. All right, Henry. You know what I want you to do. She has more nerve than I have. Mm, that robot is almost human in its reactions, Margo. Look, that creature is picking Mrs. Alton up out of the chair. Oh, she looks so small and helpless. Come on, I'm afraid. Oh, I don't know why you should be frightened, Margot. Probably done this hundreds of times. See how he holds her in his arms? That's what he's trained to do. <coughs> and now he walks with her. Well, look, Lamont, the robot has stopped. Yes. Good Lord! No, Henry! No! Oh, Mrs. Orton is struggling to get down. Put her down! Put her down this minute! Margo, something's gone wrong. The machine is closing his arms about her. He'll crush her. Stop it, someone! Put her down! Put her down! You're killing her! Stop! Oh, my God! Jim, I've simply got to get out of here. Darling, the police have ordered us to stay here. Lamont, how do you suppose it could have happened? I don't know, Margo. I don't like it. What do you mean? There's something behind all this. Something sinister. Something perhaps for the shadow to investigate? Margo, please don't ever mention that name in public. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sure no one could have overheard. You think so? Look behind you. Wait, it's the hunchback. He wasn't there a minute ago, but I'm sure he didn't hear me. I hope not. Lamont, look, the mechanical man, it's moving. Yeah, so it is. Its mouth is open. It's going to speak. The shadow must die. Oh, Lamont. Well, I'll be... Lamont, what does it mean? I haven't the faintest idea. Let me go. Let me go, I tell you. Mr. Alton, the doctor said... I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what anybody said. I've got to do this before it's too late. Please, Mr. Alton. Go. Lamont. The inventor's going up to the robot. What's he going to do? Smashing his invention a bit. The shock has put him out of his head. Margot, we've got to get that boy out of here. Drive a little slow, Margo. I think he's going to sleep. Oh, Lamont, the poor fellow. Yes. I imagine that outburst when he broke the machine relieved the nervous tension. He seems relaxed enough now. What a shock it must have been to him to see his wife killed in such a horrible accident. Yes. If it was an accident... Then you think it was murder. I don't know, Margo. I, I really don't know. Look, Lamont... 
Alton's eyes are opening. I think he's waking up. Well, where, where am I? What, what's happened? We're just taking you to a place where you can get some rest. Well, oh, I see. My wife. My poor wife. Easy now, easy. Mr. Alton, you've got to help yourself at this point. Myself? What does it matter about me? I... Mr. Alton, do you have any enemies? Anyone who might be jealous of you or your invention? Enemies? No, no. I... Well, unless Dr. Zaruga... Dr. Zaruga? Who's he? Well, he's an inventor. He devised a radio-controlled incendiary bomb which was turned down by the Army a year ago. It was too frightful a weapon to use even in modern warfare. Well, what has Dr. Zaruga got to do with you? What? Well... Uh... At the time the Board of Science accepted my invention for display, they turned down the robot invented by Dr. Zaruga. He was furious and... Oh, what does it matter now? What does anything matter? I... Why was Dr. Zaruga furious? He felt that he was being discriminated against in favor of others whose inventions were not as good as his. He made a scene about it, then went back to his laboratory next to mine on Providence Street and locked himself in. He wouldn't see anyone for days. Oh, I see. Uh, one more question, Mr. Alton. Mm. This Dr. Zaruga, is he a hunchback? No. No, I, I... I believe he was at one time a high military officer in some European army. He was distinguished by his military bearing and piercing black eyes. Why do you ask? Oh, just an idea. I guess it wasn't a very good idea. Margo, see that car coming? Get over to the right-hand side of the road, Mark. Lamont, something's wrong with the steering wheel. What? I can't control the car. Well, put on the brakes, quick. I I can't. The controls are locked. Margo, you've got Look to out, die. we're going to crash. Oh. Do you think Mr. Cranston's going to live, sir? Why, yes, of course, Alan. Of course he's going to live. Takes more than a simple automobile smash-up to permanently damage a man with the physique of Lamont Cranston. Yes. Even if he has been unconscious for 24 hours. Yes, I hope so, sir. When Mr. Cranston comes to Alan, see that he stays in bed and keeps those bandages on his arm. Yes, very good, doctor. In bed, bandages on arm. I'll do my best, sir. Uh, good night, sir. Good night. Bed, bandages on arm. Oh, dear. I'd better write it down so I shan't forget it. Uh, oh, oh, it's coming too. Mr. Cranston, sir. Uh, uh, Alan, what happened? What am I doing here in bed, wrapped up in bandages like a Christmas package? Well, don't you remember, sir? You've been unconscious for 24 hours. If I've been unconscious for 24 hours. How could I remember? Well, uh, yes, sir. Uh, quite so, sir. Well, what happened? How did I get here? Well, uh, you're in bed, sir. Uh, let me see now. Oh, yes, keep in bed. Bandage his arm. Keep in bed, bandage his arm. Oh, stop mumbling. How did I get here? Why, well, you were in an automobile accident, sir. Yesterday, your car ran off the road and overturned in a ditch. Automobile accident? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, 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 of course. And the others? How about the others? If you're referring to the young gentleman who was apparently riding in the car with you, sir, I'm, I'm afraid, well, that is... Then? Yes, sir. His neck was broken in the cross. Oh, what about Miss Lane? Miss Lane? Yes, Miss Lane, you idiot. What about her? What happened to her? Was Miss Lane riding with you in the car? Was Miss Lane riding? Alan, what's happened to Miss Lane? Speak up. Well, I, I don't know, sir. There was no sign of her at the scene of the accident. The, the police just reported finding you and the other gentleman. Alan, give me my clothes. I'm getting up. But, sir, the doctor said in bed and bandages on. Blazes with the doctor. But... I've got to find out what happened to Miss... Miss McCranston, if you go out now with the condition you're in, I, I shan't be responsible. You're, you're just flying in the face of Providence. Providence, that's it. That's it, Alan. Providence Street. It's a wild hunch, but it may be a good one. Now, hurry, man. Give me my clothes at once. Oh, it's you. Yes, my dear. Dr. Zaruga, your humble sir. You are hoping for someone else, eh? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do, my dear Miss Lane. Why do you keep me here, locked in your laboratory? 
<laughs> Why don't you let me go? <laughs> oh, you fiend. You inhuman fiend. Inhuman? Perhaps, uh, perhaps my character deceives you? I think you are being confused by my appearance. My uh, hunchback. Oh. Why, well, you're not... No. That hump on my back contains the electrical equipment by which I not only control my own inventions, but those of other inventors, who unfortunately are not as brilliant as I am. Then you're not a cripple. No. No, I tricked them all. Uh, silly fools. They wouldn't look at my inventions. So I caused your car to crash off the road, killing that little upstart orphan. I made his robot run amok. I forced it to kill his wife. Oh, <laughs> you... Now, what do you think of me? I think you're a madman. A maniac. Oh, that mm. poor girl. Seeing her crushed like that. Oh, you murderer. Uh, you still don't believe I'm the greatest inventor the world has ever seen. But I'll show you. What are you going to do? Why are you keeping me here? Because, Miss Lane, I overheard you make some reference to the shadow. The shadow? Yeah. You see, I have always wanted to meet the shadow. Meet him on my own grounds. Because the shadow is the only man who could possibly ever unmask me. I thought perhaps if you disappeared, the shadow might try to rescue you. Oh, no. But I see I overestimated his powers. The shadow has not appeared. Therefore, Miss Lane, I am going to slightly alter my plans. I am going to give you a treat. What? What do you mean? I am going to demonstrate for you a robot I have invented. When you have seen it, I think you will admit that a terrible injustice has been done me. No. No! You will see it. Of course, you may not survive the demonstration. Oh, no. But that can't be helped. As a matter of fact, it's just as well. You know too much about me. Stop it. Stop taunting me. I keep it in a secret compartment. I open this panel. Oh! (laughs) And there it is. Oh! I admit it is not a pretty sight. You see, my dear, your little friend often built his robot for constructive uses to benefit mankind. Mine is for destruction, a weapon for war. Imagine a regiment of robots like this marching against flesh and blood men. (laughs) Horrible. And now I will show you how he works. Robot, step forward three paces. Don't! Please! Now, I want you to go to that girl. No! Pick her up. But delicately. No, please, please. Delicately. I want her to see how gentle you can be. First. Now. No. Oh, no. No, don't let it come near me. No! Help! Help! Useless when I hear the place is sound, bro. Don't waste your breath trying to run away. The robot is so devised that electrically he can detect a living person. He will follow impeccably until he catches up. Or until I give the command to start. Watch. Stop, robot! Let me out of here. Very well. Oh, I'll please. open the laboratory door. Please, You can run over the whole house if you like. The robot will follow you until he tracks you down. Oh, you beast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my dear. Now, the stand still. We'll be over very quickly. Walk, Robert. No. No! Now, Robert, pick her up in your arms. No! That's it. Let me go! Let me go! I do not like to be held in his arms. He's hurting me! Stop him! Stop him! Do not worry. He won't crush you yet. First, he will just hold you to your useless embrace. She's faint. <laughs> Let her down, the robot. Later. Later you will hold her again. <laughs> there isn't going to be any later, Dr. Zaruga. The shadow. Oh. You did come after all. I'm looking forward to this meeting. Just you and I in my laboratory. You expected me then? Yes, that's why I kept the girl here. 
I knew that you would come to us. I see. Very clever of you. I've been waiting to meet you for a long time, Shadow. Meet you and test my powers against yours. Just what are your powers, Aruga? <laughs> I am the greatest inventor in the world. I have the greatest mind in the world. That's a modest estimate. You doubt me, then? Perhaps when we are finished, you will think differently? Finished? With what? You will find out. You see that, Robert? He is my servant, my slave, obedient to my every command. He is not bound by human limitations. He can see you, Shadow. He can see you. Whatever you are in this room, he will find you. When he does, I think you know what the result will be. What? You will be crushed. Crushed to bits in his arms. You and the young lady, too. Dr. Zaruga, you've chosen a dangerous game. But let me warn you. Two can play it, remember? You can't talk yourself out of this, Shadow. Robert, find this man. Rush him. I've warned you, Dr. Saruga. You warned me. <laughs> At last, Shadow, you've met your match. What avails man's mind against a machine? I agree with you, Dr. Saruga. So I think we better eliminate the machine. Here, here. I caught me. What are you trying to do? I'm interested in knowing what's under your coat, Dr. Saruga. No, no. Robert. Robert, help me. Let me go. There, your robot doesn't move very swiftly, does he? Now there, a coat off. Well, an electrical control box. Don't touch that box. Don't touch it, I say. So that's your secret, Doctor. This contraption was a hump on your back, which controlled the other robot that day at the fair. Give me that box. Oh, no, Doctor. You think you've gained the upper hand, a shadow will assure you. You are still my prisoner in this room. You can't leave here, and you won't ever leave here, ever. Where are your great powers now, Zaruga? I'll show you, I'll show you. I can operate the robot by hand. Keep away from that robot, Zaruga. Keep away. I'll show you. All I have to do is pick up this lever. No, 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 Robert. You misunderstood, not me. Not me, you fool. Help. He got me. Let me go. Help. Crushing me. all right, Margot? Well, I guess so, thanks. But it does seem good to be out of that place. Yes. They're destroying Zaruga's robot. It's a pity in a way. Those mechanical gentlemen might be very serviceable if they were properly directed. Oh, you think so, huh? Well, after my little experience with the doctor and his mechanized murderer, I'll think twice in the future before I even use an electric toaster. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, 
the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the shadow belongs. Today's story, Mansion of Madness. Hello in there. Hello. Is anybody home? Well, you didn't expect there would be, did you, Lamont? We didn't think we saw a light as we came up the road, Margo. Well, then try again. What in the world is a medieval castle doing in this country, Lamont? Oh, you know how castles get around. Now, I guess it's useless, Margo. No one sees it. Well, at last. Come on, Margo. Oh, well, how do you do? We, uh... uh... You will please come this way. <clears throat> Thank you. Come on, Margo. Lamont, do you see what I hope I don't see? Quiet, Margo. I, uh... I hope you'll pardon our intruding on you here. We, uh... We stall down the road... You will please be seated. Yes. Thank you. As um, I started to say, we were stalled down the road. I will strike a light. Thank you. Our car was so... Now I will call the master. Thank you. <sighs> Margot, would you be interested in hearing how we were stalled down you the road? You will ro- please be seated. <laughs> nice, pleasant little man, wasn't he? Did you see his face? I saw half of it. It's all he has. One side is as flat as a coin. No eye, no ear. Yes, I saw it plainly enough, Lamont. Look at this room. Those old tallow flambeaux on the walls. Everything seems so musty and old. Oh, Lamont, let's get out of here, can we? I don't like this. Be careful, Margo. Someone's coming. Look, Margo. Good evening. My man tells me you've had trouble with your car. Uh, yes, we uh, were stuck in the mud up the road a bit. I know this is an awfully late hour. Oh, to... no apologies, please. It isn't often that visitors come to Bellhouden, even by accident. Permit me to introduce myself. I am Caldus Madisol, uncle of Millicent Chantelford, present mistress of Bellhouden Castle. On her behalf and on my own, I welcome you. Thank you. Mr. Montesol, Miss Margot Lane. Charmed, Miss Lane. How do you do? Mr. Cranston, Mr. Montesol. How do you do, sir? Delighted, Mr. Cranston. May I ask him what way I can serve you? Well, I'd like very much to use your telephone. I want to call a garage. Telephone? We have no such thing here. No telephone? Nothing new has been put into this castle since it was built in 1640, nearly 300 years ago. 300 years ago? That's correct. Valhaven was built by Sir Austin Chancellor in the early 16th century. Would you uh, step over here a moment, please? Oh, yes. Yes. Come on, Margot. Yes, Lamont. This is a portrait of Sir Austin. Hmm. Interesting-looking character. He was forced to flee his native land because of political differences. He built this castle in the hope that he could create in this new land a replica of his ancestral estates. And, uh, did he find happiness? Come here to this window. Do you see that tower? It's a bit difficult, surrounded by mist as it is. Right. I don't quite... Oh, yes, 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 I see it. Sir Austin was found hanging by a rope from its rafters. Suicide. Oh, how horrible. There's a superstition that has clung to Balhouten ever since. A superstition? About Sir Austin's death? There are those who claim that the tragedies of Balhouten recur just as they happened originally, right down to the present day. (coughs) What was that? Well, now, pay no attention, Mr. Cranston. Don't be frightened, Miss Lane. (coughs) It's a girl. What's wrong with her? (coughs) Millicent! Go back to your apartment, child. Millicent. The mistress of Balhouten. Uncle. It's here, Uncle. It's not in my imagination this time. It started in her dressing room. It moved across the east balcony and down the service stairs. You know there's not been a cat in Balhouten since your mother passed on. Only that one, Uncle. That one. Now, Millicent, have you ever seen a cat here? No. But I hear it, Uncle. Wailing just as it did when I found poor mother. Oh, oh you know, come, my dear. You're frightening our guests. Uh, Miss Lane, Mr. Cranston, permit me to present Miss Millicent Chancellor. Miss Chancellor. My dear, we're intruding horribly. Welcome to you both. I hope you won't think me ill bred. Oh, not at all, Miss Millicent. Miss Lane and Miss Cranston have had a bit of an accident. They came here for help. An accident? Oh, my dear, you're not hurt. Nothing serious, Miss Millicent. 
Our car's stuck in the mud. We were unable to go any further. Then by all means, you must stay here tonight. Well, that, that's very kind of you, Miss Millicent, but I, I think we'll push on to the nearest village. I'm afraid that's not feasible. The nearest house is ten miles away, well beyond the moor. Ten miles? You couldn't attempt it in this storm. I see only one way out. You must permit us to offer the hospitality of Bellhouse. Why, that's very kind of you, but I think... You're it... most welcome. I'll have my man prepare rooms for you. And it's very late, Millicent. You must be off to bed. Yes, Uncle Caldus. I'm not afraid now that I know there are others in the castle. Good night, Miss Lane. Good night, Mr. Cranston. Good night, Miss Millicent. Good night. I believe I owe you both an explanation. You see, the child had a frightful shock several years ago. A shock? Yes. Her mother was paralyzed during the latter years of her life. Being quite eccentric, she lived here alone, unattended. Millicent was at school in Europe. For many months, Millicent received no answer to her letters. So she came back to Valhauden and found her mother's skeleton oh. in this room. Oh, how oh. Seated in a wheelchair, her only companion beside her, a cat. Well, that, uh, that explains this, uh, the, the cat thing. Oh, it explains many things, Mr. Cranston. The voices she hears... The departed Chancellor who, in her distorted imagination, returned to Balhauden. Oh, the poor girl. Oh, I'm sure this all must be very trying to you both. I'll hurry uh, Cebu along with your rooms. Make yourselves comfortable. I'll be back directly. Yes, uh, thank you. <sighs> well, Margot, not a pretty situation, is it? Definitely not. What can we do, Lamont? I'm not sure, Margot, but I'd like to stay. In fact, I must stay. Why? Well, Margot, it seems that many invisibles walk the halls of Belhauden. Tonight, there will be one other. The Shadow. your voice. You say you're a friend. What's your name? I have no name, really. I'm called the Shadow. Shadow? I don't understand. Are you one of the visions? No, not one of the visions. Please let me explain. I'm a living, breathing mortal just like you, but I possess a hypnotic power through which I can create a mental mist that makes me invisible. Then you're not... You're not one of them. Them? The chancel for it's you're not Sir Austin or old Barton. There's nothing supernatural about me, Miss Millicent. These, these chancel foots you speak of, they're dead? Oh, yes, but they come back. They come back to Belhauden with every change of the moon. With every change of the moon? Have you seen them? I've seen old Barton. Just as he was the night his Hindu servant threw the knife at his throat and killed him. A Hindu servant, sir, did yes. you say? Why? Oh, Nothing. Tell me about old Barton. Who was he? He was my grandfather, the last male in the Chancelford line. You say he was killed? Yes, it happened on the main staircase. Old Barton had just come from a hunt on the moors with his mahound. Now, tell me exactly what it is you've seen. His murder, just as it happened 18 years ago. First, I hear his hounds howling out there on the moor. Then I hear his footsteps on the stairs. Climb slowly to the first landing. Then he stops short. His hand goes to his throat. He makes a gurgling sound and turns and topples down the stairs. Has anyone else seen this? Anybody but yourself? No. And nobody believes me either. <laughs> I don't suppose you do. I believe you're sincere, Miss Millicent. Everybody humors me like I was mad. Siebel was rude enough to smile when I told him about the vulture. Vulture? Oh, of course. You don't know about that. It perches in the tree just outside that window. It comes when old Barton does. Nothing I do will drive him away. It just sits there. It's hollow eyes staring at me, emitting horrible sounds. You're positive you see all this, Miss Millicent. I mean, there could be no mistake. Oh. There, you, you see, you doubt me also. You said you wanted to help me. How do you think you can? 
I don't know. I'd hoped there might be a way, but frankly, I'm bewildered. I just don't know. Please explain to me why we've been called to court. I've told you, Margot. Mr. Montesol has asked us to testify to what we saw and heard that night at Belhowden Castle. But why have we been waiting here all this time? Why can't we just go in and tell what we saw and get out of here? Because the court isn't in session. They've declared a recess. Recess? Oh, ridiculous. Schoolboy stuff. <laughs> I'll bet you that if women were running these places, things would happen a lot faster than they do now. Now, now, wait a minute. I seem to recall a few shopping trips with you, my dear. Oh, well, that's different. And the people that hang around here. Look at them. Pure criminal types, every one of them. Well, who, for instance? Well, that man who just came out of that room, for instance. That man there? Yes. Darling, that's the judge. Oh. The court is reconvening. Let's go inside. You have heard the testimony of Margot Lane and Lamont Cranston. Two unimpeachable witnesses. Oh, Lamont, this is horrible. We've been summoned to this courtroom to help send that poor girl to an institution. We couldn't help ourselves, Margot. We had to tell what we saw and heard at Belhouden that night. Oh, poor Millicent. She looks so alone and deserted. It is quite obvious that the defendant, Millicent Chandleford, is of unsound mind. The evidence proves that beyond a question of doubt. My client, called us Montesol, has exercised extreme patience in caring for this unfortunate girl. Now he feels that for her own good, she should be placed in an institution where she can receive proper professional attention. That's not so. That's an infernal lie. What's the matter with you? Millicent's as sensible as anyone in this quiet, courtroom. Quiet in the car. Oh, Robert, my darling. Silence. Young man, what is the meaning of this outburst? I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but I just couldn't sit here and listen to all these lies any longer. If the court please. Uh, uh, just a moment, Counselor. Young man, come up here. Yes, sir. Now, what is your connection with the defendant, Millicent Chancelford? Well, she's the girl I love. The girl I hope to marry. Until her uncle, Mr. Montesol, shut her away from me. Your Honor, this boy is simply a disgruntled, rejected suitor. I demand Rejected it. by whom? By Millicent? All right, I'll show you how much of a rejected suitor I am. Millicent, Millicent, tell him you love me. I do, Robert. I love you with all my heart. There. There, you see, Judge? Your Honor, I object to this display. Judge, let me take Millicent away. Let me marry her and give her the protection and affection she deserves. Young man, I wish the problem before the court could be settled that easily. <laughs> if it pleases the court, I would like to proceed with argument on the motion to put this girl in an institution. It pleases the court to recess for ten minutes. Perhaps we can resume in a more sedate atmosphere. Everyone will stand up as the judge leaves the courtroom. Margot, I have an idea, and I think it can be executed... Yeah. By the shadow. But, uh, Shadow, whoever you are, this is an impossible thing you ask. I'd like to do it for you. Lord knows you've done enough for law and order. But I've got to hand down a decision. Time the girl's commitment papers today. Give me two days' time, Your Honor. Just two days' postponement. But I just can't grant postponement on nothing. Your Honor, you've got to give me some time to accomplish my job. Uh, well... Please, Your Honor. I'll tell you what I'll do. Yes? I'm probably a sentimental old fool, but I'll give you 24 hours. If you're not back with something definite in that time, I'll have to commit the girl. 24 hours? That's all. Perhaps it'll be sufficient. There's a change in the moon tonight. Change in the moon... What in blazes has that to do with the case? Maybe nothing, Your Honor. Maybe everything. <laughs> it's funny, Miss Lane, the way things change in just a few hours. Today, when you and Mr. Cranston were testifying, I was sure I could go on hating you both for the rest of my life. We were in a bad spot, Robert. Oh, I'll say. But I can see now just how Montesol made use of your visit to Bell Houghton. Why, it was the sort of a break he was looking for. 
two prominent people like you to bear out his contention that Millicent was mad. Nice fellow, that Montessor. He'd make a nice trophy for a hunting room. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're incorrigible. Oh, say, we're getting near Bell Howden. Uh, don't you think we'd better go over what we're expected to do, Mr. Cranston? There's not much to it, Robert. You and Miss Lane will wait in the car. I'll get into the castle somehow. Then I'll open the side door under Millicent's apartment for you and Miss Lane. But we must move quickly before Montesol notices us. Sounds simple the way you tell it, but how are you ever going to do it? I'll let you in on a little secret, Robert. I do it all with mirrors. I hardly believe it, Robert. However did you manage to get in here without... Without Uncle Caldas catching you. Now, don't give me the credit, Millicent. Mr. Cranston did it. I don't know how, but he turned the trick. <laughs> well, Mr. Cranston, the important thing is you and Miss Lane are here. And you brought my darling. That's all that counts. Oh, Robert. Darling, I, I don't know what we're going to do, but... What was oh, that? Listen. Cat, it's here. It's starting again. No, don't be frightened, darling. You won't face it alone tonight. There's a change in the moon. They'll all be here. Soon old Bart will be coming across the moors with his hounds. The cat is right here in the castle. Oh, yes. It's in Mother's apartment off the east balcony. Mr. Cranston, look. Look. What is it, Robert? There in the tree outside the window. It's a vulture. Vulture? Yes, he's right close to the window. He's almost within reach of Robert, let me have that letter opener there on the desk. All right, I'll get it for you. What are you going to do, Lamont? I'm going to try my hand at the gentle art of knife throwing. Here you are, Mr. Cranston. This ought to do it. It's sharp and heavy. Yes, fine, Robert. All right. There. Step back, Mongo. Come over here, Millicent. All right, Mr. Crafton, let her go. <clears throat> oh, a bullseye. You stuck it right in his breast. Yes. But still he sits and squawks. Interesting. Very interesting. I could have told you. You can't get rid of him. There's nothing you can do. He always waits for old Barton's death. Close the window, Robert. Shut him out. No, wait. I hear something out on the moor. Now, you hear that? It's the hounds. They're moving across the moor. Old Barton's with them. He'll be here in a minute. They're coming this way. Oh, Robert. Robert. It's all right, darling. It's, it's all right. I don't see how anyone could live in a place like this and still hold on to their sanity. Others have reasoned that way, Margot. You mean Montessor, I suppose. I don't exclude him. Mr. Crest. Yes? I think I hear somebody moving about downstairs. Yes? Margot, put out that flambeau. I'm going out in the hall. I don't want the light to stream through. All right. There you are. Now, quiet while I open the door. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Cranston. I'm going with you. All right, Robert. Open up. Be careful, Robert. Easy, boy. Step through, Robert. Right. Now, close it. Follow me. Robert. Yes? Drop down behind this balustrade. We can see the stairs from here. Mr. Crafton. Yes? Look. Look, coming around that car. Ah, uh, that's our man. Now watch it. Old Barton? Maybe. C can, can you see his face? No. Cape hides it. He's near the landing. Be ready to run, Robert. But what are we going to do? Head him off before he can get to that big flagstone at the bottom of the stairs. Look, look, he stopped on the landing. Ready now? <laughs> that's exactly as Millicent described it. Old Barton chokes and then he falls down the stairs. Come on, Robert. Stop! Stay where you are! Sure. Show my say! Look out, Mr. Cranston. Grab him! I got him! No use, mister. We're on to your hoax. Out of the way, Robert. No, you don't. There. You've got enough, Mr. Ghost, or... Oh, no, eh? You got him, Mr. Cranston. You nailed him right in the butt. Robert. Robert. Oh, Millicent, it's all right. Now, don't worry. That was quick work. Who is he, Lamont? I don't know, Margo. We'll see. Strike a match, Robert. I'll turn him over. Sure. Boy, you should have seen that sock Mr. Cranston gave him. All right, now, we'll see who the... The half-faced man. See, Bo Robert. Yes, Mr. Cranston? Take Millicent to her apartment. Margot, you come with me. All right, Millicent, let's go. Come on, Margot. All right. Oh, what's next? I want to look at that vulture. Tree's right outside this door. All right, Margot. After you. Thank you. There. There's our charming feathered friend. Still perched and still imperturbable. And still possessed of that confounded voice. Margot, take a look at this. What is it? A wire? Yes. 
And if I'm not mistaken, it... Well, let's give it a yank and see what... <clears throat> My, what a long tail he has. Long copper and properly insulated. Oh, just a minute now. Ah, there we are, Margot. Mr. Vulture's innards. His heart, soul, and mind are all encased in this little device. Looks like a radio loudspeaker. That's exactly what it is. I had no idea vultures were such deceitful creatures. Margo, you take the car, drive to the village, and phone the police. Don't let them know who you are, but tell them to get out here right away. What are you going to do? I'm going to follow this wire. It'll probably lead to one of those abandoned guardhouses at the end of the moor. Tell the police to watch for a flashlight signal. Then rush to the location and hold anybody they may find there. The shadow is going to find the human vulture at the other end of this line. All right, Stevenson. The vulture wants them all. Longer this time. A Cebu signal to take it down and bring it in. Okay, Montessor. Here it goes. Fine. We can disconnect that microphone now. Don't you want me to do the hounds again? Yes, yes, of course. I get sounded if they're coming back across the moor. Go ahead, the speaker's open. <laughs> what was that? Did you do that, Stevenson? No. Came from over there by the door of the hut. That laugh is not in Stevenson's repertoire of impersonation as Montesol. Stevenson, what in thunder is this? Do you see anybody? I'll answer for him, Montesol. He can't see me any more than you can. Well, who are you? I am the Shadow. Shadow? Oh, yes, I've heard of you. Quite an elaborate array of insanity-producing machinery you have here. What do you mean? This is a simple portable broadcasting outfit. We're radio amateurs, that's all. Hey, yeah, sure, that's all. Amateurs at radio, but professionals at crime. I'm afraid you're making a mistake. You're the one who's made the mistake, Montesol. You made the mistake of thinking you could drive Millicent Chancelfoot mad. Or at least make her believe herself mad. This is ridiculous. I don't know what you're talking about. Your denials don't interest me, Montesol. I'm only concerned with destroying your plans. Your control over Mills, Matt Chancelford, and the fortune is at an end. What's that? A couple of automobiles coming along the East Drive. The police, Montessor, coming for you and your impersonating confederate. The police? Come on, Stevenson, run for it. Come on, let's go. Run, Montessor, run to your doom. Oh, oh, stop or we'll shoot. castle looks a lot different than it did the first time we came here, eh, Margot? Mm. So glad those kids are getting married. She looks very lovely in that wedding gown, doesn't she? Mm. Say, are you listening to me? Yes. Yes, I was just thinking. What about? What would happen if you were ever married? Now, oh, Margot. Oh, don't be alarmed, Lamont. This is pure supposition. I was just thinking of you walking up the aisle just as Robert is now. Yes? Ready to take the sacred vows that would endure for the rest of your life. Yes, Margo. And then all of a sudden, somebody would shoot the best man, the minister would fall down poisoned, and the bridesmaid would be stabbed, and you'd be off again on another case that would bust up the whole darn thing. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, 
is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the shadow belongs. Today's story, Phantom Fingerprint. But uh, you must understand, Lord Holly, I am a woman. No. Mm -mm. Let's see. Uh, I am a lady. No. Mm -mm. I am... I am... You am crazy. Hmm? Did you say something, Margot? Oh, Lamont, you're marvelous. Well, what do you mean? You've been sitting at that typewriter for the past three hours, mumbling, I am a lady. I am a woman. Margot, you just don't understand how an author must search for the right word. Search? That was a manhunt. Well, now, tell me, do you think she should say, I am a woman, or I am a lady? Well, it depends on what she is. Well, she's both. Why don't you play safe and just call her a female? Oh, now, there you go again. Now, how do you think it would sound for her to stand up and say, I am a female? Well, I was only trying to help. No. Oh. Say, haven't you a date with Commissioner Weston to take him to your rehearsal tonight? Oh, that's so... I did want to rewrite this scene and take along with me, though. Well, then call her a woman and let it go at that. Well, a woman isn't bad. It's very good. Yes. I am a woman. Hmm. Say, that is good. I am a woman. Sheer genius. I am a woman. Now, come on. Let's get down to police headquarters. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Weston, ready to see the rehearsal? Well, Cranston, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, well, I don't care much for mystery plays, and as for rehearsal... Oh, grab him quickly, Lamont, he's slipping through our fingers. Uh, no, Commissioner, uh, I want your opinion on the play. After all, I am, as you've told me so often, merely an amateur criminologist. I'd appreciate the judgment of an expert. You really want my opinion? Your invaluable opinion, Commissioner. Well, in that case, Miss Lane, since you put it that way... Uh... And the publicity agent thinks it'll be good for the show if you come to see a rehearsal. Oh, so that's it. Uh, so I'm just being used as a publicity guy. But good publicity, Commissioner. Here's your hat, Commissioner. And your coat, Commissioner. Well, I've... Uh, come in. Uh, good evening. Oh, I... I didn't know you had visitors, Jim. Oh, come in anyway, Doc. Come on in. Thank this you. is Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston, Dr. Kilgore. How do you do? How do you do? We've met before, Doctor. Yes. Doc Kilgore is our medical examiner. He's been with the force for how long is it, Doc? Uh, Forty years. Next Thursday, Commissioner. Yes, of course. And by the way, Doc, the men on the force are throwing a little party for you to celebrate your long service. Yes, I, I know. And I appreciate your thinking of me, really, but I... You know, I just hate to be reminded that I'm getting old. Well, I, uh... Doc, I've been thinking things over, and I thought that the party would be a good place for you to uh, announce... Uh... My retirement? Uh, yes, Doc. Now, I have your pension papers in the drawer of my desk here. I haven't signed it yet because I wanted to talk to you first. Well, uh, hasn't my work been satisfactory, Commissioner? Doc, you're the best medical examiner in the country. But we're thinking of you. You've worked hard all your life. Now you can retire at full salary and enjoy yourself. Oh, why, if I retired, I'd, I'd be dead in six months. Now, Doc, that's no way for you to talk. I'm an old fire horse, Commissioner. I, I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I didn't have my work to do. <laughs> but, of course, if you want me to retire, I'll do it. I wouldn't think of it, Doc. I was only doing it for your sake. Well, then, shall we forget it for the time being? <laughs> You see, I don't want to retire yet, Commissioner. Oh, uh, forget it then, Doc. Oh, all right. All right. Oh, I, I guess I'd better get along. Oh, uh, what is it you came in to see me about, Doc? Oh, I said... Uh, I... Would you rather we left the room, Dr. Kilgore? Oh, no, no, indeed not. It, it can wait until morning. Well, we'll miss the first act unless we hurry. Uh, you see, Doctor, Mr. Cranston's play is in rehearsal tonight, and he wants my critical opinion. But if you want to talk to me, I'll be glad oh, no, to... No, but... no, indeed. What I have to tell you can wait, Commissioner. Oh, well, let's go then. 
Oh, uh, by the way, Doc, those reports I wanted you to look at are right here on my desk. Yes. Now, you sit right down and go over them. There'll be no one around here to bother you at this time of night. <laughs> All right, Commissioner. We've got exactly 16 minutes to get there. We'll never make it. We will with a police escort, Miss Lane. Police escort? Whoa! Did you hear that, Lamar? Mm, yes, Margaret. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Goodbye. Goodbye Dr. Kilroy. Right. Right. Don't work too hard, Doc. No, I won't. <laughs> have a nice time. Thanks, we will. <laughs> I'm going to work the siren. <laughs> Oh, well, now to work. Now, let me see. Where did he say those reports were? No, they're not here. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Here they are on the desk. Now, let me see. Oh, yes, indeed. This is going to be a mighty interesting case. Well, that, that's odd. I... I thought I heard something. Hey, who's there? Uh, who's there, I said. I I can't see you over there in the dark. Oh, no. No, not you. No, 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 don't look at me that way. No, no, you you could not. I called for help. Oh, please, please, you, you couldn't. What, what have I done to you? Please speak to me, Doctor. Don't just keep looking at me that way. Well, you you wouldn't kill me. Well, you couldn't. That's a, it's impossible. I, I'll call for help. And the, and the door is locked. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Well, Commissioner Weston, what's your opinion? I think you've got a mighty nice theater here. A mighty nice theater? I think Lamont's more interested in your opinion of his play, Commissioner. Well, of course. Oh, that. Well, uh, now look, Cranston, your villain is supposed to be a master criminal. Yes. He makes a foolish blunder, for one thing. Well, then, you don't think a master criminal would leave his fingerprints around, even by accident? Emphatically, no. Well, I don't see why. Uh, Mr. Weston. You're being paged, Commissioner. Yes, one Mr. of my Weston. men from headquarters. Guy, what are you doing here, Giles? Well, Dr. Giles, hello. Chief, I've got bad news for you. Doc Kilgore is dead. Dead? Kilgore? What? Why, we just left him two hours ago in my office. He's been murdered. I know how you feel, Giles. I know how we all feel. Who did it? Who would want to kill him? I wish I knew, Giles. Step on it, Murphy. Yes, sir. Dr. Giles, you were Dr. Kilgore's assistant, weren't you? Oh, he was more than just my superior. He was the best friend I ever had. He put me through medical school, got me the job as his assistant. Why, he was so good to everyone. Why, why should anyone want to... Come on, now. Come on. Pull yourself together. Oh, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Have you had a chance to examine the body? Uh, yes, I have. What did you find? Doc had been stabbed at the base of the skull with a sharp instrument. Yeah. Death resulted almost immediately, Commissioner Weston. Poor old man. At least he never knew what happened. Chief, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to bring the Doc's murderer to justice. Uh, who did you say was with you when you discovered Doc Kilgore's body, Molly? Uh, no one, sir. What time was it? You've asked him that question at least four times, Mr. Weston. And you've interrupted this investigation at least 50. Oh, Commissioner, you're exaggerating. I haven't said more than a dozen words in the last two hours. Please, Miss Lane. All right, but I just wanted to be helpful. Uh, what time was it when you discovered the body, Molly? About 11 or uh, just before 11. You were off duty at 8 o'clock. What were you doing at the office at that hour? Is this the third degree, Commissioner? No, this is not the third degree. We don't use the third degree. We don't believe in third degree methods. Well, you don't have to shout at me and you needn't leave your office. I'm not leaving my office, but you are. What? Giles, Giles, where's Cranston? He's out here examining the body. He is, is he? We'll ask him to come in here immediately. Speaking about me, Commissioner? Now look, Cranston. I don't mind you and Miss Lane being here, but she's interfering with my investigation. I am not. I was just... <laughs> I was... All right, Margot. I think it's time you went home anyway. Yeah. It's two o'clock in the morning, then. No, I'm not going home. I'll wait outside for you, Lamont. And as for you, Mr. Weston, it wasn't necessary to be so rude. Good night. Rude. Now maybe I can get somewhere. Uh, Dr. Giles, tell Commissioner Weston what we've just discovered. What? Well, it's your idea, Mr. Hanson. You tell him. Well, all right, I... uh, Commissioner, do you... Uh... Need me any longer? I, uh, I'd like to go home. Go ahead. But I haven't finished questioning you yet. I'll see you tomorrow morning, Molly. Uh, yes, sir. 
Good night, sir. Well, what is it, Cranston? Commissioner, do you remember Killer Norvelli? Remember him? I certainly ought to. I sent him to the chair in 1931. That's right. He was a tough customer, all right. Murdered about five people with his knives. Commissioner, before he started on his career of crime, he was a knife thrower in vaudeville, is that right? Yes, that's right. He... Now, what are you driving at? And Dr. Giles tells me he performed the autopsy on him. Right, Giles? Yes, I'll never forget. It was the fall of 1931. My first big assignment after Doc Kilgo got me my job in the department. What's a murderer electrocuted eight years ago got to do with the death of the doctor? I don't know the answer to that, Commissioner. But there's an odd similarity in the murder technique. And as Dr. Giles pointed out, the weapon used on Dr. Kilgore left the same tri-cornered mark as found on Novelli's victims. Yes, everything is the same. Why, if I didn't know Novelli was dead and buried, I'd say he was our man. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, gentlemen. I can see exactly what you're thinking. Killer Novelli comes back from the dead to kill a man he never had anything against. Oh, no, no, Cranston. All right, all right, Commissioner. Now, uh, what about fingerprints? As I told you before, Cranston, a smart criminal doesn't leave his prints around. Oh, but O'Reilly found a clean cut set of prints right in the center of your desk, Chief. He's down on the files right now, checking up on them. What? On my desk? You say a complete set of prints was found? Four fingers and a thumb, all perfect. No smudges. Perfect? Well, you're very fortunate, Weston. We'll have the murderer within an hour, Cranston. Well, I wish you luck. Uh, Chief, I've got the murderer. Here's the rat who killed Doc Kilgore. Molly, I knew your story sounded phony. I didn't do it. Dr. Kilgore was a friend of mine. You've got to believe Shut me. Shut up. Now, what is all this, O'Reilly? Well, I was developed in the photographs of the fingerprints we found in your office, Chief, when I heard a noise in Doc Kilgore's office. Yes? I rushed in and caught Molly red-handed going through the Doc's papers. This paper was in his hand when I jumped him. Let's see it. Sure, I was going through his papers. But I didn't kill Doc. I, I can swear it. Why, he was the best friend I ever had. This is getting to be most interesting. What does the paper say, Weston? Uh, it's a note for $850. Made out to Doc Kilgore and signed Charles Moley. Well, that doesn't mean anything. I, 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 can, I, can, I can explain that. Yes, I'd like to have you explain this, Molly. Well, I, I did owe Doc $850, but I, but I paid him back early this evening. He was busy in the lab and didn't have time to get the IOU for me. After he was dead, I realized how bad things would look for me if the note were found, and so I went to his office to get it. Go on, Molly. Well, that's about all there is to tell. He lent me the money to pay off the men I'd been gambling with. I didn't want to lose my job, and I knew I would if you found out that I'd been gambling. You say you paid the money back to Dr. Kilgore? Yes, early this evening, and I swear I did. No money was found on Dr. Kilgore. Now I'll tell you what I think, Molly. You owed Dr. Money and you couldn't pay him. He threatened to come to tell me about it and about your gambling. You got desperate and killed him to save yourself. I gave him the money, I tell you. I'll get you for this. Please, keep him away from you. you. None keep of that, Giles. Me. I know how you feel, but... Doesn't anybody believe I didn't do it? Take him away, O'Reilly. All right, Chief, come on. You. I'm telling you. Give him a hand, Giles. All right, Chief. Ah, well, there you are, Cranston. You're convinced you have Doc Kilgore's murderer? Absolutely. Motive and all. I don't think you have, Commissioner. There are too many loose ends. What about the fingerprints in the center of your desk? Why was the knife thrown instead of... How do you of... know it was thrown? Just a hunch. You can't convict a man on hunches. I've got proof and a motive. What happened to the money? There never was any. That was part of Molly's phony story. Oh, I see. <laughs> you know, Commissioner, those fingerprints intrigue me. Well, go to work, Sherlock Holmes. Oh, for me, I'm going home and get some much-needed sleep. Come in. I'm sorry to bother you, Chief, but is O'Reilly here? No, he's busy. What did you want? Well, it's about the prints, Chief. The ones we found on your desk. What about them? Well, I've checked them, and I've rechecked them. And they don't make sense. What are you talking about? The fingerprints we found on your desk, Chief, belong to Killer Norvelli. But he's been dead since 1931. <laughs> Please, Cranston, go away and don't bother me. I'm too busy to spend my time watching vaudeville acts. After all the excitement last night, I had about two hours sleep. Look at this desk, piled with mail. I'll never get through it all. You're missing something, Commissioner. There's a woman knife thrower on the bill who's simply terrific. I don't care if she is simply terrific. I can't... Knife thrower. A most interesting woman, Commissioner Weston. Madame Maria Novelli. Killer Novelli's widow, you know. Ah, Killer Novelli again. Cranston, if I hear that name again, I'll begin throwing things, and it won't be knives. But, Commissioner, don't you think that... Think. Think. I, I'll... 
Go away, Miss Lane, please. Cranston, go write another mystery play or anything you want, but don't bother me. I got the murder of Doc Kilgore, and I got a motive, and that's all I need. I hope so, old man. I sincerely hope so for your sake. As for me, I've got a hunch. Come on, Margot. Bye, Commissioner. Goodbye. Margot, the shadow is going to pay Madame Maria Norvelli a visit backstage at the Lyceum Theater. What? Who is there? I can see no one. It is I, the shadow. You cannot see me, but I can see you. And you must answer my questions. Who are you? What do you want here, Mary Novelli's dressing room? Who murdered Doc Kilgore, Madame Novelli? I don't know what you mean. Is it Killer Novelli? Novelli? No. No, it could not be. He is dead. Novelli was your husband? Yes, but he is dead. Dead, I tell you. That is the truth? That is the truth. He was evil. He killed with the knives, the beautiful knives. I teach him the great art to throw the knives, and he used it to kill. Who else have you taught to throw the knives? Ah, many. But there was one last year I taught him. He was very good. He learned quick. He learned as good as Novelli. I want him to join the act with me, but he... he... Go on. Go on. He say no. He say he got other reasons, other uses for the knives. Oh, he is evil too, like Novelli. You aren't lying to me. No, it is true. Everything is true. What is this man's name? His name? Oh, no. That I cannot say. He make me promise not to tell. He say I kill you if you tell. You must tell me his name if I'm to help you. Oh, please. Please do not ask that. Quickly, Madame Novelli, his name. All right. I will tell his name... His name is... Madame Novelli. She's dead. And that's the story, Margot. According to Dr. Giles' report, the same weapon that killed Doc Kilgore also killed Madame Novelli. Any fingerprints found this time, Lamont? Oh, yes. The ever-present fingerprints were there. Perfect set, as usual. And, of course, they belong to our friend, the late Killer Novelli. But how could a dead man go around killing people? He couldn't, Margot. That's just it. The murderer is merely using a very clever device to throw the police off his trail. Yet the fingerprints do match, Lamont. Yes, confound it. That's the confusing part of this whole thing. If I knew how the murderer performed this neat little trick, I'd know better where to look for him. Well, darling, at least you were smarter than Commissioner Weston. He thought Moley was the guilty party. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, was a bit upset that the killer should have struck again and Moley safely guarded miles away under lock and key. Still, I can't be too hard on Weston. My record hasn't been too good on this case either. All I know, maybe Killer Novelli is alive. Maybe he's the man we're after, after all. Uh oh, I know that mood of yours when I hear it. Come on, Chief. You and I are going out for a nice, brisk walk. Oh, it's getting pretty late, Margot. Besides, I've no, got... No, I won't take no for an answer. Now, come on. Right. my hat and my gloves and... Oh, dear, look at them. Just look at them. Mm -hmm. Look at one. Oh, your gloves. Well, what's the matter with them? Well, they're ruined, that's all. Ruined. I just got them back from the cleaners, and they washed them instead of dry cleaning them. <laughs> now, look. Yeah. They've ripped. Of course they've ripped. All the oil's been washed out of the leather. If they had any sense, they'd Hey, wait a minute, know. Margot. Oil, leather, preserve, Margot. If the oil was still in the leather, the preserving oil, they'd still be good. Uh, the gloves, I mean. The mom, sometimes that's I That's it, think... Margot. Of course that's it. You've just given me the one link I need to solve the case. But how? I don't understand what Remember you... I told you if I knew how the murderer performed his trick, I'd know where to look for him? Yes, but what... Well, Margot, right now the shadow has to make a call on a gentleman in a dissecting laboratory. Answer me or I'll... <laughs> it's the shadow, Dr. Giles. The shadow? So sorry to interrupt your labors, but I must ask you to give me a very unusual pair of gloves you possess. 
What? Where are you? I can't see you. No. Unfortunately, you can't see the shadow. I asked you for the gloves. No, no. What do you mean? You can't know anything about me. I know this, Giles. That only you and Dr. Kilgore would have been able to get the fingerprints of Killer Novelli after he was electrocuted. Mm -hmm. And with Dr. Kilgore dead, it was pretty obvious who the murderer was. You know a little too much, Shadow. I have a knife in my hand. I can't see it, but I can hear you. Why don't you throw your knives? Yes, Shadow. (laughs) There. 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 (laughs) I killed you. No, Dr. Giles. I'll not be another of your victims. Yeah? Well, what do you want of me? I want your confession to the murder of Dr. Kilgore and Maria Novelli. I also want that pair of gloves you made of human skin. The skin you took from the tips of Killer Novelli's fingers when you performed the autopsy and then kept in preserving oil. You know too much, Shadow. But I can talk plainly to you because you won't live to tell. You killed Doc Kilgore? Yeah, yes, I kill him. But why? Why, Giles? Because he stood in my way. I should have been head of the department long ago. But I had to wait for him to die. He also had found out that you had Killer Novelli's fingerprints was going to tell Commissioner West on the night you murdered him. Is that right, Giles? <laughs> That's right. But he can't tell now, can he? Madame Novelli's dead, too, because she knew too much. Everyone thought Novelli did it, didn't they? You were very clever, Giles. <laughs> yes. I prepared for years to do this. First, I stole the fingerprints from Novelli's hands when I performed the autopsy on his body. Then I got Novelli's own wife to teach me to throw the knife the way he did. No one would catch me. No one would suspect me. My crime was perfect. No crime is perfect. In some way, the criminal slips up and is brought to justice. Now, what is all this? Huh? Why did you send for me, Giles? I sent for you, Commissioner. The Shadow. Shadow? Here in headquarters? Yes, Commissioner. And this is the man you want. The murderer of Doc Kilgore and Madame Novelli. What? Giles? Yes, Giles. Surprised, eh, Commissioner? Yes, I did it. I did it, but you couldn't catch me. You'd never have found out. And now that you have, you're not going to... You're not going to take me alive. Not alive, you Quick, listen. Stop him. Stop him. Giles, stop that knife. Uh, afraid it's too late, Shadow. He's dead. Killed himself. Yep, come in. Hello, Commissioner. Remember us? Huh? Oh, hello, Miss Lane, Cranston. I'm busy. Sit down. Uh, say, Commissioner, I wanted to see you this morning because I have another idea about the Kilgore case. What? Hey, wait a minute. Don't you read the papers? Uh, the, the papers? I broke the case wide open last night with Giles. I knew it all the time. Giles? Yeah. Well, what do you know about that? Giles? Well, well. Do tell us, Commissioner, why did Giles do it? Go out and buy yourself a paper, Cranston. I'm sorry. I've got a luncheon date with the mayor, and I'm late now. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Commissioner West will actually get to hate you if you tease him too much. (laughs) You notice, Margot, he didn't give the shadow any credit for the solution of the crime whatsoever. (laughs) I broke the case last night, Cranston. (laughs) I. Oh, but Lamont, that was a horrible case. How could Giles kill the man who was his best friend? Who helped him through school, got him his job here. How could he? Well, Margot Giles was obviously suffering from a persecution complex. He imagined the world was against him. He thought his friends were his enemies. But his twisted brain was a brilliant one. He was devilishly clever. But he paid for his crimes, as all criminals do, eventually. Say, that isn't bad. What? That line. I can use that in my second act. You mean just before the heroine says, I am a woman? Yes. Uh, No, no. Oh, Margot. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. Crime bears bitter fruit. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? 
Shadow knows. <laughs> Shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, House of Fun. <laughs> Just told me you wanted to see me, Mr. Van. Shut up. You know better than to mention my name around here. Oh, I'm sorry, boss. Something special you wanted? Yes, Lupton. I came here to the carnival to find out why all the delay. Well, oh, cheap. You boss. had your orders three weeks ago. I sent you a complete description of the man I wanted you to kidnap. But there ain't been no one like him. Come out here to the house and Never fun. mind the alibis. Now I want that man, and I want him tonight. Yes, boss. It's worth a million dollars to me, Lupton. Huh. A million dollars. A million bucks? Hey, how do you figure that? Never mind. Just do as you're told. When my plans are completed, Lupton, I'll rule the world. I'll rule the world. Now, get me that man. Tonight. Here you are, here you are. Step right up and try your luck, folks. Only a dime, ten cents, a tenth part of a dollar. All you do is hit the funny man and knock his head off. Just move in a little closer. That's right, that's right. There before you stand Sylvia, the lovely little lady from the mystic land of India. And she dances, folks. She dances. Hurry, 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 hurry. You're just in time for the Wonder Show, the greatest attraction on the midway. It's no Oh, way Lamont, I'm having a wonderful time. It is fun, isn't it, Margo? Oh, I hadn't been to a country carnival since I was ten years old. Say, look. There's a hot dog stand that we missed. You want one? Oh, I haven't finished his ice cream and root beer yet. Oh, a sissy, eh? I should say not. Get me two hot dogs. Okay. Will you hold these two blankets and this bridge lamp? Yes, yeah, sure. You better take these dolls and candy boxes, too. What about the set of dishes? I'm trading those in for the hot dogs. <laughs> Lamont, you're a regular Annie Oakley. Annie Oakley was a woman. Then you're a brother. Can I try it? Well, sure. Let's have another gun, will you? Here you are, sir. Two bits worth. How do you hold this thing? Hey, <laughs> not under your chin. Your shoulder. Oh. Yeah, that's it. Now, fire away. Here goes. Say, I knocked the hat off that dummy. Uh, don't look now, darling, but that's the proprietor. Getting tired, Margo? Tired? I'm just starting. Hey, how about trying this place? Oh, lad. All right. It's thrilling, it's chilling, and a laugh from beginning to end. So step right up, folks. It's the hilarious house of fun. Two, please. Yes, sir. The gentleman gets two tickets, and here's your change. Uh, thank you. Come on, come all to the hilarious house of fun. We go in this way, It'll Margo. Lamont, what happens in these places? <laughs> Anything. So be prepared for... Oh, look, Margo. Isn't that James Tennyson just ahead of us? Tennyson? Yes, you know, president of Tuttle Steel. Oh. Why, of course it is. Come on, I want to ha- I want to say hello to him. All right. Hello, Mr. Tennyson. Hey. Well, don't you remember me, uh, Lamont Cranston? I'm sorry, mister. I don't oh, I, I do beg your pardon. You, you look just like an acquaintance of mine, James uh, Tennyson. Oh, that's a big business feller, ain't it? Yes. Well, I don't blame you. Lots of folks have always mistaken me for him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my wife says she wishes it was him for the money part she means. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do apologize, anyway. Yeah, think nothing of it. Good day. Good day. <laughs> that uh, always makes you feel a little <laughs> foolish. <doesn't> yes. <laughs> well, come on. Let's face the spooks, huh? Oh, stay close to me, Lamont. It's so dark in here. Mm, we'll just follow our friend. We'll let his light suit be our guide. Lamont, what's that? Uh, just a skeleton. Ignore him, ignore him. Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you hear what I hear? Oh, Margo, just, uh, just relax. Oh, yes. Sure. What's that awful thing in front of us? Where? 
right there, look. That great big head with tiny arms and legs. Oh. If I tell you, will you promise not to be upset? Yes. That's you. Me? <laughs> yes. You're looking into one of those distorting mirrors. <laughs> oh, oh, go ahead and laugh. You don't look so pretty in it yourself. Oh, is that so? <laughs> Down this passage, Peter. <laughs> Gosh, it's dark. Why do they call these places fun houses? Uh, because it's so much fun when you get out of them. Here! Here! Let go of me! What's that? <laughs> Our friend up ahead must be getting a scare. My throat! My throat! You're choking me! Margo, come on. What is it? I don't know, but it doesn't sound right. Something's happening to that man. Look ahead, Lamont. He's being pulled through a door in the wall. Stop! Stop, I say! He's... He's gone. Are you sure you saw him disappear through this wall? Well, yes, of course. But there's no door here. Must be a sliding panel. Open up! Open up in there! Here, here. What's going on? A man just disappeared through a panel on this wall. <laughs> well, what's the matter with you, brother? Has this place gotten you? Well, who are you? Well, I'm the manager here. And you can take my word that there ain't no secret panel. Well, we saw him disappear. Oh, yeah. What'd he look like? Middle-aged man wearing a light gray suit. <laughs> Why, that fella just left the place. I passed him on the way in here. Are you sure? Of course I am. Well, that's funny. Well, why shouldn't it be funny, brother? This is the house of fun. Your mom, you're not eating anything. No, I won't for another week. Why not? Have you forgotten our little orgy at the carnival the other night? Twelve hot dogs, six frozen custards, four bags of peanuts, and an apple on a stick. Lamont, you're slipping. Yes, I guess so. And the way the stock market has behaved this week hasn't helped my appetite either. I thought the market was going up. It is. But there are a few companies that are solvent, successful enterprises, yet their stocks have done a complete nerve dive these past few weeks. Oh, well, why? I don't know. There's a rumor that it's the result of bad business deals by the presidents of these companies. Bad business deals? Yes. Think of what's happening to the poor man who's holding those stocks, the butcher and the baker, and even the employees of the companies. What are these companies? Well, the latest stock to tumble is Tuttle Steel. Oh, well, isn't the president of Tuttle Steel a chap we, you thought we saw at the carnival? Yes, James Tennyson. I still think I saw that man who looked like him disappear through that panel. And I still believe you. But we couldn't do anything about it. Lamont. Mm-hmm. Speak of the devil. What do you mean? Look, those two men getting up from that table. Isn't one of them our missing man from the carnival? Why, so it is. Oh, <laughs> what a coincidence. Then we were wrong about it. <laughs> it looks that way. Oh, look, they're coming toward us. Can we tell him about the scare he gave us? Sure, why not? Hello there. Hey. You remember me, don't you? We saw you the other night at the carnival. Um, I'm sorry. You must be mistaken. Come on, Mr. Tennyson. I have got to catch that train. Uh, yes, yes. Excuse me, won't you? Oh, yes. For certain. Well, what was all that about? I don't know. That other man called him Mr. Tennyson. You've mixed them up again. No, I haven't. That wasn't James Tennyson. That's the man we saw at the carnival. Then why did he call him by name? Because he wanted me to think he was Tennyson. He didn't know that Tennyson knows me. Well, this is like coming in in the middle of a moving picture. I don't get it. I don't either, Margo, but I'm going to. I'm positive that man was the chap we saw at the carnival. Well, then why should he say he wasn't? That's something for the shadow to learn. By paying a visit to the carnival again. Tonight. I'd like to know what you're going after, Lamont. Well, Margo, it, it's weird and fantastic, but I have the feeling that this house of fun that we're heading for is somehow mixed up in the stocks falling off in the companies I was telling you about. How? Well... This is pure supposition, mind you. But wouldn't it be possible that someone, someone who was interested in having those stocks decline, could dispose of the real presidents of the companies and substitute a person who looked and acted like it? Oh, Lamont, that, that's unbelievable. That remains to be seen. Well, here we are. You'd better wait in the car, Margo. What are you going to do? The shadow has some serious business in the house of fun. Hello. Oh, yeah, boss. What's that? 
A girl. But what must she look like? Dark, medium height, slender. Okay. I'll be on the lookout. Just send me a picture of her and I'll do the rest. Sure. Goodbye. <laughs> Is it a tiresome business, Mr. Lofton? Huh? Who said that? I did, Mr. Lofton. Well, where? Where are you? I'm standing right beside you. Beside me? But I don't see anyone. That's because I've clouded your mind. You can't see me. Who are you? I am known as the Shadow. The Shadow? I... I've heard of you. You can't be seen. I was listening to your conversation on the telephone, Lofton. Well? Kidnapping is a rather serious offense these days. Kidnapping? Yes. That is your work, isn't it? No, no. You're lying. Hey, what are you trying to do to me? I ain't crooked, see? I'm running a legitimate business. It's a house of fun where people come and enjoy themselves. Where people come to be kidnapped, you mean? You... You don't know what you're talking about. I know that some people have come into this place and never were seen again. Now, no, you're all wrong. I can prove what I'm saying, Lupton. To the police. The police? Yes. You can save your protest for them. No, wait, wait. Don't turn me in. I'm honest, I tell you. I don't know what happened to those people who disappeared. Then you do admit they disappeared. Yeah, yeah. I just did obey, obey my orders. What are your orders? Well, they, they give me a description of a guy, see? Then I keep a watch for someone who looks like him. Sometimes that takes weeks. Then when I see one, I give the tip off, and they snatch him as he goes through the house of fun. Who are they? They, the men I'm working for. They own this show. And these doubles that you're watching for, are they the doubles of any specific people? Usually a big businessman or something. Why do they want these doubles? I don't know. I just told you everything. Not everything, Lupton. Who's behind all this? No, no. No, I can't tell you Who that. is the man that you just spoke to on the phone? The man you called boss? Please, please, I can't. Then you'll tell the police in the morning. I already have your confession as a kidnapper, Mr. Lupton. I'll tell I'll tell you, but you've got to protect me. Who's behind this? My, my boss is Mr. Oh, oh. You will never know, Shadow. You will never know. paper, Margot? Not a word. Lamont, are you sure Lupton was murdered? Of course. I saw him die. That was three days ago. And not a line in any newspaper about his death. I did learn one thing today, though. What's that? The late Mr. Lupton's house of fun has left the carnival. Where'd it go? I don't know. Well, do you suppose they'd just gone out of business? No, I don't think so. That place has been too good a foil for the activities of the heads of this mob, whatever they may be. Well, then what do you think? They've undoubtedly moved to another city. We'll just have to find out where. That should be a nice job. How many cities are there in this country? Oh, it won't be that involved. There are agents, you know, who book all these carnivals. Well, what makes you think that these agents would give you the information? Well, if we were to go to their office looking for work... You mean his performers? Exactly. The Flying Cranston. Margo, that's a wonderful title. Come on, get your hat. Okay, partner. The Flying Cranstons are seeking their first engagement. Alley, up. Up. Nope, nope, Charlie, nothing today. Well, how about me, Max? Uh, Charlie, you keep in touch with the office. I think we can get you 20 weeks at Bourne's Wonder Show. Oh, swell. Uh, who did you want to see? Well, we uh, don't know exactly. Uh, what was it about? Well, work, of course. What do you do? We're an aerial novelty act. Flying Cranstons. Flying Cranstons? Never heard of you. What? The idea. Never heard of us, huh? Never heard of the Flying Cranstons, the King and Queen of the High Wire, the Fires of Gravity, Daredevil Supreme. Margo, Margo. Daredevil Supreme. Yeah, I still never heard of you. Well... Mr. Lofton told us to see you. Lofton? Well, yes, the proprietor of the House of Fun. Oh, Johnny Lofton. Yes, that's right. Good old Johnny Lofton. Well, I'll have to see the act before I could book, book you any place. Well, I realize that. Uh, oh, by the way, um, where is John these days? I ain't seen him in months, but his show is up at the Winkler County Fair. Winkler County Fair? Thanks. Wait a minute. Where are you going? I just remembered we left the trapeze home all along. And you know how trapezes are. You can't leave them for a minute. Certainly not. Why? Well, we'll be in to see you again. Goodbye. Yes, goodbye. Here, wise guys. Well, Lamont, who are we supposed to be this time? What do you mean? Well, are we the Flying Cranstons or... No. The Flying Cranstons are back in the trunk. What does that sign say? County Fair just ahead. Good. But I have another impersonation for you, Margot. What's that? When I saw Lufton the other night, 
He received a phone call from the head of the mob. Yes. And I gathered that he was told to look for another victim. I see. This victim was to be a girl. Dark, medium height, and slender. All right, could be anyone. Could be me. Exactly. Oh, now I get it. You want me to... Only if you want to, Margo. It's liable to be a very dangerous task. Well, you know me, queen of the high wire, daredevil supreme. Now, this is no joking matter, Margo. These men are killers. Why do you suppose they want a girl this time? Well, if my theory is correct, that they're kidnapping their victims and palming them off as the big business tycoons that they resemble, then the next company to receive their attention is the Amalgamated Perfumes. Well, that's a shot in the dark, isn't it? Not as wild as it sounds. The only big businesswoman who answers to your description is Dorothy Andrews, the young socialite who runs the company. I see, and you want me to visit the House of Fun? Yes, and I want them to think you're alone. I'll follow behind you as the shadow. If they attempt to kidnap you, I can step in and get the evidence I need on the entire gang. Will you do it? Will I? I'm practically being yanked through that sliding panel right now. Hilarious house of fun. It's thrilling, it's chilling, and it's a laugh from beginning to end. Go ahead, Margo. One, by. please. The little lady what? You all alone, miss? Yes, isn't that allowed? Oh, sure. Sure, here's your ticket. Go right in. Go right in. Thank you. Hey, Pop. Huh? Yeah? Say that name. She's just what the big guy ordered. Sure, sure. Hurry, hurry, hurry. This is the house of fun. It's thrilling, and it tickles you It's a bit of... Uh, pardon me, miss. Yes? Is this here a very scary place we're going into? <laughs> well, that depends on what scares you. Well, I thought it was a real honest-to-goodness fun house. I don't like to look at all them bony things. Too spooky. <laughs> well, old man, you just stick close to me. I won't let them bite you. Thanks. Thanks. It's dark, isn't it? Yes. Great day, what's that? I don't know, but I don't like it either. Uh. Here, now, don't don't go too fast. You'll be leaving me behind. Oh, sorry. Look over there. What? Uh, oh, let go of me. All right, Julie, now keep quiet. Let go of me, I say. Now, we'll just open this panel. Where are you taking... No yelling, see? Lamont! Lamont! Shut up, you. Come on. Margo! 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 Open that panel. Open that panel. Margo! Now you listen to me. You are supposed to be James Tennyson. Do you hear? You are supposed to be James Tennyson. I am supposed to be James Tennyson. You are going to his office tomorrow and sell his South American property. Huh? I am what? You are going to sell the South American properties. I am going to sell the South American properties. You will obey my instruction. I will... I'll... No. No. No, I, I'm not Tennyson. Quiet. I'm not Tennyson. I can't do this. Quiet. Quiet. No, 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 no. <laughs> Listen, you fools. If you are trying to pitch your will against mine to regain your freedom, you had better forget it. If you don't, when you have completed your job for me, I shall dispose of you as I have the other. Yes. Now, obey me. Concentrate on what I say. Look at me. Yes. Look into my eyes. Yes. Now, repeat after me. I am James Tennyson. I am James Tennyson. I will obey my instructions. I will obey my instructions. That is better. You may go now. Yes. Yes. I am... James Tennyson. I am James Tennyson. Yeah? Papa's out here. He's got that dame from the carnival with him. Send him in. Come in. Hello, boss. Well, here she is. Good work. Bring her over here. Come on, you. <laughs> All right. On tie up. Yeah, yeah, now, stand still while I loosen these ropes, will you? Huh. 
Well, uh, I must compliment you, Pop, on your selection. She is practically a double for the Anders girl. Ah, uh, there she is. What? What's the meaning of now, this? Now, just take it easy, young lady. Nobody is going to harm you if you do as you're told. What do you mean? You will see. Okay, Pop. You wait outside. Yes, sir. Take a seat, Miss, uh, Miss... Lane. Uh, but I want to I know... will do the talking for a while, Miss Lane. Miss Lane. Hmm, that's not a very good name for you. I think you'll have to change that. Change my name? Yes. From now on, you'll be known as Dorothy Andrews. Please, please, tell me why you brought me here. Look at this photograph. Why? Look at it, I say. Do you notice anything unusual about it? Why? Well, well, it looks like me. Exactly. That's a photograph of Miss Dorothy Andrews, a young society girl who is the president of a very, very, very large perfume company. Well? Well, as I told you from now on, you are Dorothy Andrews. You can't keep me here. Oh, but I can. These walls are soundproof. And as for help reaching you, well, just look out of that window. Oh. Thirty stories above the street is a long climb. Now, will you listen to me? No. I'll get help some way. You can't do this. We will dispose of the real Miss Andrews tonight. Tomorrow you will go to her office and take a plea. But how do you expect me to fool... That's my job. You will obey my orders. I have a complete file here of all her daily habits, her acquaintances, her business deals. But how could I learn them in so short a time? I will teach you, and our lesson can begin right now. Look at me, young lady. No. Look at me, I Look into my eyes. No. No, I won't do well, it. You will. That's it. Look at me. Look at me. Don't look at him, Margot. What is that? Oh, the shadow. The shadow? Yes, Van Buren. You remember me, I see. Remember you? Yes, from the night that you killed John Lupton. I don't know what you're talking about. I've been listening to your conversation with the young lady, Van Buren. Well? Quite a racket you're running. What do you mean? Substituting your own people at the heads of big corporations. Hypnotizing them into ruining these corporations for your personal you're gain. You're crazy. Oh, no. You are the one whose sanity should be questioned, Mr. Van Buren. What do you want with me, Shadow? First, I want you to release that girl. Then I shall turn you over to the police. Oh, not a chance. Do you think that I am going to be frightened by you? A shadow that doesn't even dare show himself to me. We shall see. I know your power, Shadow. The power of hypnosis. But mine is as strong as yours. I shall force you to become visible. <laughs> You're a fool, Van Buren. And I'll prove it to you. I'm standing right in front of this desk. Huh? Here. I'll pick up this pen to prove it. You see? <sighs> My eyes are on a level with yours. Now. Make me become visible. Make me. I will. I will. You shall become visible, Shadow. You shall. <laughs> your ego is greater than your talent, Van Buren. You can't do this to me. The God, he has a gun. How did you like that, Shadow? Shadow. <laughs> he does not answer. He does not answer. I've killed him. No, no. You didn't even hit me. Try again, uh, Van Buren. I'm over here by the window now. <laughs> You're a poor shot, Van Buren. Uh, no more bullets. I'll get you. I will get you anyway. Get away from that window. He's coming after you. Look out, Van Buren. That window is open. Van Buren. Uh, oh. He's fallen to the street. Thirty stories. Come on, Margo. I'm taking you home. What did Commissioner Weston have to say, Lamont? Well, they found the real Mr. Tennyson and several other victims all alive in one of Van Buren's hideouts. The only murder committed was the one at the House of Fun. The case is officially closed. Oh, good. Well, how about a little relaxation, Margot? Something to take our minds off the events of the past few days, huh? I love it. Any special place you'd like to go? Yes. Where? A country carnival. <laughs> Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand.
Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, The Village of Doom. Well, Margot, here we are. How do you like it? Oh, it's glorious, Lamont. What an ideal place for a picnic. I thought you'd approve of it. Well, now, let's unpack the lunch, eh? Oh, now, wait a minute. That's my job. You just sit there and enjoy the scenery. All right. <laughs> oh, this is fun. How did you ever find this spot, Lamont? Oh, I've been holding out on you. I used to come here when I was a little boy. Really? Mm-hmm. I think the last white man to set foot here was one of the Spanish conquerors. Oh. Well, it's certainly remote. And so peaceful and quiet. Mm-hmm. That's why I picked it. No one ever comes here. Is that a promise? Here! Here, go away! Get away hey, from the hey, chicken! Hey, hey, scram there, scram! Oh, Lamont, he's got the chicken! Now, I'll fix that right now! Look out, uh, Lamont, oh. you're gonna fall! Uh, shall I chase him? Well, not that I don't think you couldn't catch him. I wouldn't bother. Okay. I thought no one ever came near here. Well, I... I wasn't counting dogs. Oh, that's a nice start. Well, we'll just have to struggle along in the salad and sandwiches. Here, will you open these olives? Why, certainly. Let's see. Directions say just twist the new, improved, easy open top. Mm -hmm. Well, easy open top. Trouble? No. Imagine how tough this would be if it weren't for the new, improved, easy open top. (laughs) Oh, still it is here, Lamar. Hey. Did a dog run through here? Yes, he just... Oh, thanks. Look out for that salad bowl. Hey, sorry. Well, we now have salad garnished with footprints. Oh, Margo, that's a shame. Who was he, the son of the Spanish conqueror? Now, oh, look, all I know is that it used to be very quiet here when I was a boy. Well, that certainly dates you. Did you get the top off the olives? Not yet. <clears throat> just twist the top. <laughs> What are you laughing at? <laughs> Lamont Cranston, noted criminologist, solver of mysteries, and he can't get the top off a bottle of olives. Well, for your information, young lady, this is the toughest case I've ever had. Oh, let them go. <laughs> Just relax and enjoy the serenity of nature. <sighs> hey, hey, did a boy go through here looking for a dog? Yes, right that way. Thanks. Wait a minute, come back. What for? You forgot to step in the salad. Oh, I ain't got time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know the quiet little spot's all right. I'm sorry, Margo. Oh, come on. I was only kidding. Here, turn on the portable radio. We'll have music with our picnic. There's still sandwiches. All right. Well, let's see now. See what we've got here. Mm -hmm. Ham? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Swiss cheese. There. That ought to scare off the next boy who's looking for a boy who's looking for a dog. Oh, don't look so glum, Lamont. I didn't mind the interruptions. Oh, I'm not worried about the interruptions. Well, then what is it, darling? These olives. Oh. We interrupt our dance music at this time. Well, here, have a special sandwich. broadcast by the safety yeah, committee of the town of Old Men. Go ahead, sir. Mm. Good. My message may sound unusual to those who are listening. I'm speaking for the citizens of Old Mill in a direct appeal to the man who calls himself the Shadow. Lamont, did you hear We're aware words? of your splendid work in the interest of law and order. And we take this means of trying to contact you. What can it be? Well, let's listen. A strange and unexplainable force is slowly but surely wiping out our entire population. All other agencies have failed to cope with this terrible situation. Unless we get aid at once, our village and our people are doomed. Please. Please, Shadow, help us. Turn it off, Margot. I make this... Do you know anything about Old Mill? Well, I've driven through there. It's a quaint little place. About a two-hour drive, I should think. Come on, let's get along. What are you going to do? I don't know exactly, Margot, but perhaps I can at least demonstrate to the safety committee of Old Mill the old truism it pays to advertise. Pull over there. Yeah, you want the whole road? Yeah, come on, step on it, step on it. Oh, it's slow driving, Lamont. Where do you suppose all these people are coming from? I don't know. Cars are loaded with bits of furniture and personal belongings. It's possible they're fleeing Old Mill. They're certainly in a panic. Look out, Margo. That car stuck right in the middle of the road. Stop alongside of it. All right. Uh, pardon me, sir. Could you tell me how far it is to Old Mill? Old Mill? Did 
you say old mill? Yes, uh, we're near it, aren't we? Too near it, mister. Well, what seems to be the trouble there? Who knows? All we know is that people die. Everybody in old mill has lost someone. Took my wife, it did. You mean she was killed? Maybe. Maybe she just died. Nobody can tell how it happens. But every night it's somebody. Those that have sense have gotten out. There's hardly anybody left. They're all gone. All but a few fools that think they can fight it out. But they'll die too, mark my words. There's a car coming, Mogo. Let's go. Okay. I've warned you, mister. Go back. Go back. You're driving till you do. Lamont, I have a sneaking suspicion your deductive powers are in for a few hot licks, swingingly speaking. I wouldn't be a bit surprised, Margot. And in the same vein, may I remind you that this little symphony will be conducted by the shadow? We can't, we can't spend the rest of our lives bottled up here in town hall. We've got to stick it out. I know most of you men want to leave Old Mill. I don't blame you. But we just can't turn our village over to... to this thing. We've tried everything we could think of, and still our people die. Why, we ain't got enough men left to man the old mill power plant. Look at us, sitting here in candlelight, waiting. For what? I'm telling you, we've got to stay and lick this thing. But how, Harley? How? You've tried to reach this here shadow, and he hasn't showed up. I don't think the shadow can do anything about this. <laughs> But at least I can try. Say, somebody's in the back of the hall. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't see anybody. Who's back there? The one you've been seeking, gentlemen. I am the Shadow. The Shadow? He's come. He's here. What did I tell you? Shadow, I knew you'd come. I hope I can help you. Tell me what it's all about. I don't know that there's so much to tell, Shadow. The story's been the same every night for months. Not a night passes that somebody in the village doesn't die. What causes the deaths? We don't know, Shadow. We haven't found a single mark on any of the bodies. If it was murder, there'd be some... Shadow, get, get out, all of you! Raleigh Gordon. What's the matter, Raleigh? It's come again. It struck once more. Now, get out where you can. Stop it, Raleigh. Uh, oh, all right. All now, right. tell us calmly. Who is it this time? Uh, it's my curse to have to tell it. The name kind of freezes on my tongue. But you've got to tell us. It's kin to one of us here. We've got to know. Come on, Raleigh. Out with it. Harley. Yes? God help you, man. God help you. What? It's one of mine. Your, your little boy. No. no. A baby. It can't be. An innocent baby. Are you sure, Raleigh? Sure he's dead? I wish it was just a dream of mine, but... But it just left your missus, Harley, sitting glass-eyed, little tyke in her arms. My son. My little boy. I'm not waiting any longer. I'm getting out of old mill. Me too. That's oh, enough for me. I'm getting out of Run for your lives, men. Run for your lives. Let's get out of here. I'm sorry, Harley. Very sorry. Oh, Shadow. You came too late. I'm afraid so, Harley. He was all we had. Why does it have to be him? Harley, go home now. Your wife will need you. Yes. Poor Sally. She'll need me. I'll need her. Margo, step on it. Follow that car. What's the matter, Lamont? I've never seen you so excited. The son of that poor man ahead has just been killed. The shadow's after a baby killer. She's been like that ever since it happened. We can't get the baby out of her arms. She just sits and rocks back and forth and back Sally. and forth. Sally, darling, you know who's talking to you, don't you? No. Sure, I know. Give me the baby, Sally. No. Nobody can take him away from me. Nobody. They're all trying to tell me he's dead. He's not. I know. Yes, Sally. Our baby's dead. We've got to be brave. No. You're wrong. You're all wrong. Death is horrible. Death is ugly. 
and look at my baby. He's beautiful. He'll stir in a while. His eyes will open. He'll wake up and cry for his bottle. Sally, oh, sorry. don't make him wait, Harley, don't. Oh, will you all go now, please? You'll frighten my baby when he wakes up. He's afraid of people. Somebody frightened him once. Poor little fella. And he never got over that. Sally, don't. Please don't. Harley, let me speak to your wife. Lord help us. Where is that voice coming from? Mrs. Prentice, oh. listen to me. Who is that? A voice called to me. It's a friend, dear. One who has come to help us. But I, I don't see him. No, you can't see me, Sally. But I'm close to you. As close as the spirit of that little baby will always be. His spirit? Are you telling me my baby's gone too? No, he's not gone. He's closer to you than he was in life. He'll always be near you. Yes, always near me. Now, Sally, give up the child. Here, I'll take him. Give up the child. There. That's a good girl. I'll put the little darling down in the dive then. Give up my baby. I did, didn't I? I gave up my baby to the voice. I'll never get him back again. He's gone. Sally. He's gone. My baby's gone. My baby's dead. dead, dead. Sally. <laughs> Sally, come back, Sally. the child. I want to examine the little fellow. They all examine her, Ted. What good is it? Nobody knows anything. Death will come just the same. Perhaps, but here, watch this. What is it? As all the others, cleverly, fiendishly, this infant has been murdered. Desert at the town. We're all alone now. I know. Let's look about. I want to think this thing out. You've definitely decided it's murder, Lamont? Definitely. If I'd been a moment late in getting to the Prentice home, the one little telltale bit of evidence would have disappeared. Oh, it's ghastly. I found it just under the child's chin. The most minute little break in the skin. Even as I looked at it, the skin drew together and the tiny break was gone. No wonder the authorities could find no mark of violence. I suppose all the deaths have been brought about in the same manner. Exactly. The poison killed and immediately eliminated all traces of itself. Clever device, eh? I hate to have the inventor for a playmate. What sort of a poison is it, Lamont? I think it's a concoction developed by a small tribe in the Congo. Sadusala, they call it. They make it from herbs found only in that locality. And you say it leaves no trace? None whatever. It passes quickly through the blood. When the blood... Body temperature drops the least bit, the drug oxidizes and disappears, so even a doctor couldn't trace the source. I've never heard of it outside the Congo. How ever did it find its way to this little hamlet? That's what puzzles me, Margot. If we knew that, the rest would be simple. Oh, Lamont. You frightened, Margot? Well, I'm not entirely at ease. An empty village can certainly be a ghost-like place. Yes. Look, see how quickly people left. Most of them didn't even wake long enough to close their doors. The village deserted. Margot. Yes, Lamont? I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to take quite a bit of courage. Well, Lamont, right now I'm kind of short on courage. Would you be afraid to spend the night here? Offhand, I could think of things I'd rather do, but if you think it's necessary, I'll stay. Margot, I can't leave here until I avenge the death of that little child. Then, of course, I'll stay. Good. We won't be short of living quarters. You can make your own selection. There are plenty of empty homes. Margot, listen. What is it, Lamont? I hear footsteps. Footsteps? Look, Margot. Coming this way. An old woman. Step back in the shadow of the porch until she passes. <laughs> All right, Margot. She's gone. Well, I wonder who she is. Rather a courageous soul, braving this thing alone. Let's follow and see where she goes. There she is. 
She lives in there, all right. She's lit the candles. Awful old shack. But it's certainly on a beautiful site. And this hill commands a view of the whole village. Oh, wait, Margo. There's a name on this rural mailbox. Oh, yes. C-A-R-S-T. Carstairs. Let's go, Margo. I'd like to have a talk with the old lady. Well, how can we explain why we're here? Let me do the talking. Pleasure's all yours. Yes, but I don't fancy the old girl. Well, what do you want? Uh, pardon us, but uh, you see, we had trouble with our car. We thought you might have a telephone we could use. Got no use for them. Come on. It's all right, Margo. Heavens, what's that? <laughs> Gave you a good scare, didn't it? Oh, he takes good care of me, don't you, Arcus? Ah, uh, oh, Arcus, good boy. Good boy, yes. Arcus. Yes, Arcus, good boy. Why, it talks. It's a jack, though, Marco. Member of the Crow family. Uh, quite a bird you've got there, Mrs. Carstairs. What? How'd you know my name? Why, we saw it on your mailbox. Hmm. You're a sharp one, ain't you? What you doing here in Old Mill? Well, we've taken a house down on Main Street. Are you mad? You know what you're doing? Ain't you heard what's happened to people who's lived here? We've heard all about it. Made it easier to get a house, as a matter of fact. You know, it's my idea that uh, plague, or whatever it was, is all over now. <laughs> Pretty sure of yourself, ain't you? Well, don't you think so? You're staying here. I'm an old woman. Besides, I ain't afraid of death. Ah, ah, oh, death, death. Shut ah, up, Argus. Ah, ah, oh, Argus, good boy. Light, light. Shut ah, up, I said, Argus. Ah, 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 oh, look at that. He keeps looking down toward the village. Is he afraid, too? It's stalking the town again. He knows. Arcus knows. Somebody's going to die. Tonight. <laughs> yeah, I guess you'll be comfortable in this house, Margot. Thank you, Lamont. What are you going to do? I'm going downstairs. Sit on the porch and... Watch for developments. You go to sleep and don't worry. I just can't get that old woman out of my mind. Horrible looking creature, wasn't she? You know, Margot, there was something familiar about that face. I'm sure I've seen it somewhere before, but I just can't place it. Well, Margot, I, I'll go on downstairs. Now, don't forget to put out the candle. No, I won't. Good night, Lamont. Good night, Margot. Who's that? Lamont. 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 Lamont, it's come. I've seen it. Lamont, don't you hear me? Lamont! Lamont! You didn't do as I told you. She's still alive. Yes, I can hear her yelling down there. Uh, oh, light, light, yes, yes. You didn't wait long enough after the light went out. You go back again. Oh, light, light. That's right. You go where the light is. This time, complete the job. But wait till the light goes out. Then do just what I've taught you to do. Uh, oh, I'm a good boy, good boy. That's right. You be a good boy. <laughs> Here, I better file your beak down a little sharper. There, keep still. There, there, there. That's better. One peck, and it's done. Oh, yes, yes. All right, all right. Don't be in such a hurry. Here, dip your beak in the poison. Then off with you. That's it. We'll teach those two fools. You mustn't fail this time, Arcus. <laughs> Arcus, did you hear that too? <laughs> what are you looking in the corner for? See something, do you? Yes, Arcus sees something. He sees me. You? I don't see you. Who are you? I am the shadow. The shadow? <laughs> well, now, ain't that interesting? 
You're the great invisible crime expert. You've heard of me, I see. Oh, indeed I have. And who hasn't? But what could you want with a poor old woman like me? You know full well what I want with you. Oh, have you come to ask me to help you solve the mystery of Old Mill? Is that it? The mystery of Old Mill is already solved. I know the identity of the fiendish murderer. You don't say. Well, now, ain't that fine? Who might it be? It's a man. By the name of Matthew Carstairs. Huh? Huh? That sent your hand to your head, didn't it? You might as well take off the wig, Matthew Carstairs. It'll serve you no longer. Oh, you're only guessing. You don't know. You're trying to trick me. I knew your face was familiar the moment I saw it. I finally recall you had a case in court many years ago. You claimed that the entire town of Old Mill rightfully belonged to you. <laughs> All right, Shadow. So long as you know just so much, you must know, too, that the title of the land never passed from my ancestors. It's mine, mine. The court denied your claim. The court robbed me. You swore that someday Old Mill would be yours. That was a long time ago. The obsession drove you to this campaign of murder. You hope to make good your threat to the court. And I will. I'll have Old Mill to myself and you can't stop me. I have a feudal claim to the land, but a claim just the same. The state executioner has a claim on you, Carstairs. Hey, I've got a gun. And I'll use it if you come near me. You can't see me, Carstairs. Have you forgotten that? <laughs> no, but the jackdaw can. His eyes follow every move you make. Put that gun away. I'll put you away first. You're terrifying the bird. He... No, 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 Arcus, go away. All right, right. I'll get it. Look out, Carstairs. No, the bird. Don't be. Don't be, Arcus. Don't be. Don't. Oh. It was a flame from the gun. The bird has carried out your orders, Carstairs. He struck where there was light. Uh, uh, Argus, good boy. Good boy. Yes, Argus. I guess you are a good boy. We nearly had old mill. Uh, 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 good boy. Yes, yes, yes. Well, Margot. The jackdaw's been destroyed. Carstairs is dead. And the village of Old Mill lives again. Hmm. Lamont, how did you ever happen to suspect Carstairs? Well, it was a series of fortunate circumstances. First, the face was familiar. But more important than that, I noticed several trophies in his shack that unmistakably came from the Congo. The presence of the strange poison was easily understandable then. Oh, I'm proud of you, Lamont. Eh? You shouldn't be. Why not? I still can't open this bottle of olives. Oh, have you been carrying them around with you all this time? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And take them, with my compliments. Here. Give up? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. What are you supposed to do? Twist the top like this? Yes, but it's impossible to... Margot, you open mm -hmm. it. Lamont, will you have an olive? Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. The 
Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the Shadow belongs. Today's story, Murder in the Ballpark. Well, sport fans, here we are back at Eagle Field. There's been no score in this game so far, you know. Whitey Brooks, the pitcher, is at that right-hand batter. Count is two and two on Whitey. Two balls and two strikes. Here's the pitch. And Whitey hits one out into right field. It's a base hit. He's on his way now. And... Wait. Wait. Brooks is staggering on the baseline. Blood is running down his cheek. He's fallen. Whitey Brooks, Ace Hurler, murdered in ballpark. X-ray, X-ray, Brooks, murdered in ballpark. Act three, all apart. Hey, Andy, what are you doing here in that clubhouse? You're supposed to be out warming up. You pitched today. Look at him. He falls asleep ten minutes before the game time. Come on, wake up, Andy. 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 Here, come here, somebody, quick. Andy. And he's dead. Extra, extra, second murder at Eagles Field. Crossman found murdered in clubhouse. Extra, read all about it. Our seat's at the foot of this aisle, Margot. Right on the third baseline. Okay. Oh, do you mind if we stand here a second, Lamont? I've never seen anything like this. A night baseball game. Why, those big arc lights make the field as bright as day. That's right, Margo. It's very impressive. Keep moving, will you, lady? You're blocking the view. Oh, sorry. Lead on, Lamont. All right. Say, you know, I'm very curious to know why we've come to this game tonight. You promised you'd tell me when we got here. Well, Margo, my interest happens to be professional. Oh, you know that two killings have taken place at this ballpark within the last two weeks? Yes, I remember reading that two noted pitchers were mysteriously slain. And it happened in this very stadium. One was an ace hurler named Brooks. The other was a great pitcher by the name of Crossman. Oh, it's unbelievable. Why? Well, somehow you never associate murder with baseball. Nevertheless, it has happened. And that's why we're here tonight. I see. Say, Lamont, that hunchback certainly can play baseball. What? Yeah, well, there's one out there on the field. Oh, oh yes. That's Bogo, the mascot. He's been with the team for years. A good little ball player, too. He always clowns for the customers during practice. Lamont, it says here in the program that Joe Roberts caught more flies than any other shortstop. What's a shortstop, and what's he want to catch flies for? Well, Margo, a shortstop's one of the players, and uh, a fly is... Oh, I know what a little fly is, silly, but why do they call him a shortstop? Well, because it... I'll tell you later, Margo, the game started. Who are the players in blue? Those are the umpires, darling. Oh, I won't say another word. The batteries for tonight's game for the Eagles, Scraggy pitching, and Crovis catching. Who did he say? <laughs> I don't know, Margo. That's, uh, that's part of the game. You're never supposed to understand the announcer. For the Terriers, Marson pitching, oh. and Foythbun catching. Oh. Label. Yes, it's the thing to do. <laughs> Lamont, are you sure they can see to play under these lights? Well, they have all season. Now, uh, what do you say, Margot? Let's watch the ball game, shall we, huh? Who's the man in the center position? My darling, he's affectionately known as the pitcher. And one of the best pitchers in the baseball game, I might add, Ed Marson. What's he twisting all around for? He's winding up for the first pitch. And here it comes. Well, the lights have gone out. Lamont, what's wrong? I don't know, but I don't like it. Sit tight, Margot. Oh, it's so dark. I don't understand it. Oh, there, the light's back on again. I wonder what... Margo, look. Out in the center of the diamond. Marson, the pitcher. He stretched out on the ground. Where are you going, Lamont? Out on the field to see what's happened to Marson. You wait there. What happened to Ed? I couldn't see nothing. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? What? Don't move him until we find out what's happened. Ed. Ed. You all right? He's out cold. What? He's more than out cold, gentlemen. 
He's dead. Well, coroner, what's your verdict? Commissioner Weston, this man was electrocuted. Murphy, we'll start looking around out here in the infield. Uh, can I be of any help, Commissioner Weston? Huh? Oh, it's you, Cranston. I thought I ordered this park empty. Well, we knew that rule didn't apply to us, Mr. Weston. Hmm. Good evening, Miss Lane. Did the coroner reach any verdict? Yes, yes. Well, may I ask what it was? The department is not at liberty to divulge that information at present, Mr. Cranston. Oh, I see. It uh, wouldn't have been electrocution, huh? would it? Well, what makes you think that? This little steel plate here beside the pitcher's rubber. Uh, where? Right here. Uh, oh, so that's... Uh, wait, cr- Commissioner. I wouldn't touch it if I were you until the wire is traced to its source. Well, that's how it was done. His steel plates on his spike shoes made the contact necessary for the shock. Wasn't that clever of Lamont to find it, Commissioner? Yes, yes. Who do you suppose did it? Well, the department is... Not at liberty to divulge that information at present. In other words, you don't know, isn't that it? Uh, not at all. I'd like to point out a few things to you, Weston. What's that? Have you noticed that all the deaths have occurred on the teams that are playing the Eagles? Yes. And all the victims were pitchers? Very excellent pitchers, I might add. Yes, but what does that prove? Nothing conclusive. Just a lead, that's all. Oh. I have a favor to ask of you people, Cranston. And what's that? I don't want anyone to know that we were aware of how the victim died, so please keep it quiet, will you? Certainly. And now, I have a favor to ask you. Well? I'd like to be present at headquarters tomorrow when you conduct your investigation. It's a deal. May I intrude? Well, yes. Come in, Margot. The commissioner will be delighted to have you here. Right, Commissioner Weston? Uh, By all means, come in, Miss Lane. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, have you found out anything? No, I'm afraid not. Any more of them out there, Murphy? Uh, Just two. Pixie Parker, the pitcher, and old Hilton, the groundkeeper. Uh, Send Parker in. Yes, sir. Well, this will be very educational, Margot. Mr. Pixie Parker is uh, the original daffiness boy. <laughs> sort of a fugitive from one of those stories Ring Lardner used to write. Oh, wonderful, Lamont. How do you do? Come right in, Parker. This is Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. Oh, I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. Thanks, Pard. Same here. Margot. Can you shed any light on our mystery, Pixie? Well, Commissioner, I am thinking while I am waiting outside that what happens last night is very much the same as happened to me when I'm having a 20-game win streak in Jersey City. Well, how's that? Well, as I am the sensation of the league, they are saving me for pitching night games exclusive on account of I am such a gate attraction. Yes, but what's that to do with Marson's death? Well, I am reaching that point. Now, go on. One night, I am pitching for Jersey City, steaming them in in my usual baffled style, when all of a sudden, the lights is out. Yes, yes, go ahead. There is much nervousness and confusion. All right, all right. Let's... And then, all of a sudden, the lights is on again. Yes, and what then? We went on with the game, that's all. <laughs> I see. Thank you, Pixie. You've been a big help. Oh, that's okay. Uh, send Pop Hilton in, will you, Pixie? Sure, sure. I, uh, I am very happy to have made both your acquaintances. Likewise. <laughs> well, that was very informative, and this old Hilton guy would be worse. Well, who is he, Commissioner? The groundkeeper. Used to be a great pitcher years ago till he stopped a baseball at the top of his head. Oh. Been a little balmy ever since. I see. Come in. Uh, you sent for me. Uh, yes, sir. Now, this is Miss Lane and Mr. Cranston. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Uh, you probably like me to tell you about the murders, wouldn't you? And you shed any light on them? Light? Light? In darkness, there is light. And in light, darkness. Hmm, Gertrude Stein. Come on, Pop. Stop talking riddles. Do you or don't you know anything? Have you ever uh, read uh, uh, Shelley, Commissioner Weston? I don't read the sport pages. Uh, Shelley was a poet, Commissioner. Oh, a very fine poet. Shelley once wrote the... Uh, Awful shadow of some unseen power floats, though uh, unseen amongst us. Now, that's what you're dealing with, Commissioner. I'm dealing with a murder case, and I've wasted enough time on you. That'll be all, Pop. Oh, well, as you wish, Commissioner. Good day. Well, an afternoon wasted. Not entirely. Oh, what do you mean, Cranston? Nothing. We'll be running along, too. Come on, Margo. Right. Goodbye, Commissioner. I'll send you over a copy of Shelley, if you like. I mean the poet, not the sports writer. No, that's mighty nice. Thanks. Goodbye. What do you mean, Lamont, that the afternoon was not entirely wasted? That old man, Pop Hilton, he knows something. Do you think so? I'm sure of it. And the shadow will pay a call on the old boy at the baseball park tonight. (laughs) 
Lamont, I can't believe that this ballpark is the same place that was full of cheering spectators last night. Yeah. It is rather eerie, isn't it, Margot? Those rows and rows of empty seats. Deserted. Completely empty. Ooh, it gives me the creeps. It seems almost haunted. Maybe it is haunted, Margot. Haunted by the ghosts of great players. And the games they've played. Lamont, look. Out there on the playing field. Where? You can see it in the moonlight. Oh, what is it? I, I don't know. Why, it's moving. It's a man. It wouldn't be one of your ghosts. No. It's old man Hilton, the groundkeeper. He seems to be very interested in something on the ground by the pitcher's mound. The steel plate that killed Marson. Yes. You wait here, Margot. I think the shadow should know what Hilton's up to. You won't be frightened here alone, will you? No. No, go ahead, Lamont. I'll just sit down in one of these empty seats. Clever. Fiendishly clever. <laughs> I quite agree with you, Mr. Hilton. Hey? Did I hear someone speak? I spoke. Well, who are you? I am known as the Shadow. Shadow? Shadow? Well, well, come out where I can see you. I'm standing right beside you, Hilton. Beside me? Oh, oh no, there, there, there's no one beside me. <laughs> Oh, it's my mind playing tricks on me again. Your mind is not deceiving you, Hilton. I have merely clouded it so that you cannot see me. What do you want? I was interested in your examination of that steel plate. Oh. Rather ingenious killing device, wouldn't you say? Oh, yes, yes. Do you know anything about these deaths, Hilton? Of course. We all must know something about death. Death has a thousand doors from life. Yes, of course. And you know through which door Marson traveled, don't you? Yes, yeah, that's right. I do. Can you tell me who opened that door for him? Well, I think I could. I think I could. Come now, Mr. Hilton. I think it was... Uh, uh... Oh. You'll never find out now, Mr. Shadow. Come back. Come back. Lamont. Lamont, are you all right? Yes, Margot. But the old man, Hilton, is he? Oh, my Lord. He's dead. The bullet pierced his head before he could reveal what he knew. Then you didn't learn anything. Oh, yes, I did, Margot. And our murderer will learn something, too. What do you mean? The killer, Margot, heard my shadow. But I saw his. Lamont! Lamont! Margot, what are you doing here? Do you think I'd have missed this, Lamont? Say, isn't that uniform a little large for you? All right, now, no ribs. Well, just what's the idea of you putting on that uniform and becoming a member of the Eagles baseball team? It's all in the line of duty, my sweet. I wanted to find out what goes on when they play a game, and the best way I could think of was to join the team. Are you going to be in the game? <laughs> Hardly. Oh, what a pity. I had trouble enough getting permission to sit on the bench. Well, why are they playing in this park today? What's the matter with the stadium we went to before? They haven't used Eagle Field since the murders. Now, will you excuse me, dear? I'm going down to the bench and sit with the players. Okay. Oh, Lamont. Yes? If there's a tailor down there, have him take in those trousers. Oh. Uh, come on, I'll knock out a few to you. Okay, put some uh, Pardon me, uh, didn't I meet you down at police headquarters? Yes, that's right. You're Pixie Parker, aren't you? Uh-huh. Are you maybe becoming a member of this team, uh, sitting on the bench like this? <laughs> no, Pixie. With your manager's permission, I'm visiting here today. Oh, you're like a visitor, huh? Yes, that's right. I get it. Hey, Bogo! Yeah? Come here, I want you to meet Mr. Uh, uh, Cranston. Uh, Mr. Cranston. Uh, he's like a visitor here today. How do you do, Mr. Cranston? Hello, Bogo. Bogo is our bat boy. Oh, yes, I've seen him on the field. You're a good little ball player, too, Bogo. Thanks. Yeah, he would be an even better ball player if it wasn't on account of his hunchback. Got it, Pitsy. Golly, you'd never know that me and Boko is pals, the way he gets sore at me sometimes, would you? I'm sure you're pals. Hey, Fix. Yeah? Get out there and warm up. You're pitching today. No good. 
What do you mean, no good? I am not working today. I am not in the mood. Now listen, Pixie. I have spoken. Well, I'm still the manager of this team, and I say you get out... Let me talk to him, Mr. Stewart. What? He'll work today. I'll have him out there in a few minutes. Now listen, Pixie. Shut up. He'll pitch, Mr. Stewart. Uh, He'd better. Fine ball club where the manager has to get the bat boy to convince a player to pitch. Bogo, I don't care what you say. You listen to me. Look at me. Now, who's the greatest pitcher in baseball? Who is? Answer me. Answer me. I am. You see all those people there in the stands? They're here for just one reason. To see the great Parker pitch. That's right. You're not going to disappoint him, are you? You're going to give them their money's worth, aren't you? Yeah, their money's worth. Good. Come on, let's go out and warm up. Whatever you say, Poco. Whatever you say. Mr. Stewart. Yes? Does this Bogo always influence Parker like that? Yeah. He's the only one who can do anything with him. Bogo's like a little god to him. That's strange. There's a lot of strange things in baseball, Mr. Cranston. Would you excuse me a second, please? Sure, sure. Thanks. Bogo. Oh, I know. They want you to play after all. No, now be serious. I wish you'd do something for me right away. What? Go up to the front office and find out the home address of Pixie Parker. Why? What's up? He's going to receive a visit this evening from the shadow. Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker. What? Mr. Parker, I'd like to talk to you. Where are you? I don't see nobody. I'm right here in this room with you. No, don't look around for me. I'm invisible to your eyes. What is this, spooks or something? I'm not a spook, Pixie. I'm a flesh and blood human. But I control your mind so that you can't see me. Who are you? Men call me the Shadow. Well, but what do you want from me? I'm seeking information. Information about your little friend, Bogo. Bogo? What's the matter with Bogo? He ain't done nothing. You're wrong, Parker. Bogo has done plenty. Well, what do you mean? I mean that I have reason to believe that Bogo is responsible for the murders in the ballpark. Ah, uh, yuck, you're crazy. Bogo wouldn't hurt nobody. That's where you're wrong, Parker. Now tell me, what is this influence that he exerts over you? Influence? Yes, this power to make you do just what he wants you to. Well, he, he ain't got no power over me. He, he just thinks I'm the greatest pitcher that ever was. And the only time he ever gets sore is when nobody agrees with that. I see. He's my pal. Why, why, just the other day, he said he'd kill any pitcher that people thought was better than me. He's... Kill anybody? No. Oh, no. No, he didn't mean nothing by that, though, honest. You're wrong, Parker. No, he wouldn't hurt nobody. He, he's just rooting for me, that's all. Why, why, if anything was to happen to me, I, I think he'd die. We'll give him a chance to prove that tonight, Parker. What do you mean? You'll see, Parker. You'll see... Commissioner Weston speaking. Commissioner, this is the shadow. What? You again? Yes, I'm sorry to bother you, but I believe that I have a solution to your baseball murders. What? You have? Or who did them? I can't say for sure yet. Oh, now look, shadow, I'm a busy man. Weston, you must believe me. Now, here's what I want you to do. Get every player that was in the game the other night up to Eagle Field right away. Why? I want you to restage the game and the murder just as it occurred before. But I have... I been... happen to know about that electric plate that killed Marson. Well, uh, how did you find that out? Never mind. Now, here's an important detail. Don't allow Pixie Parker to talk to anyone until I arrive. Say, who's supposed to be the police commissioner around here anyway? You are, of course, Commissioner. See you at the ballpark. Hello, ball. Uh, Murphy. Murphy. Uh, yes, sir. I uh, just got an idea. Yes, Commissioner. Call all the players who were in that game the other night. Get them up to the park. Yes, sir. I think I figured out a solution to the murders. Uh, good work, Chief. Oh, thank you, Murphy. <laughs> shadow is. wonder what he expects to find out here. Good evening, Commissioner Weston. Stand right where you are. Sorry to be late for the ball game. All right, Shadow, what do you want? What's this, one of your gay little pranks? No, Commissioner. This is a very serious matter. No one knows I'm here but you. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Now, look. 
Here's what I want you to do. Now, look, here's what I want you to do, men. Listen to the commissioner there, We're Buzz. going to replay the events leading up to the crime exactly as they happened the other night. Everyone take his position in the field, please. Follow that now. You'll have a complete team out there, Commissioner Weston. That is, except for a pitcher. And we'll want someone to stand in for the late Mr. Marson, too. Uh, get Pixie Parker. Okay. Hey, Pixie. Yep, I'll be right with you. Well, good evening, Commissioner Weston. What? Why didn't you tell me you were going to have this party? Margo and I wouldn't want to miss this for the world. Here again, eh, Cranston? Good evening, Miss Lay. Not a very cordial reception, Commissioner. What are you doing, giving up your job in the police force and becoming a baseball player? Now, look here, you two. Now that you're here, you can stay, but keep quiet. This is a very serious job. All right, we won't say a word. Pixie Parker? Yes, sir. I'd like you to reenact Marson's role in the game the other night. Well, you mean I, I should be standing in for a dead guy? There's no danger, Pixie. Of course, if you're afraid... Who's wait afraid? a minute. Don't do it, Pixie. Why, Boco, do you want him to think maybe I'm scared? I don't care what they think. Let him use someone else. But I want Parker to do it, Boco. Well, he ain't doing it, see? Now, wait a minute, Shorty. I said he's doing it, and that goes. I uh, guess that settles it, huh, Bogo? Uh, you want I should go out there now? Yes, Pixie, now. Okay. Where are you going, Bogo? Well, I, I'm going back to the clubhouse. I'm not going to watch my pal play a dead man. You'd better stay here. What for? Stay here, Bogo. Stick with him, Murphy. Yes, sir. Well, what is this? You guys can't kick me around. Mr. Stewart, did you uh, tell the man to put out the floodlights just as it did the other night? Yes, Commissioner. Get out there on the pitcher's mound, Pixie. Okay. I uh, want you to wind up just the way Marson did. And we'll put the lights out. No. No, don't do it, Pixie. Shut up, you. Ready, Parker? All right. Pixie! Pixie, no, you'll be electrocuted. How did you know he'd be electrocuted, Bogo? Why, why, you fellas were talking about it. No one knew how Marson died except myself and you, Bogo. I don't know what made me say it. Honest, I don't. I know what made you say it. You said it because you murdered Ed Marson. Oh, that's a lie. Then why didn't you want Parker to get out in the pitcher's mound? And why did you want to leave here? Because you wanted to turn off the current so that Parker wouldn't be electrocuted like Marson. No, no. And why? Why? Perhaps I can tell you why, Commissioner. Because in Bogo's own mind, he is Parker. Why, you're crazy. No, all your life you've wanted to be a great ball player. But you couldn't be, Bogo. You yeah. couldn't be because of your handicap. Yeah. When Parker came along, at last you'd found someone to whom you could transfer that yeah. desire. Someone with a mind sufficiently childish to obey your wishes. <laughs> you began to imagine that you were Parker. You were pitching those great games. Isn't that right, Bogo? Uh, sure, sure, I am Parker. Then your ego took hold. You became jealous of anyone whose fame might outdo yours. Yours and Parker. And that jealousy made you murder Whitey Brooks, Andy Crossman, and Ed Marshall. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I killed all of them. Oh, God, that ain't true. I'm sure it's true, you simpleton. I was the one who made you great. I was you, Parker. Without me, you're not. He don't mean that. Weston, there's your confession. Well, Mont, you were wonderful. You sounded just like a real detective. <laughs> I'm sorry, Commissioner. I didn't mean to take over your job. The, the excitement must have gotten me. That's all right. Uh, put the cuffs on him, Murphy. Let go of me. Look out. He's got a gun. Don't move any of you. I'm getting out of this park, see? None of you can touch me. <laughs> I can plug him without hitting one of the players. Wait, put that gun away, Commissioner. I'll have to shoot him. He's getting away. He's not getting away. Give me that baseball. Here. Yeah. So I ain't no pitcher without him, huh? I'll show him something. Uh, hit him. Good Lord. That's the best strike I ever threw. Go out and pick him up, Mr. Commissioner. Compliments to the great Pixie Parker. <laughs> Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow Magazine is on sale at your local newsstand. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs>
And now for another thrilling adventure of The Shadow. Today's story, The Night Marauders. The Shadow, mysterious character who furthers the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. The Shadow uses his hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice of the shadow belongs. As the scene opens in our story, it is night, dark, still night, and we find ourselves the unseen observers of two vague figures moving almost silently across a windowsill and into a darkened bedroom where lies asleep a beautiful girl at peace with the world. Then, out of the stillness, Hello, darling. What? Well, what happened? Are you all right? Well, who was it? A short, powerful man. A monster. Why, you're dreaming, darling. Yes? They ransacked your whole room. That sounds like the night marauders. Margot, I'm coming right over as soon as I call Commissioner Weston. Now, don't worry. I'll be right there. Goodbye. <laughs> Margo, are you all right? Yes, I guess so. My throat's a little bruised. Your throat? Yes, one of them had his fingers wrapped around my neck. That's horrible. I guess that's what's known as getting fingerprints the hard way. <laughs> now, this is no joking matter, Margo. Oh, I'm aware of that every time I swallow. Did you see what they looked like? Well, only the one by my bed. But I could hear the other one prowling around the room. Whew, it was creepy. What did the one by your bed look like? Well, the best description I can think of at the moment is Frankenstein's homely brother. He was quite short, with long arms and a really bestial face. That's an ugly description. It was an ugly face. Mm, that's probably Commissioner Weston. I asked him to come over. Come in, Commissioner. Thank you, Cranston. How are you, Miss Lane? All right, now, thanks. Now, uh, where did it happen? Right in here in my bedroom. Did they take anything of value? A few years off my life. Yeah, no doubt. Now, uh, tell me just what took place, Miss Lane. Well, I'm a little hazy as to detail. You see, I was asleep, and I was dreaming about pumpkin pies. The, you, what? Honest, pumpkin pies. You know, the kind that Mother never makes. Ah, uh, yes, Miss Lane, but uh, uh, tell me about your waking moments. Don't you like pumpkin pies? I adore pumpkin pies, Miss Lane. But this is a police investigation, not a cooking class. I'll listen to your dream later, Margot. Thank you, darling. Uh, do you Quite mind... Right. Oh, sorry. Well, I was awakened by the realization that something was grasping my throat. And it, incidentally, wasn't pumpkin pie. Miss Lane, please. I started to scream, but the man put his other hand across my mouth. And then the other man ransacked your room, is that right? Yes, how'd you know? Well, I... You ought to know. The same two nocturnal nimrods have been driving Commissioner Weston and his department slightly insane. No, no, it's not that bad, Cranston. We'll have them both under lock and key any day now. Oh, then you know who they are? Uh, well, not exactly. Do you even vaguely know who they are? Well, Not we... exactly, eh, Commissioner? We know how they work and, well, we... And you know they're burglars. Yes, we know they're... I mean, the department always catches up with crimes, Miss Lane. Well, I'd like to catch up with these criminals myself, Commissioner. If you need a running mate, I wish you'd count on me. Uh, no, thanks, but I appreciate your offer. I see. There's uh, just one thing I think you should know before I leave, Miss Lane. Yes, Commissioner? I really do like pumpkin pie. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a nice, chummy little investigation, but I failed to see that it proved anything. It didn't. And Weston's plenty worried, too. Lamont, I don't like that glint in your eye. Are you going to get mixed up in this? Definitely. Oh, Lamont. Now, you go back to bed, Margot. I'll come over in the morning and we'll figure out how the shadow can track down the night marauders. Yeah, Margot, 
You don't know how fortunate you were last night. What do you mean, Lamont? Now, look at this newspaper. Night marauders turned to murder. Murder? Yes. The body of John Kenyon was discovered this morning by his valet. He'd been brutally murdered sometime before dawn today. Due to the deep bruises on his throat and the fact that his bedroom had been ransacked, Commissioner Weston admitted that the night marauders were unquestionably guilty. Oh, Lamont, it might have been I. Yes, Margot. May I use your phone? Yes, surely. I'm going to ask Weston again if I can work with him. If he doesn't want me, I'm going to work on this case by myself. You can't tell Lamont. Maybe he'll make you a special deputy or something. <laughs> That's right, he might. <laughs> Hello? Police department? I'd like to speak to Commissioner Weston, please. Commissioner Weston. No, no, no. Weston, W-E-S-T-O-N. You know, the head of your department. Yes, that's it, that's right. <laughs> the operator said he'd try to find him. Oh, that's fine. They're supposed to catch criminals, and they can't even find their commissioner. <laughs> Hello? Uh, this is Cranston, Commissioner. I just read about the night marauder's latest crime, and I'd still like to lend a hand in rounding them up. I think that I could... Oh. I see. You are not running a school for detectives, eh? Goodbye. <laughs> nice fellow. Did you read this, Lamont? What, dear? Henry Burns, an employee of the city, is quoted as having seen two figures leap from Kenyon's window at about the same hour that the crime was committed. Good. That's something to work on. Well, what do you plan to do? I wouldn't be surprised if the shadow paid a call on Henry Burns tonight. Thanks for making sure I got home safely. I guess you can go now, officer. Oh, no. Not until I take a look around your apartment, Mr. Burns. Now, you're so nervous that if I'm out... Nervous? Up... How would you like to be locked up all day in a room the size of a cigar box? An hour after hour, face the inquisition of questions hammered at your head. Oh, now, they were only trying How to... would you like it? Answer me, how would you like it? Say, look, Mr. Burns, you'd better take it easy. I'll be dead before morning. No one's going to kill you, Mr. Burns. Not with me on the job. I'll be right downstairs. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Well, Mr. Burns. What? Who said that? I did. Well, where are you? Who are you? I am the Shadow. Shadow? I've heard of you, but I, I can't see you. I cloud men's minds so they cannot see me. Oh, you did that to me, huh? Yes. Now, see here, Mr. Burns. I haven't come here for any other purpose than to act as your friend, to help you. Please believe me. Uh, somehow I do believe you, Shadow. Good. Then tell me what you saw last night. Oh, I can't. I can't, I tell you, I just can't. Why can't you? I was hoping that you'd be different from the rest. But it's just the same series of questions. What did you see? What did they look like? What Wait did... a minute, Mr. Burns. I came in with you and the officer that escorted you home. You told him you expected to die. Yeah. To die. Yeah, that's right. I expect to be killed. I'm not afraid to die. Since you're not afraid to die, Mr. Burns, why shouldn't you tell me what you saw last night? I hadn't thought of it that way. As long as they're going to get me anyway, why shouldn't I tell? All right. I did see something. It was horrible, Shadow. Horrible, I tell you. Don't be afraid. Well, I... I was walking home. I, I passed the apartment house where the murder was committed. I heard a weird call. An unearthly sound from nowhere. I turned and saw two figures that appeared silently from a second-story window. They slipped to the ground without a sound and hurried. Half running, half walking. Disappeared in the shrubbery across the street at the edge of the park. One of them was short, massive... Unbelievably horrible to see. And the other in his hand... What was that? Look at your feet. Huh? A piece of rock with some paper tied to it. I know. I know it's the night marauders. I know it's from them. Read it. Pick it up and read it. All right. All right. Dead men and wise men say nothing. You have the choice of being either dead or wise. Sign the night marauders. Dead or wise... Put the note on the table. All right. It's the first clue. 
And from that very scrap of paper, the police may be able to get fingerprints. A hundred leads to the solution of these crimes. Maybe you're right. Maybe the police could find the night marauders. Hurry, take it. Take it to the police. That note may save my life. I will. And now, Mr. Burns. Yeah? I suggest that you try to get some rest. The police are on guard. You're safe enough here. I guess you're right. You go out this way. Good night. Good night. Rest well. Huh? Rest well. Dead men and wise men say nothing. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Still breathing a little. Be quiet, stand back. Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns, can you hear me? Can you hear me? The shadow. Look. Shadow. The shadow. So he's the guy behind the riddle of the night marauders. Commissioner Weston. I want a list of every piece of jewelry that the night marauders have stolen from their victims. Uh, yes, sir. Has any of it turned up at the pawn shops yet? No, sir, not a piece. We've been checking every fence for months, sir. All right, then we'll... Yes? Good morning, Commissioner. I believe you're looking for me for the murder of Henry Burns. Well, who's this? The Shadow, Commissioner. The Shadow? Yes. Murphy. Have this call traced at once. Get every squad car and town in action. Right, sir. Now, uh, uh, what did you say, Shadow? Commissioner, I know you're having this call traced. Uh, but I called to tell you that I was in Henry Burns' apartment last night. While I was there, a stone was thrown through the window. It had a note attached to it. We didn't find any note. I know you didn't. I have the note. I'll send it to you tomorrow. I'd better hang up now. You may trace this call faster than I anticipate. Goodbye, Commissioner. Hey, wait. Wait. Commissioner. Well, Murphy, did you uh, trace the call? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Squad car's on the way? No, sir. Uh, why not? The call came from the phone booth here in headquarters. The call? Here in headquarters? Well, did you get him? Uh, no, sir. There was no one in sight, sir. Well, this is great. The shadow is now insulting the department with the department's own nickels. Ah, the park's beautiful tonight, isn't it? Mm, yes, Lamont. But what good does it do me? No, Margot. Oh, don't be alarmed. I'll behave. You know, Lamont, I made a dreadful mistake last night. And what was that? Well, I just remembered. It wasn't the kind of pumpkin pies that Mother made at all. What wasn't the kind of pumpkin pies that Mother... My mo dream. It was apple dumplings. <laughs> now, wasn't that silly of me? <laughs> Whatever <laughs> made me think it was pumpkin pies? I don't... Hey, driver. Uh, watch out for that car. It's carting you off the road. Yeah, I see the gun on our full wall. Steady now. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Cranston. Commissioner Weston. Say, you gave us a scare. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner, I was just telling Lamont. It wasn't pumpkin pie at all last night. It was apple dumplings. Uh, what was which? A dream, Commissioner. Last night, you remember Oh, that... yes, I see. Uh, well, uh, I recognized you two riding along, and I thought I'd give you a little tip on detecting, Mr. Cranston. Really? What's that? While you're driving around the park for a breath of fresh air, enjoying the sunset after a good dinner... And a very good dinner it was, too, Commissioner. Yes, I am driving around in the park because after analysis, I discovered that all of the crimes of the night marauders have taken place within a block of the park. What do you think of that? Well, is that what you call a clue, Commissioner? Is that what I call it? 
It's the first significant fact we've unearthed. Do you really think that the shadow was guilty, Commissioner? What else am I to think? He tried to mislead us today by calling up about some phony letter. And furthermore, I think he's right here in this park. Oh, no, Commissioner. Yes, sir, that's what I think. And I have a hunch we'll pick him up tonight. Well, I must be going. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye. Commissioner. <laughs> well, maybe he's going to beat you to the punch after all. <laughs> maybe you've got something there. <laughs> <laughs> Lamont. What is it, Martha? Well, you're white as a sheet. That's it. Did you hear that weird call? Oh, yes, well, what about it? That's the call I heard last night. I heard it while that man still had his hand on my throat. And when he heard it, he looked up and then let go immediately. Are you sure it's the same call? Oh, Lamont, do you think I could forget one detail of that awful experience? Driver, uh, stop here. Yes, sir. It sounded as though it came from over there by the zoo. Uh, we're going to walk a bit. We'll be back shortly. Very good, sir. All right, down you get, Margot. All right. Yeah. Uh, Margot, on second thought, I think you'd better go back and stay in the carriage. All right. Oh, but be careful, Lamont, please. I'll be as quiet as a shadow. Get back, Freddy. Get back. You want me to clean your cage, don't you? There, that's better. Now you'll stay over there where you belong, Freddy. <laughs> ah, you know, Freddy, you're a very interesting playmate. Oh, you're a little rough once in a while, but when you figure it out, you're quite like a human. Ah, we've been friends for a long time, eh, Freddy? <laughs> yes, I remember when you first came here. Yes, you were just a little fellow, and now you're a full-grown gorilla. The finest specimen in captivity. Yes. <laughs> Why, when you came here, you weren't any bigger than Jocko. <laughs> Ah, if you could only read, Freddy, you'd laugh, too. <laughs> Do you know what the papers said today, Freddy? <laughs> they said that the shadow killed that man last night. Yes, silly fools, as if the shadow had the strength to do what you did to that man. <laughs> but fools, why should he get credit for those murders, Freddy? Eh? Yeah. Uh oh, but it's just as well. Until you get more experience, Freddy, yes. Yeah. Then, then no one will take credit for our work. You know, Freddy, we can rule this whole city. And do you know how, Freddy? Through fear. Here now, now, what's the matter with you? Here now, now, shut up, Freddy, shut up there now. What's the matter with you? <laughs> what was that? It's the shadow. Shadow? Where are you? Here in the cage, with you and your gorilla. Oh, you're the man nobody can see. Uh, what are you doing here? I've been standing here listening to you talk to your friend, Freddy. Oh, you've heard everything I said? Yes. And we keepers always talk to our animals. They're, they are more quiet when they hear our voices. It doesn't make any difference what we say just so long as we talk. Now, what I said meant nothing, Shadow. Nothing at all. No! <laughs> now, Shadow, you and Freddy are locked alone in the cage. And he knows you're in the cage. You may be able to hypnotize my mind so I can't see you. But you can't do it to a gorilla, can you? Can you? You're right. I can't. Oh, the Shadow isn't afraid of Freddy, is he? No. But you will be, because in a minute I'm going to tell Freddy to kill you. But first, I thought maybe you'd like to ask me about the night marauders. Shadow, may I present the night marauders? Little Jocko, the monkey who is in the cage down at the end, Freddy, the gorilla, and their trainer and brains, Joseph Shankro. Yes, it's a pleasure to at last be able to introduce us, even if it is only to a doomed man. <laughs> yes. Tell me, Shadow, will you be visible after Freddy killed you? That remains to be seen. But tell me more about your crimes, Joseph Shankro. They are not crimes. 
They are adventures. <laughs> You're not quiet, Freddy, quiet. It's not quite the time yet, Freddy. Shadow, I'm going to be a great power. Power through fear is my motto. Why did you turn to murder? Oh, I was tired of taking jewelry. I wanted a new adventure. I have all the jewelry I need right now hidden beneath you. Yes, <laughs> beneath the cage you're standing in. But now, Shadow, comes the newest of my adventures. I'm going to see you die. <laughs> yes, you know too much. And besides, I'm tired of talking to you. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> That's very amusing. Yeah, that's right, Freddy. Now's the time. Kill. Kill, Freddy. Kill. Freddy, do you hear me? Kill him. Crush him to death. Kill him. <laughs> well, Joseph Shankro, your power is gone. Your gorilla will no longer do what you want. Freddy, obey me. Kill him. He will not obey you anymore, Joseph Shankro. He belongs to me. I, too, know and understand animals. Freddy won't kill me. Yes, he will. Freddy, kill him. Do you hear me? I'm coming in there with this whip. I'll cut you to ribbons, Freddy. Then you'll know who your master is. You fool. Don't open that door. Stay out. Stay away from him. Then you'll learn your master's here. Don't hit him. Then you'll kill when I tell you to. Stop it. You feel that, Freddy? You're mad. Stop it, I tell you. Like this, Freddy. You know who's a master. You'll do what I say. Now kill Freddy. Kill. No, no, not Freddy. Stop, Freddy. Stop. Stop. Let go. No. Let go, Freddy. Uh. Ah. Oh, the gorilla's loose. Stay back, Miss Lane. Stay back. Are you all right, Miss Lane? Yes. Oh, Commissioner Weston, did you fire those shots? Yes, I did. I was standing behind that tree there. Oh, uh, just a second. Well, what are you doing? I'm shutting the cage door. The shadows in here. Ah, this is a great moment for me. The gorilla is dead. The night marauders are no more. And I have at last caught the shadow. Not quite yet, Commissioner. Uh, the shadow? I was right here. I heard everything that went on between you and Joseph Shankro. I know you're not guilty of murder, but still there are a lot of things I want to know about you. And you won't get out of that cage until I find them out. But I am out, Commissioner. I came out when the gorilla escaped. And if you don't believe it, you'll find a bullet in the back of the gorilla that didn't come from your gun. Better luck next time, Commissioner. <laughs> Miss Lane, if, if you were not here, I'd say a few things that no gentleman should ever say. Well, I don't mind if you do say them, but let me first say thank you for saving my life. Well, I did my bit, but I'm afraid that some of the thanks belongs to the shadow and so help me, someday I'm going to find out who he is. Margo, Margo, are you all right? Yes, Lamont. I heard shots. Good heavens, the, the gorilla, he, he didn't hurt you, did he? No, Lamont, he was dead before he got near me. The commissioner saved my life. Well, for that, Commissioner, I shall never be able to thank you enough. Well, oh, sorry you weren't in on the kill, Lamont, in case the night marauders has been solved. And, Lamont, except for a very bad break, I would have been able to introduce you to the shadow. Really, Commissioner? I can think of nothing more interesting than to have you introduce me to the shadow. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Shadow magazine is on sale at your local newsstand.
should survive to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the shadow, never seen, only heard. His true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Link. Today's story, Death Under the Cat. Can we start it on, Lamont? Huh? I beg your pardon, Margot. I've been daydreaming. I think it's been lovely having tea in this old garden, but after all, you're supposed to go to that faculty reception tonight. That's right. Mind me, I'm very old grad. Before you brought me to my senses, I'd back in college days again. Mm-hmm. Come here a lot tonight in school. A few of us can get together on spring evenings and talk all the philosophy to all of us. Carrie prefers to leave me here at this table. Carry him? Yes, he's... Length of shrivel. Shrivel? It's utterly useless. His arms are slightly affected, too. Sounds absolutely grotesque. Yes, he's not very pleasant to look at. The only way he could get from place to place was to have a servant carry him like a baby. It's for me. I'm not sure I care to. How could a sinister person like that ever become a professor? I admit some of his ideas are unusual, but he's a brilliant scholar. Paper, Mr. Uh, yes, Paper? Yes, here you are, son. Oh, gee, thanks, Mr. Thanks a lot. What paper is it, anyway? No, good evening. Here you are. Oh, oh dear. What's up? Young Bobby Spence. He killed himself. Spence? Yes, I thought he was a student here. Let's see what it says. Majored in philosophy. He would have graduated with highest honors in two days. He was found lying dead in his room this morning. Oh. Is it saying why he did it? You left a note behind him, but the authorities have suppressed it. I wonder why he wanted to take his own life. In the campus, Margot. Possibly we'll find the answer to that question there. Come in, Brad. Well, who was it? President Wynwood is here to see you. Well, what of it? Oh, he looks very severe, so I, I hope he doesn't blame the philosophy department for this. For so what? Oh, this tragedy of young Spencer. That is not the tragedy. It is the logical conclusion of my teaching. Professor Kalina, I, I know I'm only an instructor in your department, and of course no one can deny the truth of your philosophy, but aren't you afraid of uh, what? Well, if the nature of your teaching became known, I... Like you annoy me. Now, as for here never does. He's both deaf and mute, but he always obeys without thinking. I have only to tap out command with a palm of his hand like this. Oh, there, yeah, Brad. Right. See how quickly Anton understands? Fix me up and seat me behind my desk. <laughs> Good old Anton. Only grunts when I pat his shoulder. Eh? Mm-hmm. Now, Black, show our revered President Winwood in and hurry. Yes, yes, of course. Come in, Dr. Winwood. Yes, come in, sir. Come in. And how are you, this fine? Professor Kalima, may I speak to you in private? Oh, you wish. Uh, take Anton with you, Black. Just... There, Anton and Bragg have gone. They do sit down, my dear doctor. I can say what I have to say, Stanley. Quilima, I have just come from a meeting of the administration committee. Yes? It is my painful duty to ask for your resignation from faculty. Resignation? How dare you? My work is noted the most brilliant department. Just a moment. Quilima, your reputation for scholarship is very high. We grant that. I fear that the most remarkable young minds in this country are on me. And what have you taught? Things beyond your comprehension. I can believe that. You taught them that the world is vile, a hopeless mutt, that mankind should be destroyed. I taught them to think things through. Even when they lead to despair and suicide. Suicide like young Robert Smith. Professor Quilliam, you killed young Smith with your poisonous ideas as surely as if you put a pistol to his head and blow his brains off. Don't be childish, Winwood. <laughs> you know your rival university has been after me. It would serve you right if I went over to them. Do you think they'll want you when I publish young Spencer's suicide note? But he names you as the man who drove him to it. You wouldn't care. I am going. And uh, don't bother to write out a resignation. You're discharged from a faculty. Dishonorably discharged. Fool me. Well, what if you care? Oh, you fool, you stupid fool. You imagine I will have my revenge for this? But I haven't started it already. Come in, Black. Come in. Hurry. Bring it on. I must get to work. Is it really true? Winwood has, has charged you? Yes. yes, but he can't. It's outrageous. It's impossible. Yeah, that's right, Black. Absolute belief in me is what I need right now. 
You and I will show these academic fools that they can't insult the little Lima. Wonderful. But how will you do it? I've been carrying out certain experiments secretly. Now we will find a use for my research and put it into practical chemistry. Oh, I don't understand. I mean to make a change, a slight change in the graduation exercises in the chapel tomorrow. As a warning for those who instruct me. Well, what are you going to do? And a bomb in the basement. Time to explode as President Winwood is giving out his precious degrees. Oh, I'm oh. But you can't. That, that's murder. Oh, it's going to be done. And you will help me. No, no, I won't. I, I can't. What oh, murder? Let me out of here. Anton. Anton, stand away from the door. I will stand back. Anton cannot hear. And he knows I don't want you to get away. He has braced himself against the door. You will stay and help me with my plan. You can't. I can't, I'm up. Even if I have to jump out this window. Right, right. You can't stop me. Uh, I've gone through the window. I must signal and come along this wall. Oh, to chase Bragg and bring him back. Mm. And he's soon understands, as he always does. He'll bring him back, and when he does, I can put my scheme of revenge into operation. <laughs> I said a 
But there's no room for affection in the world I'm going to rule. Oh, go oh, quickly, go. Yes, Professor Grimm, I feel that we must obey you. We shall go immediately. If you come out. That's why, that's very wise. You are always the shortest of my pupils. Now go, go and close the door up. That brilliant mind is gone. Gulliam of genius has twisted his mind into a dangerous channel. It's lucky he can't move, can't harm anyone. Not so sure. There's method in this madness. Such a mistress, and I must find out what his plan is. I must. But how? How can you? By staying with him. Not leaving this house until I let it plot. He's driven you away once to do it again. No, Margot, because I'm going back to him later as the shadow. <laughs> Ready. How do you like the lovely toy? We have made 
here in our laboratory. Mm -hmm. It makes you grin, eh? Even though you can't hear me, you know I am fixed. If you knew that this is a bomb and zone, you might not be so pleased. Professor Kalima. Uh, what? Who's there? Who spoke? I did, Professor. Men call me the Shadow. What? Where are you? Here. You cannot see me, but I'm in this room. Oh, Bragg was right. You are the voice that can't be seen. Yes, Professor, and I come to warn you. I've learned about your plan. It will fail. You underestimate my power, Shadow. Your servant seems disturbed, Professor. He is asking about you, Shadow, and wants to know with whom I am talking. But I won't tell him you are here, and for my being frightened. You are not frightened, Professor. I am not a child, Shadow. I do not know. I don't know how you work this trick of invisibility. But it's not important. It may destroy your murderous plan. That is a block, Mercation. Nothing that stop my revenge. I will warn President Winwood to stop the exercises. Go ahead. No one will believe that wild tale about an explosion. And it will too late. In a few minutes, the graduates will march into the chapel. Kulima, you will fail. No, Shadow. You are the one who will fail. My plan will work for perfection. You cannot stop me from leaving my laboratory here because if you try, I'll drop this little copy And both you and I will be blasted into nothingness. Even so, Professor Kulima. There will come a time when you won't escape from the shadow. And that time is very near. Shadow calling Marco Lane. Shadow calling Marco. Warn President Winworth that Professor Quilema intends to blow up the chapel during commencement exercises. Hundreds will be killed. Get everyone out of the building. I'll try to stop Quilema. He and Anton just left here for the campus. He has the bomb with him. Everyone at the graduation is in danger, danger. Hurry, Marco, hurry, hurry. Hey, hey, sir, sir. The chapel. I've got to get into the chapel. Admittance is only by invitation, but you got a car. No, but I start to see President Winwood immediately. I'm sorry, but I've been stationed here to see that no one gets into the chapel without an invitation. Listen to me. You've got to let me by. All those people in there may be killed. I don't... Hmm? I must reach President Winwood for the plot to blow up the chapel. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss, but I think you'd better sit down somewhere and let... Everyone in the chapel is in danger. They may be killed. Killed, do you hear? That's so loud now is your bloody. Do you want to start a panic here? Can't you tell when a president's telling the truth? I'm sorry, Miss. Now, I've been around this college for years, and I guess there's no aim to blow up any part of it. Please, at any minute the bomb may go off, you've got to let me in. You've got to. Stop that now. Do you want to start a riot? Put me down. Father, they've tried to trap the shadow. But 
that guy has done it. Yes. You hear me tapping on his own hand? I tell him there is a man here in the darkness ordering him to search for you, Shadow. To put me down and kill my enemy. <laughs> and so he's very angry with you, Shadow. <laughs> you hear, Shadow? I hear. I've been very clever, Shadow. And so they placed me in the middle of the room so that I shan't get in the way of his groping for you. There. There. He started his search. Coming toward you, Shadow. You think so, Kurima? Thank you for speaking, Shadow. I have pushed that throat towards the sound of your voice. <laughs> you hear him coming toward you, Shadow? And so will find you, and then you'll die. If that bomb goes off, we will all be killed. There is plenty of time. You will not talk long with that those fingers around your throat. Your man is rather slow, Kurima. Slow, Shadow, but sure. Nothing can save you. Nothing. <laughs> ah, there. He has reached the wall. Now, Shadow, he will hurt you back into your corner. It is not over yet. Are you prepared to die, Shadow? Shadow. Moving along the wall. Now, Professor, it is the Shadow's turn to play. Play? You're helpless. Not quite, Quillima. Here is a trick I learned from you. Listen, Professor, do you recognize this? That's my phone! Yes, Professor. Anton is touching the wall and he can feel the vibrations. I tap out instructions like you do. I'm talking to him now. No, I'm not to listen, man. It's not the master. Anton can't hear you, Kalima. Remember, he's a deaf mute. But he will pay attention to my signal, especially when I tell him that he's in a room with a time bomb. Anton! Oh, if I could only reach the wall. You're in the middle of the room, Kulima, and you're helpless. You can't move unless someone carries you. It's dark, and I can't see you either. I, I, I can't call. I must reach the wall. Too late, Kulima. Anton is afraid. I'm told I've got the back to this thing. He can't hear you, Kulima. He smashed the door down. He's gone, Professor. Oh, go on, Anton. Let me. I'm helpless. Yes, Professor, helpless. Now I take this bomb away. Stop me, that bomb. No, Professor, I have it. Fine. 